What is up, everybody, and welcome back to the 2023 Cocodona 250 live stream. We're on day three already, Chris. It seems like uh, time has flown by, I guess, right? <laughs> I guess if we're looking for a talking point to begin Wednesday morning here at the Cocodona 250 it we was, could say that, <laughs> and I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to keep the people waiting from the action much longer. Absolutely, we do have uh, our good friend Troy Wicks out there, uh, and I'll have to get his feed back up real quick. But he is flying uh, from the uh, Midgley Bridge area again this year, so he's down near Sedona, um, kind of right before. Um, the runners cross Oak Creek and start to make their way up uh, up Kasner, uh, up Kasner Mountain. And while you're doing that, we're going to go over uh, the leaderboard here really quick. Um, there wasn't a lot in the way of carnage, but I will say I was surprised to look at the leaderboard when I woke up. Uh, when we left uh, the broadcast last night, uh, leader Killian Korth had just left uh, Sedona Aid. And uh, he, Killian Korth is still in the lead, uh, about mile 175. Michael Greer is still in second at 171.9, 172. Actually would be uh, either at Sedona or just leaving. Or I'm sorry, not Sedona, but uh, the water station after Sedona. Um, and Mike Grunwagen in third, uh, about a mile to a mile and a half back from him at this point. What was interesting was the way things were shaking out after that. At number four, we've got our international man of mystery, uh, Josh Perry. Uh, who do we have here? Is that where is Josh on the uh, on the tracker? Josh Perry is. Uh, Looks like he's past Sedona, heading towards the water station at mile 173. Uh, so Josh Perry is uh, just outside of the top uh, uh, top three at this point. And uh, number five, Michael McKnight making moves. Yeah, he's been uh, moving up kind of all day. Um, it's been really awesome to... Uh, to see, yeah, I think that who we just saw there may have been Josh Perry uh, with Mika Thews just a little – or kind of right with him um, because it looks like they are uh, starting to – that they should be right around that uh, 89A highway, which is what you can kind of see on your screen. So they're going to kind of uh, cross it right around Midgley Bridge. Um, then they'll take some single track uh, over to – the bridge. 89A is... Or they're uh, just past the bridge, rather. In my opinion, one of the most beautiful stretches of highway in the entire country, uh, stretching uh, between Flagstaff and Sedona. Whenever I'm up here in Flagstaff, I always take 89A on my way home rather than I-17, simply just because of the natural beauty uh, that you, you get. you see, looks like Bell Rock. Yeah. Um, looking at the... Uh, Leaderboard a little more closely. Uh, Kevin Goldberg is still in sixth. Uh, Christopher St. Jean, seventh. Jeff Garmeyer has moved up to eighth. Austin Newplum in ninth. And Dominic Grossman in tenth on the men's side. Now, uh, Jeff, Austin, and Dominic have yet to hit Sedona aid at uh, mile 162. But uh, they should be all doing so in uh, fairly short order. Uh, on the women's side, uh, Eliza LaPierre is currently... Uh, our women's leader at about mile 170, so in third place overall. Uh, Mika Thews is in second at about mile 167, and Sarah Ostaszewski, Air Viper Racing Team member, is in third at mile 163. There's a pretty sizable gap between the top three women and the rest of the female field. Uh, that's not to say that 
a lot can't happen. I mean, after all, this is a 250 mile race and we've got, uh, in this case, you know, nearly a hundred miles to go, but Sally McRae is in fourth and roughly, uh, about, uh, 15 to 18 miles back of Sarah Ostazewski, but Sally moving into fourth. Uh, She's been, uh, moving up steadily kind of through the afternoon yesterday and then yeah. into the evening. It's been really nice to, uh, see her maybe be a little bit conservative early on uh, and to be kind of running strong right now. We'll see if she's kind of left enough uh, in the tank for when she gets up onto the Coconino Plateau and starts to make her way to uh, Flagstaff. And you can see the iconic Midgley Bridge there. Such a gorgeous area. Troy Wick's going to do his uh, traditional fly under uh, through the canyon as he loves to uh, he loves to do for us. Those drone pilots love to play around like that, don't they? Love they to do. show off their skills. Uh, Don Greenwald rounding out the top five uh, a few miles back of Sally. Don Greenwald finished second at the Cocodona 250 in 2021. No stranger to these trails as she's basically running home to Flagstaff. Um, but uh, that's how our top five shakes out. Alicia Jenkins in sixth. Uh, Prescott native Carol Northrup uh, has moved up to seventh. Um, Carrie Henderson in eighth, Megan McCarty in ninth, and our 10th place uh, female at this point is a name new to our uh, the top of our standings in uh, Kelly Scher, somebody who I'm absolutely not familiar with at all. Uh, Kelly is uh, a Phoenix native, so uh, we'll have to keep tabs on her because we should probably know a little bit more about her. We, we should. Maybe that'll be one of the, uh, I don't know if she submitted a questionnaire or not, but maybe that's one of the runners we can highlight a little bit. Uh, later on in the day. For the time being, I want to just send it over to our Sedona static cam. It's a little bit dark, but you can see, um, you know, runners are starting to come into the aid station. And we'll see if uh, kind of throughout the day we can maybe, um, uh, if that feed kind of brightens up a little bit as the shadows keep uh, moving away there. But we will also have... Um, we will also have footage from Fane Ranch, where we will have a cutoff there at 8.30 a.m. this morning, I believe. So the Satisfy Fane Ranch aid station. Uh, oh, no, that's the – yep, the Satisfy Fane yep. Ranch aid station is uh, cut off at 8.30. And, and with we'll regard also have footage from uh, Mingus Mountain as well as uh, other places out on course uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the morning as the race starts to – um, get a little bit more spread out. We're going to be, uh, you know, telling stories from from kind of all over all over the course. With regard to Fane Ranch, I think we're probably in pretty great shape to see everybody uh, hit the uh, hit that cutoff because, frankly, uh, everybody that I can see is is in the aid station or uh, just leaving the aid station. I don't think we actually have any runners that have yet to make it to. Uh, the Fane Ran Satisfy Fane Ranch aid station, which makes sense because I think that you had said this, um, you had said this last night, Chris, was that um, you know you had basically like as long as you made the Iron King cut off, you were going to have about five hours to make it just a few miles. Yeah, you had uh, for, from Iron King. The Iron King cutoff was three thirty a.m. at mile ninety two point two. And the Satisfy Fane Ranch aid station, 97, 98, is an 830 cutoff. So you basically had to make an hour per mile. I think that that was – I would have to assume that's by design so runners could actually get a bit of a rest at Fane Ranch if they needed to before they uh, undertook the next section because the section after Fane Ranch is a sizable one. Uh, from mile 97, 98, uh, they head to Mingus Mountain a little bit more than 10 miles later, and that section has a lot of climb. I mean, you know, heading up Mingus Mountain, uh, it, it's about uh, an extra 2,000 feet of gain uh, from the start of the climb. And uh, you're coming out of the, uh, uh, the Prescott Valley. So uh, that's, uh, it's good to have that extra cushion right there uh, built up by leaving Fane Ranch. Uh, the cutoff for Mingus Mountain today is uh, 1 in the afternoon. Uh, runners will have to be at Jerome by 8 p.m., and uh, those are our cutoffs that we'll be uh, following here today as uh, not only are we going to monitor the front of the race, but we're also going to keep tabs on the back of the pack as well. Uh, and also, um, we're about uh, 40, 
Let's see. What time is it? Live TV, folks. Yeah, 37 minutes away from the start of the inaugural yeah. Sedona Canyons 250. Yeah, the – no, it's Sedona Canyons 125. Oh, yeah. Folks, so <laughs> it is uh, – the coffee is still brewing here at the Cocodona Studios. Um, but, it yeah. Is, it is only uh, 125 miles. Yeah, only 125. Oh, wait. Do we have a – We we do have a – we. We do have a, a little bit of a tiger sighting out on course here. I want to throw it to Jeff, uh, and we'll see if his, his camera can get turned sideways, but I'm not sure what our audio is uh, looking like today, but we will see if we can hear Jeff in just a second. So I did I fixed one, uh, one thing earlier, so we're going to try and fix another. Let's see. I'm not hearing Jeff. Give me one second, Jeff. Yeah, Jeff is uh, one of those runners that uh, has been making uh, steady progress up through the leaderboard here. Uh, while we were while we were sleeping, uh, Jeff was making moves. So uh, hopefully, we'll be able to. Uh, to talk to him about uh, what his process was, but uh, we'll have to keep working on this. It looks like so. We will send it back to Jeff in just a few minutes when I uh, try to figure out the uh, audio issues here. And for now, we do have one of our volunteer filmers is, uh, is out at Sedona. She's got her camera set up in a much better or a little bit better spot. Now, it's it's a much better spot uh, than our static cam is currently placed. A so shout out to Sheridan uh, out there. She's uh, She's been out there since 4.30 this morning, been helping around the aid station. Our initial plan was uh, to start a little bit earlier, I think, when we set up the volunteer slots. But just given where everyone was... 6 a.m. Uh, 6 a.m. made a lot of sense for us. I think 6 a.m. was plenty early. <laughs> I definitely, uh, as we ended up going later last night than we expected. Uh, special thanks to last night's Era Vipe After Dark guest, uh, Flagstaff local, and uh, you know Stout Runner himself, 2021 second place finisher Pete Mortimer, hung out with us last night, uh, and uh, was uh, sharing his experience and expertise on the course, and actually. Uh, one of the big stories of the early part of the race, uh, he was able to nail it from a from a distance. He kind of sniped that uh, the the point that uh, when Michael Versteeg elected to drop from the race, he actually pointed out the exact point on the course where he thought that Versteeg would uh, would do that in terms of like departing the actual Cocodona 250 course and heading down a trail system that Pete knows very well uh, down to 89A where his crew picked him up and uh, gave him a ride to the next aid station where he turned in his uh, his tracking chip. Uh, Tara was asking what happened to Versteeg. I know that he was dealing with some, uh, some back issues earlier on, or at least heading into the race. I don't know uh, exactly what drew his day to a close, but... Uh, you know, sometimes it's just not the right day. And in a race like this, where if you're starting to see things go sideways, and even if you're in you know, second place at this point, as Versteeg was, and well over you know, 125 miles in, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, the rest of the day is going to go your way. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely right, Chris. Um, this race is just so long and so unforgiving that um, you could be running strong early on and uh, kind of fall apart. You could have some struggles early on and come back and uh, run really strong like we're seeing from uh, Mike McKnight, Sally McRae, and a number of other runners. So, um, yeah, it's just such a such an interesting race uh, because of uh, just how many variables there are to, uh, to factor in. Looks like we've got some footage from uh, potentially a do we have a, a camera from one of our drones heading up 
Is that uh, the Troy Wicks cam? Yep. Troy is uh, set up uh, just outside of Sedona, as you can see the the red rocks in the background, folks. If you've never been to Sedona, uh, it's uh, all the more impressive in person. Clear skies, as you can see. Uh, we'll see if we can. Is that temperature read from Sedona, Matt? Uh, no, I think the temperature is set at Black Canyon City. Okay. Well, we can give a, a quick weather uh, weather update. It's about 10 degrees cooler than the tracker is reading right now in Sedona. It's about 53 degrees, uh, humidity at 46%. Uh, obviously, uh, <laughs> hardly a cloud in the sky to be raining down in these runners. That's one thing that uh, uh, to note is that as far as I saw on the forecast, only one day had even more than like a 5% chance of precipitation, and that's tomorrow. Yep. So in all likelihood, the runners are not going to have to deal with uh, drastic weather in that fashion. And this is the area just north of Sonoma, I believe, uh, just off of 89A, uh, just to the east of 89A. So I did just get confirmation from race command. We did have one runner get timed out at Fane Ranch, uh, or not Fane Ranch, at um, Iron King. So that would have been the overnight cutoff, the one that was kind of the last tight one, and that was bib 193. All right, let me, uh, let me try and figure out that because there were a, there were a handful of runners that we were following uh at that point and that was joseph Hayes. so that was uh joseph who we saw come into whiskey row uh, the man in blue yep the man in blue with about an hour to spare at whiskey row he did get timed out at um at the iron king uh cutoff so that's unfortunate because uh it looked like he had uh, he'd found a gear uh, as he was hitting whiskey row but uh you know, it's a, it's a it's a very long race. So, uh, but uh, kudos to Joseph Haste for making the effort to join us here at the Cocodona 250. Uh, if you uh, are interested in tracking the runners uh, yourself, you can do so at the uh, Cocodona website, right below the window, uh, the video window on YouTube uh, that you're watching right now. Uh, there are a couple links. Uh, one of them is for the Cocodona 250 runner tracking. One is for the Cocodona Web 250 website itself. Uh, there you'll find things such as the runner guide and uh, some uh, detailed course maps. I believe there might even be some GPX files there too if uh, you happen to be heading out here. I, I know that it divides the race up into sections. One of the popular questions that people ask is whether or not they could do this uh, uh, as a through hike on their own. The answer is not entirely as certain key sections of the race happen to traverse private property, uh, including uh, Fane Ranch Aid at mile 97. I mean, you can you can make your way around it, but uh, there are sections that have been prescribed by Jamil Curry and race director Steve Adderholt that if you really want to get the essence of the Cocodona, you can do so through uh, some of those sections. Again, another million-dollar shot of uh, the area just north of Sedona, Arizona. Simply beautiful. One of the other things that we have a link for is uh, uh, the Mountain Outpost uh, shop, and there you can get your Cocodona 250 gear. You can get, uh, we've got hoodies, we've got uh, shirts, um, uh, comfortable sweatpants, uh, some neat-looking bucket hats. I believe they have sandals this year uh, and uh, SPF sun hoodies, uh, you know, some of the backpacks, you know, all sorts of things uh, if you're interested. And that is at the link that's right below the video window uh, for uh, the Cocodona 250 merch. Uh, to give you a preview of our coverage today, uh, I'm going to be here with Matt until probably about 8 30 or so, um, then I have to go and uh, uh, pretend I'm working for a few hours, and uh, Matt will be driving the car uh, by himself, unless uh, we might have, who knows, somebody might stop by and, uh, and join you here, you never know. I know that we've got a couple of potential guests, like from this point moving forward this week, uh, that might be swinging by the studio. Uh, and then at noon, uh, we'll be joined by the, run single, or the single track podcast uh, team of Finn Melanson and Brett Hornig. 
Uh, they'll be taking you through the midday into the afternoon drive from 12 to 6. Uh, and then I will be, be back on at 6 p.m. for Air Vipa After Dark. My guest tonight uh, for the first segment will be a local uh, Flagstaff resident and Cocodona 250 finisher in 2022, Corinne Brown. I wanted to bring Corinne in to talk about her experiences at this race last year, uh, as well as uh, um, the fact that she's going to be out at uh, Fort Tuttle Aid, one of the final large aid stations on the course at uh, about mile 206, 207, as well as her contributions to the community as a leader for the Healthy Kids Running Series here in Flagstaff, Arizona. It's such a such a beautiful area this is. Um, yeah. Again, if you've been to Sedona, you know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, yeah, the, the colors are even more vibrant in person. And when it's a clear blue sky day like this, uh, the red rocks really pop against a, a clear blue sky. Looks like we've got picture in picture of one of our aid stations. I'll see if we can... That, oh, that's going to be the start of the Sedona Canyons 125 area right there. This is just outside of Jerome, Arizona, another wonderful place. Uh, Jerome, uh, a classic uh, Arizona mining town that has turned into a, a tourist destination known for uh, art galleries, wineries, and, uh, and one of my favorite restaurants to head, on, head to when I'm on a road trip, the Haunted Hamburger. I saw a friend of the community, Jan Rice, was hanging out at the front. I know that her partner, Andre Lee, is running the Cocodona, or the Sedona Canyons 125, having finished the Cocodona 250 back in 2021. Yeah, it's going to be super exciting to, uh, to get to watch the uh, start of the inaugural um, – uh, the inaugural Sedona Canyons 125 here in about 25 minutes. Um, again, we will have some footage from out there. And the, 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 the field for the Sedona Canyons 125 is uh, uh, pretty stout as well. Um, I would say the most prominent names would include uh, Denise Barasa, who is uh, a 100 mile and up uh, veteran and uh, Flagstaff resident and uh, former Hard Rock 100 winner, uh, Jeff Browning. Jeff is, uh, uh, I would expect Jeff to have no problem with this race. Uh, he's just, he's on another level. If you've never seen Jeff Browning race, what he can do on a 100 mile course is. Uh, is nothing short of stunning. He, I believe, is the second most all-time 100-mile wins uh, in the sport's history behind only the speed goat himself, Carl Meltzer. And uh, talking with Jeff uh, last week, he, he seems pretty excited. And and frankly, I don't know if this is a, a bit of a hubris or being ahead of the game, but uh, uh, Jeff is planning on joining us on Friday morning here in the studio. So uh, yeah, I think he's feeling pretty good about his chances. We've got him. We've got him penciled in for whenever he's ready to come in after his uh, uh, Sedona Canyons 125 race. We're not sure exactly when that'll be, but uh, uh, he uh, definitely. We gave him the address, and uh, he said that he's looking forward to joining us here on the live stream. Jeff is yeah. <laughs> if Jeff has a hornet venom in his uh, nutrition mix, I wouldn't be surprised. He is a uh, <laughs> a devotee of Vespa, so uh, yeah. And shout out to Jeff, ultra spire athlete. Yeah, uh, Jeff one Garmeyer, of one of our uh, wonderful sponsors of uh, of this live stream and and the uh, Cocodona 250 events. So we have an update from our friend Kelly uh, at uh, Girls in the Run of Northern Arizona, uh, letting us know how much money was raised yesterday. Raised uh, over $2,100 for Girls on the Run of Northern Arizona yesterday. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you very much to the audience for being so generous uh, and, uh, and giving with your donations to Girls on the Run. Of course, Girls on the Run uh, helps to uh, encourage uh, uh, young women to uh, become involved in uh, running in sports and helps provide them with some of the tools necessary, both in terms of instruction and equipment. Shout out to uh, Kelly for uh, 
uh, hopping on the uh, live stream uh, yesterday. Had uh, fun talking with uh, with Kelly uh, as she is a uh, former Iowa resident. Is that um, Michael McKnight? That is Mike McKnight, and it looks like we, we're going to lose him in and out a little bit, and I'm going to see if we can get... That cleaned up a bit. Based on the the color of that dirt that he's chewing up right there, it looks like he's probably uh, just departing Sedona Aid. Yeah, um, we'll see if we can get a little bit better shot here. Yeah, he's definitely um, coming through Sedona. Um, What's, where is he at on the tracker? He's at about mile 163 and a half. Yep, so he's in between that Sedona aid station and that Midgley Bridge area. Yeah, because they're going to head north to the bridge, and uh, you know, and and we're, we're going to see uh, from that shot. Basically, he's heading towards the drone shot that we had with our uh, uh, our amazing pilot, Troy Wicks, here this morning. There we go. It looks like we've got uh, a little bit better frame rate uh, coming in. This uh, this is a feed directly from uh, Mike McKnight's crew. Yep. So, uh, yeah, this is uh, likely from Ben Light. I'm not 100% sure, but I know Ben was uh, was the one filming earlier. So shout out to uh From to rivals to Light. collaborators. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> those uh, who weren't familiar, uh, there was a challenge that uh, the two of them had with regards to the Arizona Trail uh, late last year. But uh, and that's kind of what the trail and ultra running community is all about. Uh, it's a very collaborative spirit. And again, Mike ha is running incredibly strong here. That looks like maybe we are possibly going to be able to get some audio from out there. It looks like there's some audio levels coming in. Yeah, and here we go. Mike McKnight making his way through Sedona. I can hear you guys. It's oh, is this Ben? We're coming in clear. Yeah, yeah I got this is Ben. Awesome. I got your audio fixed here. How's uh, how's Mike feeling? Is he feeling as good as he's looking right now? Oh man, you don't even understand the determination right now. Yeah, it's uh, I was, it's crazy to see uh, how different he looks compared to when we saw him at Camp Kippa on night one. Uh, you know, like an entirely different runner. He took his time there. Uh, kind of gathered himself, and he's, uh, you know, just making an incredible charge uh, right now through Sedona. Yep. What has uh, what has his sleep looked like up to this point, uh, Ben? So he did do a two-hour at Friendly right after trying to regroup from, you know, night, day and night one. And, but since then it's just been pretty much hammer, but he feels good. I'm sure he'll have a, a one or a two, like 10 minute nap, but he's pretty, pretty set on going for a course record if possible. Yeah. And he's... Again, there's still obviously plenty of race left, um, just shy of, at this point, 90 miles. And so a lot of time for uh, for Mike to keep charging, and he's just looking, you know, so strong. Um, how has his uh, back been feeling since day one? Has he been having any other issues that he's been kind of putting to the side, or has that seemed to kind of resolve itself? It's not resolved, but it's not flared worse. Yep. So he's kind of moving with gratitude. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Not right now, but like maybe. As you can see, the ground has that distinctive uh, Sedona red to it. As uh, Mike McKnight makes his way north out of Sedona, uh, the course is going to actually take a uh, uh, go from uh, heading north to making his way east. Actually, at this point, he might already be heading east now that I think about it. I think he's up. Yeah. Ben, were you out um, crewing Mike last year? Yeah. And I know that you were here in year one. How did the, uh, like that first half of uh, the race in terms of just the course uh, kind of uh, what were like the noticeable differences from uh, year one and year two to this year's race uh, that you noticed out there? Well, obviously a different route at the beginning for two and three, you know, from one and three. So the beginning, a lot cooler temps year this year on the climb. And but still a lot of destruction. So many yeah. people still got caught off guard. But other than that, I mean, I think it's dialing itself in. I mean, the course markings are fantastic. The routes are difficult and epic. And it's just becoming a such amazing premium grit of a race yeah and i think just over time making just those little tweaks to to things will keep helping this uh this race evolve and you can see the beautiful views of the uh sedona red rocks here hopefully keeping mike in uh keeping mike in good spirits Sedonans uh, uh, claim that there's magic in those vortexes or vortices. Um, you, sometimes when you're out there, you can really feel that energy. So, yeah, last area. year, I was gonna say last year uh, we were doing this in the dark. Yep. Like a little, you know, the other route, but this is pretty freaking amazing. Yeah, I, I remember uh, last year we went off air, and then I woke up overnight, and all of a sudden uh, Mike was in second and uh, making a <laughs> making a huge charge uh, up the Coconino Plateau. And so things aren't looking too much different this year. He's a little bit further back than he was at this point last year. However, um, he's running just as strong, and he's uh, eating up ground on uh, on everyone in front of him. So, yes. It just, I think it really goes to show anybody watching and life lesson kind of thing is like, there's, there's so much to be said for the race isn't over until it's over to keep charging ahead. Things can turn around. There's so many, so many contrasts from what's going on. Yeah. And Ben, uh, you'll, you'll probably like this. We just had someone in the chat saying, Riding off Mike and McKnight before day three is like riding off Tom Brady before the fourth quarter. You just, you just don't do it. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's fantastic and very, uh, very true. Yeah. So uh, I was just wondering, where did where did the dark McKnight come from? We're all it, laughing about it. Yeah. So like most uh, great ideas uh, on the Coconut live stream, it came from the live chat. So it was wholly crowdsourced um <laughs> i i'm not sure who the uh first person in the live chat to coin that name was so uh i apologize for that but yeah it's a, a growing thing the dark mcknight it's that's pretty good yeah i mean we had the comeback kid in our minds but that like totally surpasses that <laughs> <laughs> i could just envision uh, maybe for uh you know Maybe some upcoming pre-race photos. Uh, Mike McKnight showing up with a point, uh, pointed cowl, 
Well, yeah, uh, his, warm up, his warm up suit is going to need to be like a Batman outfit from now on. <laughs> He's going to, uh, you know, have to start wearing that at uh, a packet pickup or something. <laughs> I was thinking like, like the Grim Reaper could, he comes back from the dead just to slaughter <laughs> the field. <laughs> oh. oh, you can see these, uh, these beautiful visuals here, uh, as they make their way, basically, uh, paralleling highway 89 a, uh, before they head, uh, fully East towards, uh, the final stretches of, uh, of the race before they ascend the Coconino Plateau. Yeah, and I think for right now, we're going to send it to our Sedona drone shot here for a second. Ben, thank you so much for checking in. And then we're yeah. going to uh, head over to the start of the Sedona Canyons 125 here in just a matter of moments. So, Ben, thanks so much, yeah. and we uh, look forward to some more check-ins later on. Yeah, if I got service after the big climb, I'll, I'll see if I can bring it back to life. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. Yep. Mike McKnight doing work this morning, and uh, that's the area where they're down uh, and running. So uh, absolutely uh, gorgeous setting there in the uh, in that area of the state, Sedona, Arizona, known internationally for its natural beauty. It's one of the things that uh, when you head to Sedona from uh, – I believe it's Highway 179 heading off uh, Interstate 17. When you come up from where we live down in the Valley of the Sun in Phoenix, Arizona, at least where I live, um, it's uh, it's truly a sight to behold. I actually pull off to the side of the road just to admire uh, the the visuals as you approach Sedona simply because of uh, uh, the amazing beauty. You head through Oak Creek when you head to Sedona. Or if you're coming from the north, if you're coming from Flagstaff, where we're at right now, you actually uh, will see uh, the the beauty in, a, in an entirely different fashion. You're actually driving right down uh, Oak Creek Canyon, and uh, you pass Slide Rock State Park, and, and it's an entirely uh, different kind of beauty as well. And it looks like we have our drone up over at the start of the Sedona Canyons 125. And we do have our, we're working on cleaning up uh, the guest feed of Jamil Curry. And those runners right there about to embark on a journey of their own as they uh, prep for the Sedona Canyons 125. Yeah, and so Jamil will be, I think, heading out uh, with the start of the Sedona Canyons 125 here. Let's see if I can get that back on. Here in just a second. But we are, yeah, just uh, a short nine minutes away from the start of the first ever Sedona Canyons 125. So this is going to start uh, up near Jerome. Uh, just kind of outside. So on the Cogadona 250 course, this was uh, in there. You've got our picture in picture. I don't. And if you go no, on the runner tracker, audio. Uh, for the Coconut 250 race, <laughs> we, uh, hey. uh, the men's yeah, uh, bibs have been highlighted in blue. Excited and you're able to make this work. Sorry about uh, history, yeah. Would that be uh, uh, magenta, perhaps? Um, but uh, the if you zoom into the area around Jerome, <laughs> there is a whole pile of new uh, bib numbers uh, starting in the 400s, and uh, those are in orange and yellow, and those will yep. be on the tracker as well. So uh, you're going to see a lot more traffic than you had over the last couple of days. Excuse me, on the tracker for the Coconut 250. Right. And I'm working to see if we can get our audio 
Yeah. So do you want to like be up audio. with like we Funko in the front, yeah. and I'll just kind there of go. We can hear it. I can hear it. Oh, What's kind of cool is I'm on the remote. So I can hear it now. I can hear, is that Jamil? Yep. So okay. Jamil will be uh, following on this camera feed. I'm going to pull that off. There's some music uh, in the background there, and I don't want to uh, get our stream pulled down, but it looks like we're working through uh, some of our audio issues. Uh, you know I've got to come in and give a shout-out. Amy Green in the chat from Australia <laughs> tuning in almost midnight so I'm interested. Uh, what part of Australia are you? Uh, are you in there, Amy? Um, I've got family in Brisbane, so it is. Um, let's see, it's about almost two a.m. there. Um, well, she said she's almost about head to. Oh no, ready to head to bed. So, what time is it there? No, it's almost midnight. Yeah, so math is hard right now, but uh, yeah, shout out to all the Aussies. It's just over there in the beautiful. Uh, state of Queensland for the last couple of months, but and it looks like we just lost our Enzo feed and it's back up. There we go. Oh, let's. Let me. Looks also like we have a couple other Aussies in the, the chat. Thanks for joining us here uh, late at night. Uh, it is uh, bright and early in the morning here, but uh, we did go late into the night last night. Uh, went later than we normally do here. Uh, I believe we didn't sign off till about 12.30 in the morning simply because uh, we had some uh, race coverage to uh, keep tabs on in uh, our race leader uh, on the men's side, Killian Korth, uh, hit Sedona aid. Uh, right around midnight, and so we kept tabs on him while uh, while we could. And then uh, uh, our uh, filmer uh, extraordinaire Shad, uh, we decided to let him go get some sleep as well, as uh, he has all sorts of filming duties here this week. Uh, Shad does a great job. Last year, as we mentioned, he filmed while running 83 miles through the streets of Flagstaff. This wasn't a trail race. This was a, a one or two mile stretch of road that he was going back and forth on. And as uh, you and Pete joked last night, probably secured local legend <laughs> status as he as he did it uh, on Strava. So, Yeah, and again, we will, uh, we will work on trying to keep you on that drone shot above Sedona Canyon's the uh, feed keeps coming in and out on the drone, so we'll try our best to stay on that. Uh, well, I guess that is best we can. Yeah, I agree, Daniel. Uh, Pete was an amazing guest last night. And uh, one of the fun things about uh, having Pete Mortimer on a live stream is that uh, he has a very uh, particular way of doing things. And um, uh, he brought in a, a bit of monkey shoulders uh, for us. To, and we uh, do have eyes on our race leader. This is a, a oh, look. fantastic! This is up. So uh, we're flying. Uh, our drone is flying out of the Schnebly aid station. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm assuming that this is prior to the aid station. So we flew out and found him. So Killian Korth should be coming into the Schnebly Hill aid station. Um, and Which Jason is, is flying below the tree line. He's just trying to yep. you know, He's keep eyes you, on him. So it, you're, it's going to be uh, tough to see him in and out here as he pops in and out of the uh, shade of the beautiful Ponderosa Pines. But this is uh, what runners are going to be treated to. And the weather up here in Flagstaff proper is, uh, is a brisk 41 degrees. So <laughs> it's going to cool down quite a bit for uh, – for runners and uh yeah so we do have eyes on him we will circle back to that i don't want to miss the start of sedona canyons here so we've got our drone about three minutes out from that start of sedona canyons there's jamil on the ground he's going to be uh f running out with the runners um once they go out we'll see if we can get some audio possibly but there was some music going on a little bit ago and so we will uh yeah we'll try our best and again 
the drone is uh, kind of going in and out there. We are high above the town of Sedona. Again, we're going to see if we can keep that, um, keep that, uh, looks like the runners are starting to gather towards the chute of, uh, Sedona Canyons 125. Yep. And we're back there. can see the yeah the migration of runners uh heading to the start line and there we go you can see Jamil on the ground there of course, uh, I assume that Jamil is going to uh, uh, follow these runners for as long as he darn well feels like. <laughs> so they actually don't start directly on the. Uh, That's the correct. Course, which is uh, probably they a, start at the kind of historic ghost town, I believe. Yeah, yeah. They actually, uh, basically, this starting shoot area, if you were to look at it, basically extends out, uh, maybe. Uh, a tenth of a mile before they actually join the uh, the Cocodona 250 course. And they're off. And it looks like Jamil is out in the lead, but uh, Jamil is not in the race. <laughs> but that is definitely Bronco Billy. I can tell uh, even in a, a smaller pixelated window uh, out to uh, lead right away. Uh, I, I really believe that this is going to be a Bronco Billy showcase uh, you know such an amazing runner to watch uh, the way he does things and also you know for those who believe that uh, you know they don't have a chance to uh, get to start and learn how to do this you're talking about one of the you know the elite athletes in this sport uh, and I believe that at this point uh, Jeff is 51 years old and uh, you know has uh, you know has had a, a few recent wins um, he won the Mesquite Canyon 50 miler here, Elephant Mountain 50 K, Cold Water Rumble 100, Desert Solstice. He finished fifth, um, yeah, and Desert Solstice being a completely different animal. Also winning Moab 240 last year. So uh, Bronco Billy himself uh, is uh, gracing us on the course here for Sedona Canyons 125. I wonder if he's just looking at this as a uh, Hard Rock training run uh, because uh, he's. Uh, He's truly fantastic and uh, uh, an inspiring athlete, in my opinion, simply because of the fact that uh, whereas uh, some people might be uh, looking at the, uh, the questioning whether or not they're able to uh, operate at a high level, he's still not only, you know, running races, he's still a, a dominant level athlete. And there we do have, let's we'll see if we can pull that audio in there. As I said, ultra aspire athlete, Bronco Billy, out to an early lead. Yeah, make Jamil work, Bronco Billy. Love to see it. Yeah, also a guy that gives back to the community uh, as a whole, as uh, uh, Lisa Pazzoni in the chat mentions. Uh, uh, Bronco Billy, who was running the final aid station at Crown King's Travel this year. It's a pretty epic start, just like being able to run right through Jerome. Yeah, it was so sick. We stayed in the haunted pit house last night. Really? <laughs> yeah. In Jerome? Yeah. Nice. And, uh, our bedroom looks over the east and we're excited to watch the sun come out. Sweet.
is there's a couple of like there's one big penthouse above like to the right and above the haunted hamburger place. Got it. And that's what we're staying. It's Jeff like is... skull, skull and skeletons theme throughout. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, and, and for those not familiar with Jeff, he's gonna he's gonna stay at the front of this pack uh, for the next 124 and three quarters Thanks. miles. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> That's work. Uh, How you doing? Good. How are you? So awesome. I'm awesome. Great work. Yes, you are awesome. Yeah, you did a great job. Yes. Love it. That's amazing. <laughs> the camaraderie shared between the. Uh, uh, Cocodona and Sedona Canyons runners. That was Mindy Coolman and her pacer that he just passed, bib number 23. Uh, Mindy is uh, basically halfway through her race, uh, whereas Jeff's is just starting. And you can see off uh, off to the side, uh, that's actually right around the area where the uh, uh, where the parking lot is uh, in the Jerome Hill climb. So Jeff is actually going to be heading to uh, Jerome proper, I believe, here uh, uh, in just a few moments, where he will be running through town uh, briefly. Tom Abbott oh, in the chat. Oh, Enzo! Enzo! Fuck! <laughs> 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 God. Uh oh, that's that's not uh, that's not good. I literally told him on the way up. I was like, "Watch out for these power lines." <laughs> oh my! <laughs> uh, might have to. Uh, might have an. Uh, yep. Oh, we've got a drone down. <laughs> drone down. Power line. Live TV, <laughs> folks. <laughs> Beautiful views that uh, Jeff gets to take in as he's heading into uh, Jerome proper here. Uh, that that shot of the Verde Valley you can get from a lot of the restaurants and uh, uh, art galleries in Jerome. Uh, there's a place, uh, I don't know what it is now, but it was a tasting room for a place called Cellar 433. And I would just sit at the window by myself with, uh, with a wine tasting and... You go right on that just sidewalk. Soak it all in. And for those in the chat asking about Sarah O, um, I did reach out to Race Command. They're reaching out to her to uh, to check in, but it does look like she may be off course. But it is again, it is hard to tell just because of uh, GPS flow. GPS like flow, but. <laughs> Oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Once you get out of Jerome, it's a steep descent, loose, rocky. It's like hard rock style. So. Well, knowing that a race is hard rock style will definitely uh, play to Jeff Browning's Parallel strengths. Kind of, yeah. Runner. And he was fifth last year at Hard Rock uh, in 2022. Well, I mean, it's but it's like private property. There's like kind of a trail, but not really. It's like a <laughs> utility corridor. Oh, yeah, you can see Jeff heading into Jerome proper here, uh, just Travis. passing the fire station. Travis in the chat. Jamil's getting a little threshold work in here. Love to see it. Sherm in the chat. Even the drones are having a hard time keeping up. Giddy up. <laughs> Uh, they are actually uh, heading up here, just passing uh, Caduceus Cellars here on the left, owned by uh, front, Tool frontman Maynard James Keenan. Next one. That, that's Caduceus right there. Let me see you back on the sidewalk in the uh, side. And now they're passing the Spirit Room. How do I know all of these uh, amazing uh, beverage establishments in Jerome? Don't ask me. For the next left, just past the Burn Building. Now, Jamil, imagine looking up there and seeing the air of Ipa blimp from KP, Pel KP <laughs> Kelly. You know, a blimp would solve a lot of uh, a lot of things. 
Yeah, a lot of these old buildings have been uh, preserved through time in Jerome, and uh, you know you can feel the the magic energy in that town. Uh, there's the building I was mentioning earlier. It's a. Uh, I know that the address is 433. Good morning. It used to be called the 433 Cellar, and it's it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, passing Bobby Q's, another fantastic restaurant in Jerome. I've been there a few times, Matt. In case you haven't picked up on it. Uh, uh, just a great weekend getaway if you happen to uh, and have never been there, if you live in Arizona, or if uh, if you come to Arizona, I highly recommend Jerome as a, uh, a stop on your trip. Looks like we have a lot of people who are referencing the Jerome Hill Climb, another race uh, that takes place in Jerome. Uh, typically Labor Day weekend. I know that it's early September, almost always Labor Day weekend. But uh, that's put on by the Arizona Road Racers. And uh, one of the fun things about the Jerome Hill Climb, as we watch Jeff Browning in the streets of Jerome, is that uh, you basically start uh, at the bottom below town, run through town, past town and up the uh, Forest Service roads for about 4.3 miles, maybe about 1,200 feet of gain. And then you get to the finish up there at the, the top of the hill. And then uh, then you have to walk back down after you're done with the race. So uh, even though it is a 4.2, 4.3 mile race, you get a full, at, at bare minimum, depending on where you park, you get yep, a bare great. minimum seven, seven and a half miles of running. I guess the markings uh, are a little lack, luster. Of course, uh, Jeff Browning is in the Sedona Canyons 125. We've got multiple uh, distances going on right now. Um, I see uh, Liam asking, what are the chances we get shots of Killian Korth hitting Eldon at dusk tonight? Uh, Killian Korth currently leading the Pocadona 250. Um, I'll tell you what, if he's there, we're going to get those shots because I know we're going to have filmers and boots on the ground at uh, Fort Tuttle. So uh, as far as uh, Eldon itself, I know that... Uh, we're going to have some people up there. We'll have Julian Galuzzi and Pete Mortimer. And if we wanted to, we could basically just call them anyways. So. Yeah, but You're sometimes... You're kind of uh, the field already, Jeff. <laughs> look, at the, look at the background right there. It shows, uh, you know, the unique physical uh, uh, setup yeah, of Jerome, kind of being a, uh, you know, essentially a couple roads kind of crisscrossing and switchbacking up the side of yep. the mountain. So uh, did get confirmation from um, from our uh, race command. Uh, last runner is out of Fane Ranch. So hey. all runners are going to be uh, making their way towards Mingus Mountain. Uh, and that's about mile three. That's where my car still is unsure at. about Sarah, but we do have, have eyes on her via our drone. Follow you down the hill. So and I'll I'm, be actually I'll probably I'll see you a lot. Today, I'm gonna so switch it to we're kind of following the drone the shot here in Sedona for just a minute. See if we have eyes on her. It looks like we do not currently, but when we do have eyes on uh, Sarah O, we will bring it back and we'll try to keep this picture in picture on um, regardless so that you can kind of keep following the action. Um, at least while Jamil is uh, following the runners here. Well, fun fact, uh, running at altitude, <laughs> joking that Jamil is looking to run the entire race, uh, Jamil uh, was intending to run the Stony Canyons 125 here this year, but uh, unfortunately just uh, was not going to be able to too. because he wanted to uh, help with the uh, the filming and the coverage of the race itself. I just love the, the shot of Sedona or uh, Jerome in the background as we see uh, – um, early leader of the Sedona Canyons 125, Jeff Browning. And so we did get uh, just an update from Troy Wicks, our drone pilot, who does have her on camera there now. Yep. And so that's Midgley Bridge right there. Yep. Midgley Bridge. There's a pacer, uh, Morgan. Um, she, her tracker's not working. She did take a nap. Okay. Uh, so she stopped to take a nap. Uh, said did her tracker's on the not tracker? working. Uh, may maybe, I don't know, but she's making her way um, down uh, under the bridge 
um, and then will eventually make her way down to Oak Creek. I was I would have been very surprised if Sarah got lost in this area. I um, agree. <laughs> there's probably no one on uh, on the course or no one who trains on the Sedona section of the course as much as uh, Sarah has. So yeah, yeah this um, is basically a 35 minute drive from the Flagstaff area where Sarah calls home. Yep, and we'll see if I pull Jamil's audio. <laughs> Jamil, we got a question from the chat. If you can hear us, what uh, what what pace are you guys running right now? I'm not sure if Jamil can hear our audio or not. Uh, wow, uh, thank you for the generous super I chat donation uh, from uh, Adventures of Pinky Mortimer and the Poop. Uh, I got lost or something. <laughs> <laughs> we got it though. I nice. feel like uh, sometimes when we can hear them and they can't hear us, it's a little bit inside guys. baseball. We get to, especially when you hear two friendly elites like this. Uh-huh. It's funny. They actually, like, you have a personal cow. We caught one two years later. Oh, man. One, because that whole herd got, somebody left the gate out. Oh, yeah. They went up and over. Uh, Talking cow wow. herds uh, as uh, <laughs> Jeff is about so a mile and a half into the Sedona Canyon. There's a whole wild herd up there. They, they're basically wild like elk. Yeah. Like I guarantee, folks, he's probably doing about a 745, like eight-minute pace right now. <laughs> so he roped it. Maybe even faster. <laughs> tied it to a tree. <laughs> and it wore itself out so much. Yeah. <laughs> it died. Oh, God. And so then he called... The guy who owns it, and they got like a razor and a trailer up there. Was the meat still good? Yeah, they got oh, it. Out. Okay. They got it out the same day. Wow. It just wore itself out. Damn. He said, when he got it all roped up, he'd been fighting it forever. It almost took his horse out. Yeah. A couple times it would like just come like go slack and run to his horse. And we'll see if and Troy can he finally keep got two uh, ropes Sarah on it. framed in the so left kind of two thirds. Roped it up, got it on his side. There. And he said like, he was just sweating. Look at that. Thanks he's so like, much, this Troy. is awesome coverage he's like, right here. Down Video on shots. The cow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff oh. narrating a story about right, cows and we following Sarah and down the trails of Sedona. This Ooh. is how I want to spend every morning. And Di's voice sitting up. God. Uh. T. Gray Albert just grabbed coffee. Who's leading on the women's side? That is Eliza Lapierre. That is correct. Still, uh, still out in front on the ladies' side. I believe she is making her way, um, probably up the Kasner Mountain or the Kasner Canyon climb. Um, I would assume. Let's see. Once, once you've hit kind of the water station, that's when that climb is basically topped out, um, and that is the uh, Schnebly Overlook, is uh, is kind of what that is. I don't know. Looks like maybe we lost Jamil's audio here. Still love the videos. Just seeing, and, and it was great to just be a fly on the wall for their conversation. Jeff just having a, you know, what amounts to and feels like a, a casual run, um, you know, out in the streets uh, just outside of Jerome, Arizona. And it looks like Troy is going out of range, so he's going to be coming back. Of course, the runners of the Sedona Canyons 125 have. Uh, uh, Jeff Browning setting the pace, and uh, he's currently about two miles in, give or take, uh, at this point, uh, 16 minutes into their race. Um, but there are uh, many more runners in that event as well. And as you uh, follow on the runner track, runner tracking, which is available uh, on the uh, just below the the video on the YouTube page. You know, you'll see a whole new slew of bibs in different colors that will represent those runners. Uh, Brett uh, asking a question. Uh, how many snakes does a runner encounter on the 250 or 125? Uh, as uh, he encountered two last night on a South Mountain hike, uh, made him curious about what types of wildlife runners encounter on these. Uh, as somebody who lives roughly a mile and a half from South Mountain, I can tell you that uh, 
you're going to encounter more snakes there than you will in Sedona and uh, northbound from there. Um, you know, you'll see some, you know, it's potentially on the Black Canyon Trail. You'll see uh, snakes uh, further south, but the further north you get, the more sporadic uh, they might become. You're more likely to encounter things like probably coyotes up uh, further north. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, South Mountain, you know, I, I am a uh, regular over at Pima Canyon Trailhead as well as uh, Telegraph Pass in the area on National Trail west of Telegraph Pass. That's where uh, I do most of my uh, training and, and running. And uh, I see snakes out there all the time. But, uh, but in this area, probably not so many, but all sorts of other wildlife uh, for sure. And it looks like we also have some footage from Bryce Brooks, and this appears to be down in the um, Jerome area. Am I right, Chris? That's, uh, yeah, that's the road uh, that... Yeah. Uh, and Bryce can hear us, which is good. So uh, I don't think Jamil could hear us, so it may have been uh, just a us to those Jamil are issue. Those are red or orange bibs, so those are all Sedona Canyons 125 runners. See bib number 441 right there. That would be Matthew Shapiro, bib number 416. Matthew Shapiro was out uh, filming some video for us. Oh, I know who this group is. This is, uh, this is Matt Kahn on the right. Aaron Berger is probably with them as well. Uh, yeah, uh, these guys are... Uh, <laughs> They go, they go hard in, uh, uh, in this crew, um, basically spending every weekend somewhere either doing something like Rim to Rim to Rim or the Highline Trail. Uh, you know, these guys are uh, definitely um, uh, fantastic uh, athletes. Matt Kahn uh, ran the uh, Mogian Monster last year and had an excellent race. Bib number four one two there as well. Uh, Tobias Wengren, uh, Wenergren and four oh seven uh, Derek Floodman out of uh, New Mexico. Uh, just a couple miles into their race, uh, about one hundred and twenty three miles to go. And I again, I love this shot uh, that uh, is being brought to us by Bryce Brooks. Uh, as these runners are leaving Sedona, or not Sedona, Jerome rather, during the Stona Canyons 125, uh, they've got great views to the front of them. And, uh, you know, depending on which angle you get, you can see the historic buildings of Jerome, which cut an amazing image into the side of a mountain uh, in the background as well. Yeah, this is, uh, this is an excellent shot here. See if at some point, if Bryce can unmute on his end, we might be able to pick up some audio from the course. And it looks like we have audio. We will need to change the setting here so that we can hear it. There we ah, go. There Thanks we go. so much, Bryce. be see interesting to watch how uh, the freshness of a whole new uh, crew of runners being unleashed on the course is going to uh, uh, affect the energy of those who have been uh, uh, basically going for two days now. I'm hoping that it helps to bring the vibe up for these runners as uh, they grind on their way to Flagstaff. Let's work, Josh. Number 466, Josh Pantello. Uh, Heading past him. I do have to say, Matt, uh, it's really, uh, I, I, I love the colors of the bibs this year. It makes uh, the visuals here on the live stream much easier to pick up than uh, some of the other races in times past. Like a, a visually stunning bib is really cool and everything, but sometimes basic in terms of being selfish and doing coverage of a live stream for a race uh, 
know, it, it makes it very easy to pick these uh, bib numbers up as uh, as we're going by the runners. Amy, uh, let's see, Josh in the chat, where and how long did Killian sleep? So Josh slept for, from the time I got a text that he was going for a nap to the time that uh, he was up from his nap was 55 minutes. Okay. Um, and that was at the Deer Pass aid station. In a 200 miler, that's a solid nap. I mean, you know, we saw that's actually more sleep than uh, last year's winner, Joe String McConaughey, got all race. So, yeah, uh, and it sounds like also uh, we had a check in from Mike McKnight. Um, it sounds like he took a two hour nap on night one um, back at, I believe, Friendly Pines. So that would have been you know, just past where we saw him uh, at Camp Kippa when we ended the night. So he took a two hour nap, which is quite a bit of, uh, of sleep for. From Mike McKnight. For Chris asking the, the hard hit <laughs> The dark McKnight. Chris asking the hard hitting questions in the chat. Uh, what shoes are the commenters wearing? I'm not wearing shoes. I'm wearing socks. <laughs> Classic. What am I wearing? Well, I am. Uh, a, I am wearing a pair of Speedland uh, GS Tams, uh, courtesy of our uh, good friends at Speedland. So, those are pretty neat looking, dude. Like, yeah, we've got. Uh, I really haven't had a chance to look at some of the speedlands up close, but uh, they're uh, some physically like striking shoes. We've got uh, a number of pair uh, around the house here. This as, is true. Uh, <laughs> Finn and Brett also have uh, have some pairs that they. I, wear, I'm feeling so. left out. I feel like I'm the uh, only per. I'm the last guy on the block to uh, have a pair of speedlands. Speaking of on the block, did you hear the story? Uh, Finn and Brett, who are staying here in the, the house with us uh, yesterday as they came back from one of their runs. This is their first time in Flagstaff exploring. They were heading down the street, just the street that we're on. And uh, who was uh, coming at them uh, during a shakeout run? It was uh, Ida Nielsen, uh, the, uh, the Canyons uh, winner this past weekend. And uh, <laughs> Brett said to her, hey, great job this weekend. And she was confused that somebody would randomly on the street know what she had done. It was, uh, it was a pretty funny story to hear. How many miles did you run to train for, for this drive? For this? Lots. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I think the question I have, Bryce, how many miles have you run the first two days here? Oh, we got to switch. <laughs> See, they can actually hear you guys if you want to say hi. What's going on? You guys want to say hi to your mom or anything like that? Oh, sweetie. Hey, mom. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Bryce, it's Chris here. Uh, can you tell Matt Kahn that I said hello? Matt Kahn. Chris Borden says hello. <laughs> I had a, a fun. I, I see Matt around a lot. And he's a great guy. Chris, he says you have to go out with a beer with him. I would love that. Uh, tell him to, to make his way to, Sedo or to Flagstaff, and we'll make that happen. All right. He'll be there as soon as he can. <laughs> So some of the runners are doing, yeah, so the runners we're currently following just started uh, their 125-mile adventure of the inaugural uh, Sedona Canyons. Um, so they are off this starts in the historic ghost town just outside of uh, Jerome and follows the uh, Cogodona 250 course um, all the way to the finish in the mecca of high-altitude endurance running Flagstaff, Arizona. Wait, you mean uh, uh, contrary to, the, to some of the other opinions I've heard? I wasn't going to get into that, Chris, but <laughs> I, I uh, will in fact say uh, Auburn, that. California is not the endurance capital of America. Um, that there are maybe, in my opinion, Auburn, California, love Auburn, California. But sure, there yeah. are also a number of other uh, great candidates for that title, including Flagstaff. Maybe maybe Boulder, Colorado, uh, maybe Bend, Oregon, uh, and a number of other places. You know? I, I just so. feel like Flag is pretty amazing because everywhere you go in town, you're basically, you know, you know sharing a, an aisle in a grocery store with, you know, an Olympic hopeful or a, uh, you know, FKT holder. Flagstaff is unique to me in that regard. And it looks like we've got a drone back up around Sedona. Um, 
it's not the same drone. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can confirm that. Um, I'm not sure who's flying, but um, we, will s we will keep it on this shot for right now. Allison was asking who's run this more this week, Bryce or Jamil. I'm fairly confident that it's but Bryce. Bryce can hear us, so Bryce can probably give us an answer. I've uh, I've been slacking a little bit. I think I'm only at like 13. Jamil definitely has more at this point. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, by the end of the race, it will have been you, correct? Bryce has been sleeping, resting up for his uh, producing duties in the final days here. He's also got pacing back. duties, right? He's got pacing duties, crewing duties. He, he's a man of uh, many talents. Okay, so uh, a message from uh, Spider Pena telling uh, Matt Kahn that uh, he'll have the lightsaber waiting for him. It's been windy up here, uh, and that's not uncommon here in northern Arizona. It's, uh, you know, but it has been clear. So the weather, I think, you know, for the large part, has been extremely favorable. Not as uh, um, hot as it was in 2021. Uh, we'll see if that uh, that holds holds suit. But uh, yeah, we're heading in the streets of Jerome. We're we're in the streets of Jerome uh, for the first couple miles of the Sedona Canyons 125. Howdy. How are you doing? Good, you? Good, so far. Right on. Uh, Tawny asking the hard-hitting questions in the chat. How many flavors does Flota have? One. And, of course, uh, we got to sample it last night. Uh, we had uh, our uh, friend of the family, Rob Martin, uh, generously take time out of his day on his commute from Phoenix to Flagstaff to, to pick up Go a case down, that man. we had uh, uh, obtained, and uh, we tried it live on the air. We tried the one flavor uh, of Florida. Got speed. And we do have, it looks like Jamil, Jamil's got a drone back up here. As he is following some of our runners coming in here. And we will also take a look at Troy, who is um, up in Sedona there. And so he will be looking for um, some of our 250 mile runners who should be coming in uh, into shot uh, in the not too distant future. And Sheldon in the chat. I'll pull up Sheldon Etter, or however you pronounce your name. I apologize. Your initial comment here. You need separate feeds for each race. I I actually tend to agree. I'm hoping that in the future, uh, you know, with more uh, more support, that that's something that we will be able to do. So I definitely don't disagree with you. Uh, I don't disagree with you there. Um, Hopefully in the future with more uh, incredible live stream volunteers and more uh, and more support so that we can have more drone pilots dedicated to each race. We'll be able to provide that coverage, but I appreciate you, uh, you tuning in and checking it out. Uh, Rory asking in the chat what the Flota rating was. Um, I think that, uh, we all were under agreement that, uh, it, ex it's exactly what it says it is. <laughs> I didn't think it was, uh, it wasn't bad at all. Um, it wasn't, uh, the greatest thing ever. Um, Flota is exactly what it aspires to be. And so I guess that we can, uh, you know, take solace in that. Yeah, I actually thought it was pretty good. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. 
I'm not normally a soda drinker myself, so uh, um, a flatter soda is uh, not normally my cup of tea, but it wasn't, again, it wasn't bad. Uh, although uh, we did uh, learn that it does not mix particularly well with Monkey Shoulders whiskey. <laughs> first-hand, uh, first-hand experience there. Folks, that's the kind of hard-hitting information that you look for on these uh, live streams here uh, as we cover the Cocodona 250. Uh, going to take a quick spin through our leaderboard on the 250-mile race. Uh, uh, Killian Korth is approaching mile 180, still our race leader. Michael Greer at mile 177 is in second. And in third, interesting, we have movement as Josh Perry, uh, the international through-hiking man of mystery himself, has moved up to third place. Josh Perry, if you're looking for him on ultra sign-up, good luck with that because he has literally no results, which is... Uh, Pretty amazing uh, thing for somebody. But then again, those who are in the know know that Josh Perry uh, has uh, uh, FKT, Fastest Known Times, on uh, some of the most uh, uh, daunting through hikes uh, in, in the country. On the women's side, our leader is Eliza LaPierre, uh, sitting third overall. Uh, Mika Thews is in second about a mile and a half back. And in third place is Sarah Ostazewski. And it looks like Sarah is about two to two and a half miles back of Mika. Uh, other runners uh, that are uh, uh, into or close to the top 10, uh, Mike Groenwagen on the men's side in fourth, Michael McKnight in fifth, Kevin Goldberg sixth, Jeff Garmeyer seventh, Christopher St. John eighth, Dominic Grossman ninth, and Jason Kanan, a new man to the leaderboard in 10th place. On the women's side, as we mentioned, Eliza, uh, Mika, and Sarah in one, two, three. Uh, there's a very significant gap uh, after Sarah in third place. Sarah's 169 miles in. Currently running in fourth is Sally McRae at mile 152. So that's a, fifth, a 16 and a half, 17 mile gap between third and fourth, which uh, is not insurmountable, but is also not insignificant at this point. Sally McRae in fourth. See if I can uh, find Don Greenwald in fifth, Alicia Jenkins in sixth, Carol Northup in seventh, Carrie Henderson in eighth, Desiree Clark has moved up to ninth, and in tenth place, another new name to the leaderboard, Mindy Kuhlman. So these are the runners uh, we will be following uh, at the front of the pack for the uh, Cocodona 250. Uh, for the runners that are, uh, I'll tell you what, <laughs> the leader, or the, not the leaderboard, but the runner tracking uh, has a whole lot more going on. Um, looking at some of the uh, significant names to have called it uh, to this point, uh, obviously the biggest name uh, would be the 2021 winner, Mike Versteeg. Uh, Mike Versteeg uh, opted to call it a night uh, just past uh, uh which aid station was that? Dead was? Horse Ranch. Dead Horse Ranch. And just prior to um, Deer Pass. Deer Pass, yeah. So uh, Mike Versteeg uh, opting to uh, call it a race this year. Um, other significant or notable names uh, uh, to DNF at this point, uh, Pete Kostelnik, uh, holder of a cross-country FKT and a former Badwater winner, uh, Pete Kostelnik, uh, opted to um, – pull out at uh, Whiskey Row uh, yesterday. I believe it was about uh, early afternoon during our broadcast when that took place. Um, another notable name, Ed the Jester Eddinghausen, uh, somebody whose resume is longer than anybody else's in this in this race, including uh, Jeff Browning's. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Jester, his ultra sign-up goes on forever and ever. He's run over 200 hundred milers at this point, I believe. And uh, he... Uh, took a DNF uh, fairly early on in the race as well. And we are overlooking Sedona here as we uh, look for our next runners. We also uh, should have Michael Greer, your second place male runner, uh, making his way to the Schnebly Hill aid station in just a couple of miles. So we should have eyes on him uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, looks like he's maybe about a mile and a half out from that aid station. Um, we should have a drone out there that will find him a little bit 
in a little bit. Looks like we're going to have to follow up on uh, a, a hot tip in the chat from our friend Roy Monahan, our guest on Aravipa After Dark on night one of the Cocodona 250 live stream, uh, mentioning uh, that Kerry Henderson uh, might have dropped in Jerome. We can't confirm that. Uh, we always uh, uh, defer to race command in regards to that. But thank you very much, Roy, for mentioning that because uh, – We'll definitely uh, do our best to get word on that. Uh, Carrie is uh, no stranger to this race, uh, having run it and finished it in the past. Um, so it would be unfortunate if uh, Carrie Henderson was uh, calling it a day in Jerome, uh, roughly the halfway point for Cocodona 250. Uh, she finished sixth here last year, acquitted uh, herself extremely well, 25th overall. Uh, so uh, we'll find out uh, if... Uh, if we can get confirmation from race command on that and pass that information along uh, when we do have it. Jeff Browning uh, is out to an early lead, obviously a very early lead. I can't stress that enough in the Sedona Canyons 125. Um, but uh, again, as I mentioned, um, yes, it is super, super early, but it's Jeff Browning we're talking about here. So as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, I mentioned during our preview show uh, with Andy Jones Wilkins that uh, Jeff Browning was my favorite to come away with the win at Sedona Canyons. And yeah, we expect to uh, have an opportunity to have him in studio here later this week. Yeah, and we do have a, a drone up in the sky uh, in the um, Clarkdale area who is uh, out uh, on the hunt for for Bronco Billy. But for the time being, we're going to keep it tuned in here to this beautiful shot of Sedona as we look for our next runners to come through. Who do you think the uh, next runners we can expect to come through here are, Chris? At which aid station? Uh, or which this would be um, Midgley Bridge. Oh, so Mike McKnight and Sarah O oh are already through. So the next runner we should see would be crowd favorite Kevin Goldberg. Yeah, he's got a few fans that uh, that are vocal in the chat. Yeah, Kevin Goldberg, you know, has uh, um, has done very well at this race. Last year he finished uh, fifth overall, fourth male right off the podium. And, uh, you know, he's moving very well this year as well. And that's why it's so hard for me to to speak with any certainty when when some people in the, the chat talk about, oh, well, so-and-so is going to make moves. You know, we have great runners in this race, but uh, the people, you have to remember who they're trying to pass here. You know, these are, uh, they're fantastic runners that are all in pursuit, but they're also fantastic runners who are, uh, uh, who are, are trying to f defend those against those pursuits. Yeah, we got some uh, big Gar or uh, <laughs> big Goldberg energy. It works for Jeff Garmeyer as well, who's also a, a chat favorite. But uh, the big Goldberg energy in the chat. Hopefully, we'll be uh, seeing him come through Sedona. He's through the Sedona aid station, obviously. Um, but hopefully, we'll be seeing him on our drone shot here in Sedona uh, in the not too distant future. In one of the like most beautiful things that runners are going to get to experience while well, this probably sounds uh uh insane but as they climb up uh the Kasner Canyon there which is a pretty tough climb they're going to be able to kind of look back on a lot of these um shots that you're seeing here so they get a beautiful view of like that the hangover trail uh area as they climb up Kasner and they just get exposed uh to all these beautiful um, Red Rock formations. And I remember on last year's live stream, Joe McConaughey was coming up the Kasner climb at sunset and he just took a moment, looked back and was just like, wow, look at this. I'm actually impressed because I don't remember thinking that string bean took a moment at all at any point he, during the race. He, he did there. He took a moment, soaked it in. Uh, and, and it was pretty cool to see, you know, even at the pace he was moving, uh, that he was still, you know, there to to kind of absorb everything. Yeah, folks, as we mentioned, um, uh, our most recent uh, uh, cutoff news was that all runners have made it through Fane Ranch at mile 97, 98. 
uh, the next cutoff for them, the next aid station uh, for the mid and back of the Packers would be Mingus Mountain at mile 110. And uh, this is not an easy stretch. Uh, it's a long stretch for, for the runners, uh, over uh, 12 miles from uh, Fane Ranch to Mingus Mountain. And they've got to climb. They've got to climb uh, a couple thousand feet over the course of that. Uh, they have until 1 p.m. to make it up and depart Mingus Mountain Aid. And we do have a, a static cam there, and we'll uh, hopefully be able to bring some shots uh, uh, from that aid station. And it looks like we may have Jeff Browning here coming into uh, into Clarkdale. Were they able to revive the Enzo drone? Is this what? No. Oh, okay. No, the Enzo drone. The Enzo drone has not been revived. Uh, we have. We have a number of drone operators out there as we're trying to cover as much of all these different races, uh, as of right now, two races, uh, that we can. Um, if you're a licensed drone pilot in Arizona and are interested in doing this kind of thing, uh, oh boy, we got to talk. Yeah. Reach out to uh, Jamil via, via Instagram DMs, I think. Um, Bronco Billy out for a casual uh, uh, a stroll here this morning. Of course, uh, we got a little bit uh, behind the curtain when he and Jamil were at the front of uh, the Stone and Canyons 125. Jamil was, of course, filming, but uh, Jeff was telling stories about cattle on the trail. And and uh, actually, not unlike Pete Mortimer, who was uh, giving us stories about uh, Jeff Browning and potentially the reason why he has the nickname Bronco Billy. Yeah. Uh, man, what a... <laughs> What a moment that was getting to uh, see Jamil's reaction to a drone crash. Live, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that one slipped on by the air. sensors. Yes, that one, that one slipped. That one <laughs> slipped by the sensors is right. And again, for anyone just tuning in, we have Jeff Browning, your Sedona Canyons 125 race leader, uh, coming through the town of Clarkdale. I went to uh, Clarkdale last weekend as well. There's a uh, um, there's a fun little uh, uh, tavern there that I stumbled upon. Someone asked, "Is there footage of the drone crash?" Uh, the footage may be on the drone. Um, however, we were not <laughs> we were not live on that shot at the time, and that's uh, it's probably for the best. Last year, we were live. For a drone crash up at uh, Mingus Mountain. Shout out to uh, Troy Wicks. Uh, however, this uh, this year we were not uh, live on the drone shot. We were on Jamil. Got to hear his live reaction. So uh, Jeff Browning is heading through the town of Clarkdale. Uh, Clarkdale notable as there is only one tavern in town. The name of the tavern is the uh, 10 to 12 Lounge. Can you guess what their hours are? 10 to 12. You are correct, sir. Very well done. I uh, had, uh, had a, a drink there. I have a, a Twitter account that I follow that has a list of their favorite uh, dive bars in Arizona. And so when I'm out and about across this beautiful state, uh, taking in the natural beauty and maybe going out for sections and chunks of the Arizona Trail, I also like to uh, recoup my energy and uh, hydration by stopping at a local small establishment. People are asking if we can get a replay of Jamil's reaction. <laughs> no, but you can uh, you can scroll back. Uh, Definitely watch it back to the first. Uh, what was it? Maybe the first ten minutes of uh, the start of the Sedona Canyons uh, one twenty five, which started at seven o'clock. So if you scroll back, probably uh, yeah, it was in the first ten minutes 30, of that race. Thirty to somewhere between thirty and forty minutes ago, uh, y you might be able to. Uh, to to get his reaction but uh aid station fireball in the chat kind of summed it up <laughs> perfectly uh, of the reaction <laughs> we got on air <laughs> <laughs> well and the funny the funnier part is uh jamil i don't think jamil could hear us Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, Why could we hear him? So I don't know if he knew his audio was live, but we could definitely hear him, and it was uh, it was great. <laughs> R.I.P. to that drone, though. Yeah, 
Yeah, this is a uh, an interesting uh an interesting point. Glaze is uh <laughs> Glaze is right in the mix with the 125ers. Imagine those conversations. Someone fr- someone fresh and someone basically hallucinating uh 230 miles into his journey. <laughs> Yeah, I think that those conversations are uh, are gonna be are gonna be pretty sweet. So if you're really really concerned with uh, hearing uh, Jamil's reaction, it was about seven oh three this morning. Was it? Yes, it was right at the start of the Stony Canyons one twenty five because Je- uh, Jeff Browning hadn't even actually made it into town yet. Yep. Because the power lines were actually uh, on his way in. Uh, as you can see, uh, Browning, who we were just talking about right now, the early leader in the Sedona Canyons 125, and I'm going to call my shot right here. I try to usually reserve judgment uh, when covering these races, but uh, he's the early favorite and for a reason because he knows what he's doing better than anybody in the entire sport, not just in this field. Uh, he is a, a maestro of the 100-mile uh, distance and uh, one of the best runners uh, that this sport has to offer has a, has a unique approach, uh, in regards to his, uh, diet and nutrition, uh, a fascinating follow on social media. So, uh, uh, Jeff Browning, uh, out to the early lead. And, and as far as I'm concerned, it's his race. Uh, he's going to decide whether or not he's going to win it today. Because I, I, I would expect that, uh, maybe not today as they started at 7 AM, but, uh, do you think that he can break 24 hours in a 125-mile trail race? I don't know. This is the first year we've done it, so uh, That's good I, think point. We're gonna, I think we're going to set the standard here. Our prognostications year one for Cocodona were way off. Yeah, after the <laughs> inaugural year, I've decided uh, that I'm no longer going to uh, give prognostications on uh, first-year Cocodona races. Okay, I see that uh, th- that uh, the chat is being uh, uh, dominated by Flota Talk, and uh, um, are there people in the chat who are not familiar with uh, the amazingness that is Flota? I'm guessing that there are. Julian is saying no shot for sub-24. I hope that Jeff... Uh, oh, there it is right there, the uh, 10 to 12 saloon in uh, – or t- 10 to 12 lounge in Clarkdale. He, Jeff is literally passing it right now. <laughs> we, I think that feed froze for just a second there. So we're back in Sedona, but we're going to go back to Clarkdale here. And I'm getting word that it looks like Killing has been in uh, the Schnebly Aid Station for a bit. He's getting uh, – prepped and packed up to uh, leave. So we should have eyes on him uh, in the uh, near future. Uh, Jeremy asking if uh, Courtney will come to Cocodona. She's been here. She's been here for Cocodona. She just simply hasn't raced it. Now, will she race it? The word is that uh, she is very fond of the idea of running this race, but uh, her her race calendar is so stacked uh, in most years uh, – uh, that uh, that you just never know. Of course, uh, she's got a, a pretty ambitious summer coming up uh, with Hard Rock. And uh, she'll actually be out here for Havlin 100, if I remember correctly, as well. Julian Galuzzi in the chat. Uh, Julian is one of the aid station cap, Actually, the aid station captain at Mount Eldon. Uh, at the very top of the course uh, for all three distances, uh, letting us know that he's going to have uh, bacon ready for uh, Jeff Browning when he gets to the Eldon Summit. And we are going to send it back to the Schnebly aid station here because we've got Killian Korth, it looks like, about to leave. Do we have a second runner in, or is that just all Killian's? I think that's got to be all Killian's crew. The uh, closest runner to him would be Michael Greer, although Michael Greer was at mile 177, 
uh, 19 minutes ago. I, maybe his crew is there as well. I wouldn't think that he's quite there just yet. Maybe in another five to ten minutes. But uh, yeah. But there definitely is not a large gap at the front anymore. And with the movement that's taken place overnight, uh, it, it really is going to be an interesting day to follow this race. Yeah, I think that Greer's crew may may be there. He's Absolutely. expected there soon, but it uh, looks like Just Killian is in the aid station as of right now. Yeah, that would be my guess that you're right about that, that it is uh, his crew. Because unless he's throwing down seven-minute miles, I don't think that he's there just yet. Yep, both crews are there, just killing in. Got a confirmation from our steady drone pilot, Jason. Shout out to Jason for uh, being out there. Great guy. I met Jason yep. on uh, Saturday. Uh, as he, he helped was... us uh, set up some of the lights for the studio. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he uh, he and I were the only people here in the uh, uh, the Coconona compound, uh, live stream yeah, compound on night one, so. Kelly Greer. Greer's crew is on the right. This is a, a sweet shot here. And again, this setup is quite a bit different than what it was last year. Uh, this aid station was quite a bit more uh, robust last year because it was two aid stations. So because of the course reroute, runners came to this aid station, did an out and back section back to the aid station before heading off to Kelly Canyon. Uh, that was Killian Korth in the red, moving from right to left on your screen as the drone pivots to follow them. He looks like he's hurting. <laughs> I mean, now granted, it's 180 miles into a race, and so there's going to be that kind of pain. But, uh, you know, his gait has noticeably changed. Uh, you know, at this point, it is uh, it is kind of a, you know, a battle to, to keep it moving. Um, well, yeah, I think at this point, all Killian cares about is uh, getting from Munns Park to downtown Flagstaff. I don't think that there's – I don't think he is thinking about anything other than that in terms of, like, who's behind me? Am I going to get past? I think that based on uh, kind of how he's looking right here, he is likely just focused on moving forward. And if that's good enough to, to get it done, then that's good enough. But – it's looking like, um, you know, again, depending on when other people uh, need to sleep, if they need to, that he he is likely um, to be greeted by Mr. Greer uh, in the not-too-distant future. Because, I mean, Michael Greer is not far out from the Schnebly aid station, so it'll kind of depend how long he spins in there, mm -hmm. as well as to what that gap actually, uh, actually looks like. Well, and it's going to be interesting as well because, uh, you know, we don't know what kind of race Josh Perry is running. Uh, we see him, you know, ascending. I mean, know that I know that there's been a lot of talk and a lot of eyes on McKnight, but uh, oh, I apologize. By the way, I was talking about the completely wrong aid station moments ago. This is Schnebly. Okay. And I was referencing the Munns Park aid station. Oh, I thought you were just talking looked. about the fact that he had this area dialed in, and that <laughs> once he hits Munns Park, he's got a different different yeah. plan. Yeah, I assume, uh, you know, that, uh, that Killian Korth is simply working through the kinds of things that you have to deal with when you're running a 250-mile race. There's going to be a lot of pain. There's going to be a lot of uh, uh, things to deal with. Is that John Bowden that is hanging out at Schnebly? Is he our man on the ground? I see him in the chat uh, mentioning, you know, referring to Schnebly as this aid station. Uh, John Bowden, uh, a local runner, a member of the Royal Order of Desert Rats group, the Rotor, as it were. Uh, John Bowden uh, mentioning that Schnebly is, last year was much smaller, no crews were allowed, and no drop bags. So uh, that is one change in the race. Yeah, but did this aid station move? I'm not sure. From hey, last John. Year, I'll need to check because. Sounds like John is, was there uh, both last year and this year. Hey, John, uh, yeah, Chris Warden here, just uh, give us a heads up on. Uh, you know, what has changed uh, beyond the size of the aid station at Schnebly? 
TJ Gardner uh, paused the race, got to drive to daycare. Yeah, somebody we got to they got to drop TJ off at daycare. So. Uh, <laughs> Oh, okay. So John was the Schnebly aid station captain last year. So uh, he uh, that's how he was uh, familiar with that. Yeah, it looks like it was in the the same ish spot. It may have moved slightly. Are we able to flip to the Troy Wicks drone? Possibly. It's a, a beautiful visual here. Um, I wasn't sure if we had any runners on there. Looks like there were signs, but uh, no, he is uh, he is gonna look for uh, Kevin Goldberg, who should be coming by him. Does anybody really want to see Kevin Goldberg, though? Does anybody is anybody really looking for Kevin Goldberg out there in the chat? I don't know. I haven't seen any sort of uh, uh, sort of fan support for Kevin Goldberg in the last thirty to forty five seconds. So. Uh, Yeah, I don't believe it moved either after looking uh, looking at the map. Yeah, of course, I were, as we're talking about uh, the athletes that are currently in this race, uh, Josh Perry uh, currently holding the uh, Arizona Trail self-supported FKT um, and it's amazing to watch the uh, or to look at the list of the uh, the male uh, standard bearers for the Arizona FKT, the Arizona Trail FKT, because uh, the supported. It looks like maybe we have Mike Greer uh, in here. Yeah, it looks like somebody's being tended to down there. It's either Mike Greer came in or one of his uh, crew members is sitting in his chair and needs assistance. <laughs> hey, you know what? Uh, crewing this race and uh, crewing races of this magnitude definitely is an exhausting endeavor, not only for the yeah, runners. It's definitely Greer. <laughs> so Greer, uh, you know, a handful of minutes behind uh, – a race leader, uh, Killian Korth, right now. <laughs> John Bowden sharing his knowledge. Thanks, John. Uh, great guy. Uh, he's getting ready to pace Aaron Barber. Shout outs to Aaron. Uh, and we're glad to be here, John. Always a uh, a great time. Uh, I've hung out with John uh, many times at uh, uh, both Aravipa events and uh, events for the Royal Order of Desert Rats, a local running club uh, here in Arizona. And uh, Aaron Barber, uh, coached by last night's Aravipa After Dark co-host Pete Mortimer. Take a quick uh, run down the leaderboard uh, for the men and women. Uh, Killian Korth is still number one, but uh, depending on when uh, Michael Greer uh, opts to leave uh, Schnebly Aid, uh, that lead could be down to a mile or less. Uh, we'll uh, definitely keep close tabs on that. Josh Perry uh, moved into third place overall and third place on the men's side. Uh, currently about two and a half to three miles back of Michael Greer. Uh, Eliza LaPierre leading the women's race, uh, currently in fourth place overall. Uh, Mika Thews in fifth place overall, second place female. Sarah Ostaszewski, the third female, and currently seventh overall. So three of the top seven overall in this race are uh, female runners. And yeah, the the gap between third and fourth is uh, pretty significant at this point. As uh, Sarah Ostazuski at mile 171, and fourth on the women's side is uh, Sally McRae, and Sally McRae is at mile 154. So there's about a 
a 17-mile gap between third and fourth on the women's side. On the men's side, not so much. Uh, the top five, uh, as I mentioned, the top three were Killian Korth, Michael Greer, and Josh Perry. Uh, fourth place on the men's side, Mike Gronwagen, who's been running third and fourth pretty much since the midway point of day one. Uh, and uh, in... We've and, got and the so people's champ on the uh, camera here. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt, Chris. No problem. That's... Oh, it's as if he knows there's a drone there. <laughs> <laughs> that is Kevin Goldberg. Uh, Kevin Goldberg currently in sixth place on the men's side. Um, yeah, Mike Gronwagen, Michael McKnight, and Kevin Goldberg are your four, five, six on that side. And Jeff Garmeyer in seventh. And uh, you can see uh, Kevin Goldberg is heading under the midley or Midgley Bridge, uh, just north of Sedona. Very stunning uh, piece of physical geography right there. Uh, aid Station Fireball, Liam in the chat, calling his shot. Uh, saying that it uh, looks like he believes that uh, Greer will probably pass Killian Korth in the next couple minutes. It'll be interesting. We'll see. We'll have to keep eyes on um, on that situation as it develops. Look at Kevin Goldberg picking up a run. Uh, he sees that drone. He knows that yeah, that camera's that's on the him. Drone run. I do have to say, I love that. Uh, it's no different than you know, like when I'm at a race and I see the camera, like typically you know Jubilee or Enzo. Uh, out here at the Aravipa events with a camera uh, taking photos. Once I see them, I kind of put my shoulders upright. I suck in my stomach a little bit. And if I'm hiking, I pick up a jog. It's the same way with the elites, too. They know when the camera's on. One of the fun things about last year's race was that every time we uh, would pivot to string bean coverage, he knew exactly where the camera was. And uh, if we were on, if we suddenly jumped, onto him if he was walking which was or hiking which was you know not the majority of the time then he would pick up running and uh and he would uh make it a a high effort day for what wise from his pacer <laughs> what mile is killian at he just left the uh schnebly aid station i don't know if his tracker is updated yet but this was Killian's three around or four minutes ago. mile 179 or so. Uh, if you are interested in following the runner tracker, you have the access to the same information we do uh, for the most part. Uh, the runner tracker is actually at the link right below the screen on uh, uh, on the YouTube. Uh, <laughs> Goldberg, window. literally, we can see him on the drone. We, we literally just saw him on the drone on his phone. Uh, pulling and he's in the chat. Just a comment in the chat, and then he puts it away, and uh, and he's, and he's back still running. in the top six. You know, it'd be more impressive if he were uh, in the chat, like messaging while running. <laughs> Use voice to text. Come on, we have the technology. Do an AMA while he's running the race. <laughs> Uh, shout out to Allison <laughs> in the chat. String, <laughs> String Bean was busy dropping wit. Thank goodness for Jamil to pick Wit up. Oh, uh, Wit wise, uh, poor, wi poor Wit. When Jamil saw him, he looked so <laughs> upset. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Wit. Uh, he we came love back, Wit. He came back and uh, you know, paced uh, paced Joe through, you know, a really a really beautiful section yeah. up in Flagstaff, but also a section that uh, even for the most elite runners can be <laughs> that climb up Eldon doesn't isn't <laughs> easy regardless of. Uh, how fit you are, and uh, especially 240 miles or so in. I did it two miles either. into my run on Sunday, and it was brutal. <laughs> Coach Kendall, it's too bad. <laughs> it's too bad that he's not having fun out there. Oh. Yeah, Goldberg. Goldberg certainly doesn't have uh, doesn't have much fun while he's while he's out there. At Matthew the Myers, two fifty. Matthew Myers with the hard hitting questions. Hey, Kevin Goldberg, what headphones are you use, so, using to listen to this? Uh, because we saw him, I think it was in Jerome yesterday. He wears some of the uh, he aftershocks. said aftershocks. He yeah. literally replied. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I uh, 
we saw him. He's got the aftershock, so he's staying he's staying safe on the trails, still going to be able to hear his surroundings. Uh, shout that out to bone, aftershocks. That bone, bone conduction, conduction technology. technology. You know? <laughs> Oh, JJ in the chat. I got one of Goldberg's training plans on Training Peaks recently. Just just connected the dots. I'm rooting for him now. Looks like we have a, a pack of runners <laughs> on the Q drone, possibly. If we we can do. We're going to switch back to the um, Sedona Canyons shot here real quick. I believe that Troy was uh, – heading out of range, and Troy is going to come back, and I believe he's going to pack up from that station and head out to uh, Munns Park uh, to catch our runners there. That looks like a shot from Clarkdale. Yep, uh, Hugh is based in Clarkdale, so you're going to have – this is mostly going to be a lot of uh, 125 runners when you see people in packs like this just because they're you know only a few miles uh, into, uh, into the race. But um, you will also see uh, some 250 runners coming through here. Although th at this point in the race, I'm guessing that they will be moving uh, a little bit slower through this area if they're in the. That's usually what we've seen so far this morning. Is that uh, whenever the uh, uh, the two the 125 and 250 runners uh, cross paths, it's usually the 125 runners that are moving pretty fast, whereas the uh, uh, 250 runners are looking a little bit more, uh, how shall we say, deliberate. Yeah, and uh, Stephen Crawford, Dr. Stephen Crawford in the chat, Kevin Goldberg said that he had listened to the new Taylor Swift album four times before Crown King. Sounds like he's been hanging with... Uh, with uh, Brett. With Brett Hornig, <laughs> uh, our afternoon uh, co-host here uh, on the Cocodona 250 live stream. Got Dave McKinney in the chat. Shout out to Dave, one of my uh, teammates, college teammates at EIU. Uh, huge shout out to him. Fellow uh, Pokemon fan. So <laughs> always, uh, always love seeing Dave in the, uh, in the chat here. Yeah, one of the things that's been cool about uh, this live streaming experience, not just today, but in, in events past, is that you get to know a lot more about the, the people that are following these races. Uh, of course, uh, our... Uh, I guess one of our sheriffs in the room um, uh, slash statisticians, uh, aid station fireball, Liam Tryon, uh, when, uh, uh, when we were talking earlier this year when he came to town for a visit, did you know he's a huge pro wrestling fan? No. Yeah. We're going to have to, Liam, we're going to have to start up a group chat or something <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah, Liam and I, uh, uh, he, uh, I guess, uh, had gone to uh, a couple of shows uh, that were in town uh, where he's based uh, up north. And, yeah, we started talking. We realized that we were, you know, both uh, lifelong pro wrestling junkies. Uh, Ian Hurley in the chat asking what we mean by 125 and 250 runners. Uh, we have two races going on. We have the Cocodona 250. Uh, those runners are blue bibbed, and the Sedona Canyons 125. Those runners, as you can see, two of them right now in your view. That was uh, are in James red. Willett. James Willett. Willett and uh, David Frederick, uh, bibs 445 and 449, I believe. James Willett is a uh, local leader here in the community, actually, is. Uh, one of the running leaders for our Monday night runs uh, down at South Mountain a lot of the time. Leads the Monday night and the Wednesday night group runs here in, uh, in Arizona for Aravipa. Uh, James uh, leads the what we like to call the super fun group because as far as we're concerned, there's no such thing as a slow group. Now, I'm not entirely sure if this is the same, uh, the same drone as before, but I do have... Uh I do have Enzo, uh, Enzo drone pulled back up, and it looks like we've got Jamil on um, Jeff uh, Jeff Browning there. That's uh, currently at picture in picture. I'm going to see if I can make that um, full screen here. There we go. 
That is Bronco Billy right there. Uh, still setting the pace in the Sedona Canyons 125. Yeah, folks, uh, for those just tuning in, we are monitoring and following two races at one time uh, because uh, it wasn't uh, a complicated enough. It wasn't enough, enough to, uh, to broadcast one, right, Chris? Yeah, and so uh, we're following two races here. The Sedona Canyon started this morning. Those runners have 75 hours, a pretty generous time limit to cover 125 miles. Uh, you know, so that's the kind of time uh, time limit that's I think should be a draw for the Sedona Canyons because most of your hundred mile races are going to have a thirty to thirty six hour cutoff, with the exception of the really tough ones like Hard Rock and Cruel Jewel, where they're going to be you know forty plus hours. Uh, the Sedona Canyons is obviously longer than one hundred miles, being at one twenty five. But you have 75 hours to complete it. So as long as you keep moving forward, you can get it done. Yeah, uh, Dr. Stephen Crawford in the chat uh, mentioning that, yeah, we're going to have three races uh, uh, come Friday. And uh, we have three runners there. I can tell because he loves to wear red that that is Andre Lee on the right, the well, final he finisher. Always has, uh, he, he always has like a Goldberg-esque big smile. Uh, this know. is true. And uh, and Andre, as we, uh, we were talking at Packet Pickup this week, uh, always wearing red whenever possible. Yep. Uh, that is his color. Uh, he makes the color pop, not the other way around. Oh, and we can uh, – we should be able to get some audio. I have Bryce muted on our end. That's my bad. Yeah. Yes, we should have audio there as well. What's up, Matt? Hey, Bryce. Hey, how are you doing? I'm oh, doing real good. Who is sharing the streets of Clarksville with uh, Andre right now? Who are the two uh, on the left? What are you guys' names? Uh, Derek. Derek. John. Derek and John. Andre. And Andre. Andre. Andre needs no introduction. <laughs> uh, Derek. What are your guys' bid numbers? Uh, 407. Yeah, that's Derek Flodman. 433. And 431. Said 431. And John. John Roig. Roig, yeah. Yeah, John's a local runner. I recognize uh, the name. Uh, Thank you for uh, saving from me from that pronunciation, Chris. I don't know how I would have yeah. pronounced it. From Scottsdale, I know that uh, he is a uh, part of the uh, Aravipa community down in Phoenix. We have a lot of runners in Arizona. I mean, a lot of runners. And uh, I have to admit, I don't know everybody, but uh, I'm pretty good at remembering names when I hear them. I'm just not good at matching the names with the faces. But, yeah, our regular group runs uh, down uh, in the Phoenix Valley. Uh, we've got it tonight. If you're in the Valley and are so inclined, you can uh, join the Aravipa Group Trail Run uh, at 630 at the uh, Tempe Town Lake Marina, and we're going to run through Papago Park. I won't be there, but uh, leader of uh, the community, Gary Foreman, will be in charge tonight. We'll have uh, a social afterwards at Rift in Scottsdale along with uh, – our monthly group raffle where they'll be giving away some race entries for uh, events coming up in June, uh, as well as some Arabipa swag. So, yeah, if you're interested, you can find out more information at Arabipa Group Trail Run on Facebook. And, of course, these runners are uh, part of the race that just started this morning, the Sedona Canyons 125. Uh, there are about 70, 75 runners for Sedona Canyons 125. Uh, the most notable name in terms of uh, um, talent in that race, uh, I believe, is Jeff Browning. And uh, it's bearing out fairly early as Jeff Browning is already out to like a one-mile lead. Um, we got you know, Kyle seven miles Carter in. Uh, that we just saw on screen there, bib 458. Kyle Carter, another Arizona native uh, from uh, Prescott Valley. So uh, he didn't have to go too far to get ready for this race in the morning. Just up the road from Jerome. It sounds like Greer is uh, getting prepped to leave out at the Schnebly aid station. So we will uh, we'll send it back out there in just a moment here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like, you know, it looks like Greer is taking his time, which is, I think, a good state, a good thing at this stage in the race. Uh, you know, there's no sense in 
rushing simply to grab the lead for the sake of grabbing the lead at this point. I mean, you know, they've got about uh, 70 miles to go, so a one-mile lead or so at this point, which is what it looks like Killian will have, is uh, fairly inconsequential. We are going to, right now, we're going to send it back out to our... Uh, to check in on our 250, 250 mile race, the Coconona 250 is our second place runner. Michael Greer is getting ready to depart the Schnebly Hill aid station. Here you can see on the screen getting maybe a little last minute. Uh, you can see the drone shadow in the lower left hand corner. I kind of like that. I I imagine that uh, it's got to feel pretty nice to to be up in the pines now of uh, the greater Flagstaff area here. You're, you know, done with the Kasner climb. You've only got one big climb left. Um, and so I think that, you know, this next stretch, the, the last climb isn't for, you know, another 40 miles or so. And this next stretch is all mostly runnable. You've got some climbs, especially in the Walnut Canyon area, but um, it's got to feel nice knowing, like, okay, I'm up on the Coconino Plateau now. Well, and Schnebly is, you know, in a straight line only about – four or five miles away from Munns Park. And Munns Park's current temperature is 55 degrees. Uh, light winds uh, uh, and a humidity of 41%. Uh, it's it's going to be one of the cooler points of the course outside of the, you know, the, the top of Mount Eldon. So, uh, yeah, this is definitely a comfortable day. And we can see now uh, Michael Greer, uh, current uh, second place overall, uh, heading out from the aid station. And let's be honest, um, He's looking far more composed than Killian Korth was. Uh, as uh, Killian looked like he was working through some uh, physical uh, discomfort, uh, Michael Greer looks genuinely fantastic. Yep, and we've got a picture in picture there of uh, Jeff Browning, leader of the Sedona Canyons 125 mile race uh, on the right. So we'll make sure that, yeah, our drone pilot, Jason, keeps us framed with our runners on kind of the left half or left two-thirds uh, there. I am going to call my shot with Browning. I already said he's going to win this race, but I think he's going to win it by by multiple hours. I think that Jeff Browning is going to win the Sedona Canyons, I would say, by at least three hours. I think that uh, he's that uh, above and beyond uh, a talent in, you know, in comparison to this field. So, yeah, Jeff Browning uh, being followed. Is is this still a jam cam? Uh, it is. And he, Jamil probably cut in and out of uh, in and out of service here. So we may lose that picture in picture from time to time or it may get um, slow, a little bit slow and grainy. But, um, yeah, we do have uh, some eyes on Jeff. Uh, Matthew Myers, at what mile can the runners see Eldon? Uh, that's a good question. I don't, I mean, they could probably see it from before the, they hit Walnut Canyon. I think I mean, that's a good question for more of the the Flagstaff locals and myself. Is there a point when you leave uh, uh, Fort Tuttle? I would believe so. Basically, you cross a, a meadow area when you leave Fort Tuttle and head towards Walnut Canyon that uh, you've got a lot of site to the north and i know you can see the two highest peaks of the san francisco's uh behind the city of flagstaff you can see humphreys peak the highest point in arizona and agassi's the second highest uh as they're basically side by side and they're both snow covered still at the top uh eldon is a few miles to the east i would assume you can probably see eldon from uh, about 30 miles away but that's before you actually enter walnut canyon Again, and Jeff, uh, Jamil's feed with Jeff <laughs> is going to come in and out here, but I am trying to... Uh... Wait, what's going on with Bryce's uh, video? I'm trying to... Uh, that's what I'm trying to do Okay. Right <laughs> okay, I was a little bit confused there for a second. <laughs> um, yes, Allison, you are correct. Uh, Jeff Browning will set the course record if he wins this race, uh, the Sedona Canyons 125, as it is the inaugural running. Of course, we say the inaugural, not the first annual. That is correct. Uh, 
uh, if you're looking for information on specific runners, uh, the runner tracking is available just below the the video screen on YouTube at the uh, link kokodana.com slash live. Uh, also links to the website so you can see the runner guide and other information. And you can see uh, the Kokodona 250 merch available uh, on the website. Uh, right now we're uh, on our split screen. We've got Michael Greer on the left-hand side. And uh, our picture-in-picture picture is currently Sedona Canyon's leader. So we've got both leaders on screen right now. Or at least yep. we did. Yep, and I'm going to – that froze up, so I'm going to send it. We've actually got some of our um, other Sedona Canyons runners here on the oh, yeah. uh, Bryce cam with a picture-in-picture. Picture, so. Dude, that's awesome. I want to come down here just to hang out sometime. I'm only here doing Coca Donut. Yeah. yeah, this runner, I, I didn't catch the bib number, but was running backwards for a few moments there, um, and I was thoroughly confused. I believe that was bib 407 still. That's right. Um, Derek Flodman. Yeah. Just out for a nice leisurely stroll. I think Jason is, looks like he's coming back to the, uh, the aid station there. So what we will do is we will uh, take it. Let's see if I can hop up a little bit, man. Good run yeah. with you. What's your name again? Bryce. Bryce, nice to meet you, man. Yeah, right back at you. Yeah, thanks for Oh, for sure. I'll see you around. Yeah, I'll see you around. Uh, somebody so in the chat. There and just go straight on to the Bryce cam. Uh, JJ in the chat was asking how to find out information about the Aravipa Group Trail Run. Uh, there is a Facebook page uh, under the name Aravipa Group Trail Run. Uh, even if you don't have Facebook, you should be able to access it. And on there, there is a schedule that shows where we meet on a weekly basis, as well as our social destinations after the run. Uh, tonight's run is at 6.30 at Papago Park. We actually meet at the uh, Tempe Town Lake Marina on the north side of Tempe Town Lake. Uh, and then we do, uh, we have typically two or three groups. Our uh, fastest group will go about five and a half miles in uh, just under an hour. Our uh, medium group will go about four to four and a half miles in that same time frame, And then our fun group will go anywhere from a 5K to three and a half miles uh, in uh, just under an hour as well. So uh, if you're in the Valley, you're more than welcome to join us. I won't be there, but uh, we will have plenty of people. Uh, Gary Foreman will be hosting that run. And uh, I believe Lisa Pozzoni will be helping out as well from the running university. So again, it looks like we have eyes on uh, Jeff Browning, Sedona Canyons 125 leader. This feed is going to continue to be a bit choppy for some time. So we will uh, see if we can get that cleaned up here. We do have audio uh, coming in there as well, so we'll be able to listen. And I think that um, as runners kind of close in on, uh, I believe he should be coming closing in on Dead Horse Ranch Yeah. Um, in the not-too-distant future, um, that service will get a little bit better. I know we had a, quite a few questions up here about what happened to Versteeg. Uh, Michael Versteeg in between Dead Horse Ranch and Deer Pass yesterday afternoon uh, decided to uh, to pull out of the race. So Yeah, and, and I know that there's been some, uh, some I guess, handicapping yeah. in the chat with regards to what it was. I've heard all sorts of... You know, different ailments, concerns, issues. Uh, I, I'm going to reserve because I haven't heard anything official from anybody that I know as a uh, verifiable secondhand source. So I honestly don't know. Uh, and I don't know if Matt does, but uh, all we know is that Mike Versteeg, uh, uh, probably about 8, 9 p.m. last night, uh, went off course, but uh, with intent, went off course to actually 
uh, meet his crew uh, off the trail at, at Highway 89A and uh, decided to catch a ride to the next aid station where he uh, turned in his tracking. And here we've got, looks like bib 419, uh, Levi Button, and I'm not sure, oh, and, and Joel Button, bib 455. So Levi and Joel what Button coincidence. there. They're, uh, they have the same last name and they're running together. Yeah. That's bib number 426. That is uh, Michael Cars, California native. Dan Pena calling his shot. Uh, Spider Pena, of course, uh, who uh, helped bring in the uh, race leaders last night, uh, saying that uh, he thinks that uh, Phoenix local Matthew Kahn is going to podium in the 125. I wouldn't be surprised to see that. Uh, Matt Kahn is an excellent runner. Uh, don't think he's got the juice to run down uh, Jeff Browning, but uh, Matt Kahn, a strong runner in his own right, wouldn't be surprised in the least. And it looks like Jeff Browning is at the Dead Horse Ranch aid station. That feed is currently frozen, so again, we'll, we'll uh, continue to uh, see if we can get that freshened up. And then it looks like we've got Mike McKnight uh, popping back in, so we'll see if uh, maybe we can take a look in here. Looks like Mike's getting some uh, some water here, so this is the um, water station at the top of the Kasner Canyon climb. Basically an unmanned station. Yep, yep. So um, it's going to be water only, uh, four-wheel drive, I believe high clearance access only. Yeah. Um, and you, ha I believe you access it from Sedona. Oh, wow. Up Schnebly Hill Road, so up the... Um, up that Jeep road. Uh, a question in the chat from Air Viper Racing Team member Corinne Shalvoy asking uh, if there were any time predictions on the winning male-female for the 125. Uh, so between the two of us, uh, <laughs> so Matt has uh, decided he's going to refrain from making any time predictions. And uh, as soon as I shot my mouth off and said that I thought that Browning might have a chance to break 24 hours, uh, local to Flagstaff, Julian Galuzzi, who knows far more about this trail system than even I do, uh, said that there's no chance that Jeff Browning breaks 24 in the Sedona Canyons. I think that uh, Julian just uh, put up a little challenge for Jeff, hey? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, a guy like Jeff loves a challenge. I mean, you've got to think, though, like you're talking 24 hours, not for 100 miles, for 124 miles, or 125 miles, rather. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, Jeff has, uh, I mean, he set the course record at Mogollon Monster, which is an extremely rugged course. I believe that uh, he broke 22 hours there, and that's closer to 100, 405 miles, uh, I believe. I mean, you know, Jeff, uh, you know, we're picking nits at this point. I mean, yeah, Jeff Browning uh, has the course record at, uh, um, at Mogollon Monster, and his time there was 20 hours, 52 minutes um, on uh, some fairly similar trail systems. And, and I think that there's actually more flat here uh, in the Sedona Canyons 125. Um, his, uh, his winning time at Hard Rock a few years ago was uh, 26 20. So, uh, you know, I mean, you know, he's no stranger to uh, either these trails or rough trails. So we'll see. We'll see whether or not Jeff breaks 24. See, now Julian's trying to play it nice. I mean, I want him to. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's all good, Julian. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, the, you, these are much more familiar to you than I. So, you know, I definitely would defer to your expertise in that regard. Yeah, Christy in the chat yeah this is the first year for the sedona canyons 125 race um which is uh what we're currently tuned into here uh on the live stream um there is also a eldon crest 36 so the 36 mile option as we're tuned back into the uh to the uh bryce cam uh, as 
runners are coming through. Clarkdale moving really strong in the Sedona Canyons 125. The Eldon Crest 36 starts on uh, Friday at Fort Tuthill and finishes uh, in downtown Flagstaff following the Cocodona course. I think that race is going to go fast. I mean, the first, uh, I mean, first, what, 30 miles of that race are unbelievably fast. I mean, it's flat. It's fairly flat through Walnut Canyon from Fort Tuttle to the base of Eldon. Now, Eldon is going to be an absolute beast of a climb for these runners, and they will be. Uh, and we've got a. We got a horse passing here for the for the old Bronco Billy. Anybody w knows his way around cattle? It's Bronco Billy. Yep. Did you see how graceful he was uh, with the pass? Stepped to the side, took his time going around. We'll see if we can listen in here. Yeah, it sounds like we've got audio there now. <coughs> I'm not sure if uh, Jamil can hear us yet or not. Yeah, Jamil, how uh, how graceful was Jeff with the uh, horse pass there? Oh, it was it was. Looks like we're hitting a dead spot on, on the coverage there. Yeah, it looks like our feed is dropping yeah, out. Here, yeah, like so. you hear weird noises. All right, <laughs> all right, this is too hard. <laughs> yeah, Jamil has just passed Jeff Browning, but on, now uh, Jeff has taken it back. And uh, yeah, Jamil is not running the Sedona Canyons 125, he is simply uh, follow filming uh, the race leader in that case, Jeff Browning. Who has the right of way, horses or Broncos? I'm <laughs> not quite sure about that one, Julian. Like just looking at the tracker for the Cocodona 250, we should expect our third place runner, Josh Perry, to be coming in uh, to the Schnebly Aid Station. It looks like he's probably about two and a half ish miles uh, away from that aid station, so we should see him uh, in the not so distant uh, future. Now that he's up and over that uh, Kasner Canyon climb. But right now we are tuned in to our Sedona Canyons 125 race leader, Mr. Jeff Browning. As he is uh, 95 minutes into, into his race here. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, there was a question in the chat um, uh, from uh, Ben Cook asking if uh, you can have a pacer for the 125. The answer is yes. You can't pick them up just yet, though. Uh, you can pick them up uh, for the Sedona Canyons 125 at Munns Park, which is about 66, 67 miles into that race. And as we mentioned in the Sedona Canyons, uh, the racers have uh, a, a pretty generous cutoff to complete this race, uh, 75 hours to do 125 miles. Uh, that doesn't mean it's an easy endeavor, but it means that they've got a lot of time to work with there. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but I believe that the uh, the cutoff times basically tie into the Cocodona 250 cutoff times. Yep, so, correct. so the cutoff times for uh, the shorter distances uh, that. Uh, uh, including Sedona Canyons and uh, Eldon Crest uh, are going to 
mirror those of Cocodona. And the next cutoff for runners at this point is Mingus Mountain, uh, mile 110 for uh, uh, the uh, Cocodona runners. And uh, for the Sedona Canyon runners, that is actually not uh, on their course. Uh, so uh, it's going to be a while before we have a cutoff uh, for the 125-mile runners. But, uh, yeah, uh, Mingus Mountain, mile 110 in the Cocodona 250. Uh, the cutoff is 1 p.m. Uh, Jerome, uh, when we're here for Aravipe After Dark, will be the cutoff uh, that the runners are chasing, uh, and they have to be there by 8 p.m. tonight. Um, and then uh, probably after we sign off, Dead Horse Ranch will be the next cutoff at uh, mile 149, and that'll be uh, at 12.30 a.m. We don't expect to be on the air for that, though. Uh, as you can see, it looks like that's a shot of Clarkdale, Arizona, a nice, uh, a quiet little uh, town, um, roughly about 90 minutes outside of Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, again, home to the uh, 10 to 12 lounge, uh, very friendly uh, bartenders and, uh, and guests at the 10 to 12 lounge in Clarkdale, Arizona. that we have here for helping make this coverage uh, happen there. You can see... Rocking their vest. The what pack vest. are you wearing, Jeff? <laughs> the Bronco 580, baby. Oh, my minimal one. Because you don't have to carry a lot of layers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the Ultra Spire Bronco race vest is uh, available on the Ultra Spire website. Uh, a little burrito drive I don't have one myself, but I might have to pick one up. I'm feeling inspired. <laughs> you know what? It's one of those things where sometimes the person who wins the, the NCAA bracket at uh, work is the person who... Picks based on like their favorite town or favorite. You're running these yeah, towns. exactly. <laughs> you know the people who spend hours and have their own like algorithms, you know, worked out, uh, ends up uh, completely misfiring. But uh, I, I would not be shocked whatsoever to see KP's guess was closer than mine. Cool. Wait a minute, John Marushek is in the chat. And he is joking about a 75-hour cutoff for a 125-mile run. Uh, wasn't he supposed to start this morning? Where are you at, John? Are you are you do are you pulling a Goldberg here? Yeah. No, my guess is. I mean, you won't really have too much until like Ridgeline and Sedona or Shurman Mountain. I don't blame him. So it, did, did we confirm whether that that was the uh, Bronco Lightweight or the Big Bronco? Uh, on, it's the five, uh, liter. Yeah. five liter. Five liter. Okay, so that is the uh, Bronco Lightweight uh, running vest that he's currently wearing. Five liter Bronco race vest. Especial. Proof that Bronco Billy sometimes has to hide. But even even uh, his hike is so deliberate, and uh, you can see he's you know he gets his mechanics really in sync for those uh, short instances where he does have to stop and hike. Uh, you know he he wasn't obviously he's not using poles right now, but uh, uh, definitely you know dials it in different. You know even his hiking pace up a hill like that is going to be super fast. Yeah, I mean, I completely yeah. And, and I just, I just realized, Chris, my mic has been off. 
So everyone was uh, hearing my audio through your mic. I saw uh, the need for a mic check in the... Uh, yeah, I see people calling me out. Ruth Stewart. <laughs> yeah, well, there were multiple. Yeah, mic check. Yep, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for uh, keeping me on my oh, P's yeah. and Q's. You didn't need to hear my voice. Anyway, Greg in the chat, this is the one with the all caps telling me to turn my mic on. Dude, thank you, Greg. That was the one I saw that uh, helped us get this show back on the road. Tom Abbott at 51, I'll probably only be able to do that pace to get to your Deliveroo delivery. Yeah, Jeff Running is uh, you know, rocking it at 51 out there. Still a dominant athlete in the sport. And while we wait for this feed to clean up a little bit, we're going to send it back to Clarkdale area as we've got uh, 125 mile runners. Um, see, now I got Bryce Brooks letting me know my mic is quiet. Yeah, I had myself uh, muted, guys. <laughs> you know, sometimes you uh, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and uh, that was a big L for me. So I appreciate you all for uh, for getting me back on uh, back on track here. Yeah, uh, Campbell, uh, all three races are going to be covered here on the same live stream, uh, as they're all going to be on the same course. So uh, you know, we will be covering. Uh, we've been covering the Cocodona 250 for the past uh, two days, uh, starting at 7 a.m. this morning. We picked up coverage of the Sedona Canyons 125, and starting on Friday morning, we'll be adding uh, some uh, uh, some chaos to the uh, equation as we start to cover the Elden Crest 36 as well. That's going to be a, a very tricky thing because, like I said, that runner that race first of all is going to run very fast. Second of all. Our coverage in Walnut Canyon is going to be really difficult to pick up. It is a dead zone in terms of cell phone service, so I don't know what kind of visuals or uh, whether it be drone or on the ground we're going to get from uh, Walnut Canyon itself. Even the aid station there is is kind of a quiet area. I was out there roughly 10 days ago out on uh, uh, a run with uh, Pete Mortimer, and he was he was assigned to do recon. I was just doing a, a little bit of fun stuff, but uh, uh, but yeah, it's a very hard place to get a, a good signal. So uh, we'll do what we can to bring you know some dynamic coverage to that. But my guess is that come Friday for Eldon Crest 36, once that joins the program, we're probably going to be uh, focusing on the area between. Uh, Route 66 uh, up to the top of the Eldon Summit, back down through Buffalo Park and into Flagstaff. I think that that's going to end up being our focus. We might have uh, some 250 and 125 runners that will be hitting Fort Tuttle. We'll catch them at there. But, again, there's going to be a, a, a good 15-plus mile section where we might not be able to do anything other than kind of play uh, relay in terms of what is going on on the runner tracker. Yeah, and it looks like uh, Jeff Greer only about a mile behind Killian Korth. Uh, the next time we will get eyes on our runners will be at the Munns Park Aid Station, uh, which is going to be a, at a, around 190 miles into the race. I think that the the course distance says 190.3. It's labeled 192-ish, so uh, we will see them... Um, around there and as of six minutes ago Killian Korth was still 8.7 miles away so we will not see them for a little bit um, but in terms of who we'll see next for the 250 mile race it looks like we are going to be seeing uh, Josh Perry and Eliza LaPierre uh, both coming to Schnebly in the not too distant future as they are about to cross or maybe have just crossed the uh i seventeen corridor there uh John asking uh how I slept with all that monkey shoulder uh referring to uh, uh the bottle that Pete and I were sharing last night online I didn't drink very much of it. I had maybe uh maybe one uh drink's worth maybe a shot's worth i am I, not a whiskey person normally um it's the kind of thing where if I was going to uh, a place and I just wanted to have a drink to carry all night, then I would order an old-fashioned or a whiskey neat, maybe around the rocks even. 
So, yeah, I did not uh, um, drink a whole lot last night as uh, I was sharing uh, stories and coverage with uh, Pete Mortimer. Is that is that Cottonwood right there? That our camera is on? Yeah. Um, I believe he's flying out of Cottonwood to that's, Clarkdale. That's Main Street Cottonwood right yeah. there. Um, because uh, I know that that's a winery in the lower left. Again, that <laughs> crossing is where they start to get on the trail that ultimately takes them across the uh, across the Verde River and uh, over to Dead Horse Ranch uh, State Park, I believe. Is that correct, Chris? Yeah, yeah. The Dead Horse Ranch just being right outside of town. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, Cottonwood uh, has a, a couple of uh, interesting establishments as well. Um, kind of. Uh, showing you around the uh, uh, the state in a, a completely different fashion. Cactus Kate's is in Cottonwood, uh, right there on Main Street, about two blocks down from where Enzo was. Um, and uh, there's another place uh, in town uh, further up the street called the Chaparral. Uh, several years ago, Chaparral is notable for uh, a situation where a rabid bobcat walked into the uh, into the establishment and started attacking patrons. And uh, notably, they did not close. And uh, whether you might wonder, they, uh, w if you wondered whether or not they might lean into that history, they absolutely do because they have shirts with bobcats okay, and stuff all over like them. Looks like we've got Bryce following some more runners here as well. If we can get a bib, that would be great. So it looks like this is an out and back section potentially. We just saw a runner come. Yeah. Okay, yep. so that's an aid station checkpoint yep. right there. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. why when somebody was asking what those tents were, that's a sleep station right there. And that's I'm the curious. sleep station at Dead Horse Ranch. Yeah, I was going to say, I was curious. This must be Dead Horse Ranch. That is bib 441. Yeah, prior to today, I had never seen Dead Horse during the daytime. I mean, oh, had... that's uh, that's the the video hero Matt Shapiro. <laughs> yeah, I had not seen Dead Horse Ranch during the daytime. I believe um, in years past, uh, we've had a, a, a static cam at Dead Horse Ranch, but it's usually been pretty low lit and uh, at night. But uh, this year, uh, with the Stone Canyons One Twenty Five, we're seeing uh, Dead Horse Ranch uh, State Park in all its, all its glory during the daytime. Troy with another place, uh, Bocce Pizza in Cottonwood, another excellent place there in town. I, I love these the towns along this course. It, what's cool to me about the Cocodona 250 and the Sedona Canyons 125 is that these are places I've been hanging out for years. I, I've, I love, uh, you know, coming up to Flagstaff, and as I've mentioned several times, my favorite place to hang out in Arizona is Pine and on the Highline Trail. But uh, you talk about places like Cottonwood, Jerome, Clarkdale. These are charming towns that are along the Cocodona 250 course uh, that are great for a day trip uh, or for an overnighter. Uh, you know, and if I'm wanting to get out of the heat and want to head up and uh, maybe, you know, hit a local winery, a couple of uh, neat, small uh, uh, family-owned restaurants, those are the places you can do it. Uh, Cottonwood, Clarkdale, Jerome are three of those places. Prescott as well, Whiskey Row downtown. I don't go there as much because uh, it does get a little bit wild on the weekends on Whiskey Row, but uh, still a beautiful place with a lot of history. So uh, it's one of the great things about the state of Arizona. I mean, I love being in the Valley. I love living in the Phoenix area. I'm in Chandler down by South Mountain. We've got great trails and, and everything down there, but uh, – but in Arizona, you can really ex – there's so much to explore. I've, I've got places that I've been wanting to see for years that I haven't even had the chance to get to yet. So, uh, you know, this race really brings a lot of that together here in the Cocodona 250. <laughs> TJ Gardner uh, in the chat, who else would buy the Chris Warden Runner's Guide to Arizona Trails and Drinking Establishments? Have you seen my Twitter feed? <laughs> That's basically all it is. It's uh, me uh, going on runs and uh, having a, a beverage at a local establishment. And following baseball games. <laughs> Big baseball fan. That sounds about right. I like watching baseballs get hit really hard. We 
don't have audio here. Well, Matt, I think uh, at this point uh, I have to uh, uh, give up the headset and uh, uh, I guess, what's it, what do they call that? Um, work? <sighs> yeah, that's what you keep calling it. Anyway. And I'm going to sequester myself from uh, the Cocodona 250 and not pay any attention to anything that's going on in the chat or in the rest of the house. I am going to uh, put my head down, work on my TPS reports, and, uh, and I'm going to need those TPS reports ASAP. And focus on uh, on that aspect of my life, uh, my, uh, quote, nine-to-five job. Um, I do have a, a couple of meetings today that I'll be uh, uh, cursing my way through on my headset. So if you hear that uh, in the background here, please disregard. And I think while we have a uh, little uh, commentary swap here, I will... Uh I will give our listening audience a few words from some of our uh, incredible sponsors. Travel further, faster with the Catula Instigators. Built for trail running, the Instigator is light and breathable while protecting your feet from the elements like dust, dirt, and debris. With a thousand mile warranty, the Duralink instep strap can stand up to anything you encounter on the trail. And for a quick getaway, the gator can be kept on your shoes as an entire unit between adventures. To keep your feet in tip-top shape, order a pair of instigators at Catula.com. Huge thank you to Catula for being uh, incredible sponsors of both this stream. As you see, uh, Mr. Shapiro passing Jamil there. Um, huge shout-out to Bryce for this footage. And he's, uh, he's going to let him go. And I think that we are going to send it back to our drone as we see runners coming towards Cottonwood here, both 125-mile runners in the Satona Canyon 125, which started at 7 a.m., and, uh, Sed or, and uh, Cocodona 250 runners as well. It looks like Jamil has picked up another runner here. Bib 416 is running really strong here in the Sedona Canyons 125. That is Matthew Kahn, who uh, Spider Pena predicted earlier would uh, have a podium finish here. So uh, we will be keeping an eye on eventually. him. We had a pretty good string of... Uh no crashes yeah and we've uh we're gonna have some great audio here as uh jamil follows matt dude he is crushing it and this is our third runner uh here well at least there's the 250 ones out there but yeah he won't really be running with anyone yeah we passed him right here hopefully they can <coughs> I think they're on a bit. Again, as these feeds come in and out, we'll keep trying to uh, bring you the best footage we have, and we'll be looking, keeping an eye out for our next runners to come to the Schnebly Hill Aid Station as well. And it looks like Bryce has also picked up a runner here. We'll see if uh, if we can get a bib number there. Looks like we still don't have audio, but we'll work on a bib number. Bib 402 here. That is uh, Rachel Buzzard, Arizona's own. She will be leading the uh, women's Sedona Canyons 125 race. So shout out to... Uh, to to Rachel. John Maroshik in the chat. Continuing his string of DNSs is uh it's what he said earlier, so it sounds like uh sounds like John will not be towing the line uh towing the line today. This in, uh, incredible work by uh, both
both Jamil and Bryce here getting us some great follow cam content. Bryce is here with uh, Rachel Buzzard, and Jamil is here following Matthew Kahn, our third and fourth place overall Matthew Kahn, third place overall third male, Rachel in fourth place overall and first female, um, just having a, having a really strong run here, and we'll see if we can actually... There, we can have a little picture-in-picture picture here, so you're going to be able to hear Jamil's smaller camera feed here while we also follow Rachel. Have you ever fallen while you're videoing? Um, probably have, but nothing too bad. Yeah, like, you gotta kind of yeah. keep an eye on the frame and <laughs> and where you're going. And we're gonna oh, cool. send it to Jamil's feed you here can while run we you wait. In, maybe. Yeah, be sweet. I told him he's gonna have to have a lightsaber waiting for me. That's right. While we wait on this feed to clean up a little bit, we're going to send it out to Schnebly Hill as we await our next runners in the Kogadona 250. And those runners should be uh, Josh Perry and Eliza LaPierre. It looks like they could be pretty close together. Um, right now it says Josh is uh, about a half mile or eight tenths of a mile from Schnebly Hill updated one minute ago and Eliza is one mile out updated four minutes ago so we should have eyes on them uh, fairly soon and they should be pretty close together um, Josh will be the third place male runner uh, and Eliza will be the fourth overall runner and our women's leader in the Cocodona 250. And so for the time being, we're going to send it to Bryce, who is now following I believe this is our second women's runner in the uh, Sedona Canyons 125, and that is Jennifer Schwegler. She's looking really strong. And then Jamil has also picked up bib 412, Tobias Winogren. And if you want on the live tracker, which is linked in the uh, in the description of this video, you can you can filter the live tracker um, like a leaderboard by distance. So um, it will be based on the most updated ping, but uh, you can kind of see where those runners are at. And it also looks like Shad is uh, back out and following more runners into uh, Sedona here. Shout out to Shad. We'll try to keep, uh, as long as Jamil has a somewhat clean feed, we'll try to keep uh, keep him in picture in picture when we can. But it's looking like that feed is coming in and out. So 
we'll go to our Shad cam here. Shad, uh, Shad didn't have to be up uh, in Flagstaff filming for his shift until tonight, so he said, oh, why not go out, get some more miles in, and uh, film some more of these, uh, some of these runners coming into, uh, coming into the Sedona aid station. Yeah, so this is a good point from TJ in the chat. So what you're looking at right now, this kind of more colorful bib with the light blues and the maroons um, are the Cocodona 250 big bibs. What you saw earlier on some of our runners, the more red uh, or fully maroon bibs were the um, Elden, or the uh, Sedona Canyons 125 runners. And this is the king of mustaches, Dom Grossman, uh, here coming into Sedona. And we'll see... If we can get some audio, I know that you all can hear the audio, uh, but I can't, so I'm going to try to fix that here. There we go. Yeah, she's, she's killing it right now. She was doing high mileage for 165 mile. Leave. After that, I guess that makes it down easier. Yeah. <laughs> I'm proud of my three fifty mile week. So <laughs> my back country skiing. It's what it takes. Yeah. I'm a physical specimen. <laughs> I can imagine that would be. <laughs> she makes herself into a human anchor, turns her skis 90 degrees. And it looks her. like we do have our next runners out at Schnebly, so we're going to send it to our drone <laughs> out there. And you can see that is uh, Josh Perry right there in front and Eliza LaPierre uh, to the left of the screen. And again, they're basically uh, together at this point. And this uh, is just prior to the, excuse me, the Schnebly Hill Aid Station, which is around mile 179. Both these runners still looking really strong right now. Uh, and appear to be in good spirits. So it's it's been interesting to see um, kind of how you know Michael Greer, uh, now Josh and Eliza have looked coming in um, compared to how Killian Korth looked when he left. Now you know he maybe took his time in the aid station, maybe was a little stiff getting out. Um, he's still moving forward and moving fairly strong, but uh, he's got three runners now uh, behind him who are also moving, uh, you know, really strong. Again, this footage is brought to you courtesy of our steady-handed drone pilot, Jason Peters. Shout out to uh, shout out to Jason. Again, this is just prior to the mile 179 aid station at Schnebly Hill. This will be the first proper aid station that runners have uh, have seen since Sedona. So um, all they've had in between here in Sedona has been a water drop. 
Uh, I believe that is uh, his pacer is Joe Alonzo, who uh, he's got to be uh, he's got to be up there for best dressed. Um, I know that when Kevin Goldberg left Jerome, uh, he and his pacer were also um, quite well quite well attired. Donna Webster in the chat. Will you be covering the 125 runners? Yeah, actually, until this shot, we've been uh, covering the 125 runners primarily for uh, the better part of the last uh, hour or so. Um, but we will be bouncing back and forth, uh, making sure we're keeping everyone up to date on as much of the 125 as we can. Here you see Eliza and her crew. This is, again, your women's race leader, Eliza LaPierre, who is currently in uh, fourth place overall, running right with the third-place runner, uh, Josh Perry, as they come into m the Schnebly Hill Aid Station. We will try to see if we can bring in some of the action from the 125 as Jamil is out on course still. We'll keep that as the picture in picture here and get a little bit of uh, some runner cam footage as long as we can. And again, the uh, feeds there will likely cut in and out, so we will uh, do our best to uh, bring you some picture-in-picture -picture coverage of that when we can. Again, we are currently watching women's race leader Eliza LaPierre working with her crew at the Schnebly Hill aid station here. It looks like our drone pilot is going to be going down maybe for a battery swap. Got Dom Grossman on screen here back at Sedona. He's uh, always a fan favorite. I believe the uh, term that was used to describe Dom's mustache earlier in the week was a soup strainer. Um, not sure, not sure how Dom feels about that, but I, th I think it's a compliment. <laughs> Thank <sighs> you. 
I'm just trying to be the fastest mustache in the West. You know, <laughs> you know Dom, uh, Dom had an interesting uh, winter of training, um, as you could follow along on his socials, where a lot of uh, a lot of shoveling snow and the occasional uh, ski once he was able to shovel himself out of his house. So uh, it's awesome to see how strong Dom's looking at uh, Sedona here with uh, a little bit of a, a unique training block. I'm ready for Elden. Any snow on Elden that has to be shoveled, I'm ready for it. <laughs> You're gonna carry uh you're gonna carry a micro shovel in your pack, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, someone's gonna make it nice up there. <laughs> that's very that that's very thoughtful. Be. I've only slept two hours in the last few days, so take it with a grain of salt. How ha when did you uh when have you slept, Dom, if you don't mind sharing with the live chat? Um slept like twenty minutes at whiskey. Slept uh up at Mingus for like around an hour. And then a good hour and a half at Deer Pass, so that's probably my math is probably off, but no, but that's uh, that's great insight. When are you? Do you have a uh, a planned sleep uh, coming up, or what does your strategy look like there? Um, until I collapse, but I do like sleeping around like 3 a.m. I find I sleep really hard when it's cool. So this morning, after sleeping from like whatever 3 to 4:30 at Deer pass felt a lot better than like middle of the day sleep. That's awesome. That's one of the interesting things about uh, this race is everyone's sleep strategy becomes, you know, so dependent upon uh, upon the person and kind of how they feel. And so it's awesome to get these kinds of uh, insights into what each athlete is doing out there. The other big thing is. Eat something like really rich right before you're in a nap. That was what uh that was what Pete Mortimer, who was uh on the broadcast last night, had said. He said uh when he runs these two hundreds he comes in, gets a belly full of food and then is ready to sleep. It works. And here we have eyes back on Josh Perry at Schnebly Hill. So we're going to send it back out there. Uh, he is our third place uh, runner right now. And he has been looking incredibly strong uh, moving up through the pack uh, over the, uh, over the uh, last couple of days. Shout out to Billy in the chat. Thanks for tuning in, buddy. Sleep planning is just like pit stops in NASCAR. I think that this is an, an interesting point. I think the one uh like apt comparison is how in nascar every driver kind of has their own fueling strategy as we're taking a look at eliza lapierre here um you know each runner definitely has their uh their kind of own uh fueling strat or uh, own sleep strategy we don't have any audio there but we do have uh eliza giving us a little flota ad maybe she's doing an ad read for uh for flota for us we had some in studio last night. It was uh it was it was pretty good, I'm not gonna lie. It wasn't uh it wasn't bad. Drinking a flota. Yeah, she must she probably had one at the uh Satisfy Fane Ranch aid station and then also took one for the road. Um 
maybe with her crew, but that sounds like a sounds like a pretty solid strategy. And while we are tuned in here, let's take a look at our women's leaderboard if we can here. And again, there m looks like these are based on, um, I believe, most recent pings. Um, but Eliza LaPierre, your race leader, it looks like Mika Thews is making her way towards uh, this aid station in second. And then you've got Sarah Ostazuski in third. Sally McRae in fourth. Uh, we'll work on seeing if we can get that uh, line formatting uh, uh, fixed up there. Don Greenwalt in fifth. Alicia Jenkins, Carol Northrup, Desiree Clark. Um, and the list goes on. Um, let me... We got Kara Diamond Hussman and uh, Mindy Kuhlman. And now we're taking a look at... The Pride of Leeds, Josh Perry, limited race experience here, but a ton of experience uh, in the through hiking FKT scene, self-supported FKT on the Arizona Trail. Oh, uh, Billy asked, what's a Flota? Well, I think, ladies and gentlemen, that it's only right that we uh, that we show Billy what Flota is here in just a second. And so there you have it. It looks like our drone went down there. So we'll work on getting eyes back on uh, Josh Perry there. But there you have it, Billy. That is Flota. I think that uh, the thing that makes it best is the uh, close-up of Mike Versteeg. And the smile, the no burp, always gets me as well. Uh, but definitely a fan favorite in terms of uh, in terms of the commercials we've been able to uh, to see here. And we do have uh, more Flota here in the studio. At some point, I will uh, I will have to uh, I'll have to indulge in another one at a certain point. But as of right now, we're tuned in to the. Sedona Aid Station. Um, you can see some of the tables and chairs over here under the Ramada, the Aid Station, a little bit further off in the distance. Um, but here we see uh, it looks like there's Dom Grossman, who we just saw a little bit ago. Um, he is now in the Aid Station. And we do have our drone back up here. And uh, it looks like we've got um runner leaving once we get a little bit closer we will be able to see who we have here but that looks like uh Josh Perry Matthew Myers in the chat. We actually, we did a, uh, 
we did a uh, taste testing last night. Brett was still uh, still around as well, so Brett Hornig came on the uh, stream for Aravaiba After Dark and drank Flota out of a wine glass and gave us a uh, a full review with uh, Pete Mortimer and Chris Warden. And we are seeing Josh Perry, uh, who has just left the Schnebly Hill aid station. This is roughly mile 179 or so on the course. And Eliza Lapierre, I believe, is still in the aid station there, uh, taking her time. Josh is third um, in the overall standings of the race, or so third male and third overall. Eliza is our men's leader or women's leader, rather. I apologize. She is our women's leader and is in fourth overall. It looks like... We have eyes on our next runner coming into the Schnebly aid station. We'll get a better look when they're closer. Or is that... I'll see if Jason can let me know what the... Uh, that is... Uh, I believe that's Eliza leaving right now, um, is I think what I'm being told. And again, if you're just tuning in, we are out at the Schnebly aid station. And to take a peek at the live tracker here we should be expecting Mika Thews and Mike Grunwigen to be making their way into the Schnebly aid station soon Looks like we may be circling back here. For the time being, we are going to send it back to Sedona. So we have more Cogadona 250 runners coming up and into the Sedona aid station here. We're going to 
send it now back to Schnebly Hill as we take a look. Here is Schnebly Hill Aid Station. Looks like we have some runners coming into the aid station here. see if we can get that looks like Mike and Mika right there so I believe the shot we had before was um, Josh Perry and Eliza LaPierre I know that they had both exited the aid station uh, at around the same time and it looks like they are together now we've got Mike and Mika these two have been running and working together for quite a while now um, when we saw them at Jerome Mika was uh, up and ready to go and waited on Mike to uh, do a few last minute things before taking off so they've been uh, working together quite a bit Mike Gronwagen Seattle Washington native he's the fourth men's runner through here fifth overall and then you've got Mika Thews. She is in the second place female runner coming through here. We'll see how much time these two take here because um, Josh Perry and um, Eliza LaPierre both left the aid station just recently. So um, we'll get a better indication of what that gap looks like once these two uh, leave the aid station here. And for those of you just tuning in, we have Mika Thews and Mike Gronwagen, both uh, both uh, in the aid station here as we speak. Let's see what's going in on the live chat here. Jeez, Josh Pilgrim in the chat. TJ is a better chat host than the live guys. TJ is excellent, so um, can't take that uh, any, any type of way. Um, but 
Yeah. I mean, we're trying to uh, answer the Michael Versteeg question uh, about at about the top of the hour every hour. So uh, we will uh, <laughs> we will uh, keep you guys updated. But Michael Versteeg dropped out uh, of the race, as you uh, can see on the live tracker. Um, in between Dead Horse Ranch and Deer Pass, he uh, he decided to uh, to call it a day. And we're going to pull away for just one second. We're going to send it back to Sedona here. And again, the shadows are uh, are going to keep things a little a little darker here, but we do have uh, on the right there Dom Grossman with the incredible mustache with uh, his uh, his family, his kids, and his wife Katie. <laughs> Michael in the chat coming to my defense. No, it was it wasn't it wasn't rude by any means. I was just uh I was just giving uh giving everyone a hard time. TJ TJ is a is a great chat host, so um can't fault anyone for that. Philip Rogers in the chat gonna change the female lead here at Schnebly. I don't know I don't quite understand the question. I apologize. Um, but Eliza Lapierre has already left Schnebly Hill Aid Station. She left basically right with, uh, right after Josh Perry, who is uh, in third place overall. Again, I think we are just swapping out our, uh, taking care of some drone stuff out at Schnebly, and then we'll be back up and uh, and running. Has Killian slept yet? Killian had uh, about a 55-minute break at uh, the Deer Pass aid station uh, yesterday afternoon, evening. Maria in the chat. No, I think that this is something that we talked about uh, a little bit yesterday. Um, after you get past Whiskey Row, you're not seeing... Uh, as many DNFs um, as you do in the in kind of the early parts. The early parts of this course are just a lot. They're hard. They're hot. They're technical. Um, you know, it's early, so you're trying to conserve. Um, the first, you know, 35, 40 miles of this course are pretty rough. But then, you know, once you get into the later stages of the race, you typically don't see as many uh dnfs especially if runners are staying ahead of the cutoffs here and again we are tuned in this is no longer the schnebly hill aid station this is sedona
and again we are uh, working on getting our uh, our drone feeds back up looks like we may have a shot out at Schnebly again We've got Mika Thews here. Now we're looking at Mike Gronwegen. Again, these two runners have been running uh, together for quite some time here. Chris uh, in the chat, I believe the um, the leaderboard is also linked in the uh, description of this video. Looks like we do have, looks like that feed froze. Jamil has some runners on camera. Down here, we'll see if we can get any audio. Not sure if our audio will come in. The feed is a bit choppy, so we may not be able to uh, grab it, but we will send it back out to uh, Schnebly here. And again, And this is, it looks like this is incorrect here. Mike Grunwagen is the fourth male. Again, this is pulling from the live tracking data. So if we have any uh, ping delays or anything like that, um, you know, that's why you may see some uh, incorrect data here. Mike Grunwagen is the fourth male, not third. Currently, we have Killian Korth leading the way, followed by Michael Greer and Josh Perry. On the men's side, on the ladies' side, so far we have El Eliza Lapierre, uh, who was right with Josh Perry, and then Mika Thews, who is in the aid station in second place here. And then it looks like our f third place female should be uh, Sarah Ostazewski. Who uh, looks like is... Uh, it looks like she has been passed by Michael McKnight. Um, so McKnight is likely, um, we, he is about 3.4 miles out as of 11 minutes ago. So we should be seeing him. Yeah, he is, his thing just updated. He's 1.8 miles out now. He's about to cross the, uh, I-17 corridor. Um, and here we have... Mika. Um, so we should be seeing the Dark McKnight as uh, everyone is now uh, calling him um, to be uh, to be coming through the Schnebly Hill aid station in the uh, near future. Again, he's 
um, a little over a mile and a half away. John Maroshek in the chat. John, I, I think that uh, I'll rely on you to uh, have that taken care of. Um, I think that those were meant to go on uh, on uh, the windows of John's house, but they must have gotten packed packed away with our uh, aid station stuff. <laughs> but shout out to John Maroshek, um, warehouse manager, logistics coordinator, man of many hats. Uh, I don't know what the appropriate title is, but he helps uh, make sure all the stuff that's needed to uh, put on these races kind of gets to where it needs to go. And we have Mike Grunwagen and Mike Thews here in the Schnebly Hill Aid Station. And we have a charging Mike McKnight who will be uh, making his way towards this aid station soon. He was 1.8 miles out seven minutes ago. He has overtaken Sarah Ostazewski. Um but Sarah is still holding on to the uh, third place female slot. And it looks like we uh, also have Kevin Goldberg uh, approaching the water station at mile 173. TJ Gardner in the chat, the people's favorite live stream host from uh, from chat side, our chat side host, John Maroshik and Patty Curry, the unsung heroes of Aravipa races. Couldn't agree more. While we wait on Micah, Mika and Mike to uh, take care of everything they need at the aid station here. We are going to actually send it to the Mingus Mountain aid station for just a few minutes and check in on all the uh, happenings there.
And so if you were just tuning in, this is the Mingus Mountain Aid Station right around mile 108 or so um, after Fane Ranch, which had an 8.30 cutoff. Uh, all runners got out of Fane Ranch on time. The next cutoff will be Mingus Mountain. So runners exit Fane Ranch and uh, kind of start to climb their way up to um, the second uh, kind of or I guess maybe the first big climb, second big climb on this course probably uh, up to Mingus Mountain in the Black Mountains before they descend to Jerome. We're going to uh, take a quick break from commentary so that uh, I can refuel uh, some coffee, and uh, we'll be right back to catch Mika and Mike out at uh, Schnebly. And we are back. Thank you all for uh, bearing with me while I uh, grabbed a little bit more coffee here. And we had a question in the uh, chat here about what time the cutoff is at Mingus. And I'm gonna pull that up right now. The cutoff at Mingus Mountain will be today at 1 p.m. So we'll make sure that we have uh, we have folks out there, so we got about three hours left for uh, runners to get in and out of uh, Mingus Camp here. What kind of coffee are we drinking here? Well, I believe that we, I'm not sure exactly what we have, to be honest. But I will say, if you are looking for some great coffee, there is the Cocodona 250 blend available on our website from Long Run Coffee Company. 
one of our partners. They've made uh, some specific blends for a variety of our races, including uh, uh, Black Canyon. And looks like we have some action here at the Mingus Mountain Aid Station. Uh, but you can get that on our website at shop.mountainoutpost.com. It's delicious. It looks like we've got uh, some more runners also coming into Sedona here. The cutoff for Sedona is not until tomorrow at 12.15 uh, p.m. So obviously these runners have uh, are nowhere near that, but uh, just to keep you updated on you know what the cutoff would be at this aid station. And to switch gears a little bit, looks like we have a Jeff Browning siding in the Sedona Canyons 125. It's a little hard to tell, uh, but our drone pilot believes that he's on him. And based on how well he's moving, that would, uh, that would make a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, for those worried about um, Andy Glaze, it looks like he is approaching the Dead Horse Ra Ranch aid station. Um, and his tracker hasn't updated in a few minutes, so it could just be a tracker uh, issue there um, that, we, uh, that we aren't seeing. And we will try to get this drone shot cleaned up a bit. And it looks like we have some action maybe out at Schnebly. So we're going to send it back out there. And that my my friends is the Dark McKnight running into the Schnebly Hill aid station. Looking incredibly strong. Pacer and friend Ben Light is there. We'll we'll see uh, how long this stop is. And so far, you know, since since yesterday, Mike McKnight has looked like just a man on a mission. And 
when he's clicking on all cylinders, it's something really exciting to watch. Yeah, and uh, just for everyone who was worried about Andy Glaze, he is at the um, Dead Horse Ranch aid station. He pinged one minute ago at that aid station. So worry not, my friends. Andy Glaze is uh, still moving forward. Looks like our drone has Mike Gronwagen heading out now. And again, he it, it's listing him as second. He's in fourth. We're having just a little bit of an issue with, uh, with that bug and how it's updating here. But he is heading out of the aid station here at Schnebly Hill, uh, right around mile 179. And for an update on our race leaders. like Michael Greer has not pinged in about 30 minutes or so and Killian Korth had, was four miles out from Munns Park 10 minutes ago so we should be seeing Killian Korth and Michael Greer um, not too uh, not too far from now um, when they get closer to Munns Park, we will have a drone up in the sky out at Munns Park. Again, this is Mike Gronwagen, your fourth place male competitor. As he, uh, makes his way through the beautiful Ponderosa Pine Forest. Run far, get lost, asking how far a second from first. It's hard to tell right now because um, Michael Greer, who's in second, his uh, his tracker hasn't uh, just, no, oh, no, his tracker hasn't updated in 33 minutes versus 12 minutes for um, Killian Korth, so. You see, looks like Mike McKnight is getting up and ready to get out of the aid station. Again, uh, uh, something that we've touched on, uh, you know, a number of times is how efficient some of these crews are for uh, people from the hiking and FKT community. Um, they come in, they, they know exactly what they need. They uh, take care of any issues in the most efficient way possible and then they uh, kind of get them back out there.
so again, this is Michael McKnight, who on day one, we weren't sure whether he was going to continue when he came into uh, when he came into Camp Kippa. Uh, he was having some back issues, took his time, got evaluated by um, by the medical staff. Continued to Friendly Pines. We found out today he he took about a three hour nap at Friendly Pines, which is mile, uh, I believe, seventy two. Uh, right around there, it's prior to getting to Whiskey Row. Um, and I believe that's been his only nap since, and he has been charging hard uh, ever since that happened. He made a wrong turn, or he missed a turn coming into Camp Kippa, so he had to circle back. So he's also uh, on a few bonus miles, but it's nice to see him, uh, you know, out and running super strong right now. Larry in the chat. Mike McKnight is putting on the red Solomon top circa Tiger Woods on Master Sunday for the close. I think that's exactly what it is. I was hoping for maybe a Batman t-shirt or something like that, but, um, you know, the uh, the Wednesday red will uh, will do. While we wait on Mike to uh, finish any of uh, taking care of any of his last minute needs, we will send it back. We do have Bib 81 coming into Sedona. This footage courtesy of the Shad Cam. And Bib 81, as you can see there, is Jason Bird. He is making his way to the Sedona aid station. Sounds like we will be expecting Sally McRae into uh, Sedona in the near future as well. So we'll try to uh, get eyes on her when we can as well. But right now we're with Jared Bird following him uh, into the Sedona aid station here. And just to give you all a sneak peek of what's to come, we will in just a minute have a drone up in the beautiful town of Munns Park, Arizona. Right now we're following Jared Bird into the Sedona aid station. Keeping our eye also out for uh, whenever Mike McKnight is ready to leave the Schnebly Hill aid station. We 
we're going to take a look at what's to come here, courtesy of Troy Wicks. And looks like that feed is a little choppy, so we'll see if we can clean that up. Good to uh, good to to see that the feed is uh, needing a little uh, TLC before the leaders come, so that we can try and uh, try and troubleshoot those. So we'll send it back to Sedona here. The beautiful red rock formations in the distance. Look at these beautiful views that runners are going to get to experience as they um, come through the Sedona Aid Station, or as they come through Sedona. go up to the aid station here I apologize this is not Schnebly this is Sedona and we do also have Mike McKnight heading out of the aid station Here at Schnebly Hill. Yeah, in the chat, McKnight is moving super well. And we do have Shad going back out, uh, I believe, to look for our next runners to come into Sedona. So we will, uh, we will try and get eyes on, uh, on our next set of runners to come in. And it looks like Shad
has eyes on crowd favorite. We'll see if we can get audio. I haven't been getting Shad's audio here. Um, so we may need to refresh our feed here in a little bit. But it looks like we've got Shelby Farrell uh, pacing. Inaugural year finisher of the Cogadona 250 with uh, crowd favorite Sally McRae. Oh, and look at that. Shelby's got the yellow painted nails for the yellow runner herself. You know, that's some, uh, that's some great branding. Proud of Shelby for that. Again, they are making their way up into the Sedona aid station. Again, here we are. You see Katie Grossman and her family there. See Sally making it uh, all the way to the aid station here. So awesome to see uh, a new uh, a new atmosphere here at the Sedona Aid Station after being at the St. John Vianney Aid Station uh, for the last two years. Uh, yeah, it's been awesome to uh, awesome to see this new location uh, and and uh, yeah, kind of the vibe that is that is forming there. And we will go ahead Keep our eyes peeled to uh, what the strategy looks like at the aid station here. And we are just going to quickly check the feed from Munns Park here. See if we got that cleaned up. It's looking pretty good. And we'll send it back to Sally at the uh, Sedona aid station. And look at that. I don't have any audio on Shad's feed right now, but we'll work on trying to get that sorted. If we can, Shad, I may need you to uh, reset your, uh, refresh your browser for me. Not sure if Shad can hear me. But there you have the great Sally McRae. And 
again. I'm not sure if I can get Shad to refresh his stream for me real quick. That may help us with some of the audio. Yep, there we go. We'll take a look. Here's another shot. See Shelby Farrell, who's pacing uh, Sally McRae, getting getting fueled up. Now we've got Shad back, so we'll see if we've got any audio. We do have audio now. Sorry about that. Sally's getting the space to take care of herself in the aid station as well because, like you pointed out, uh, one of the most important things is making sure the runners are getting uh, any and all, uh, getting taken care of in any capacity that they need. So. Oh, 
Do you want to know? Why did you love the chicken on the desk? So uh, Wayne in chat, this is from the Sedona Aid Station, uh, around mile 161. Ish. Um, that's where we're getting this feed from. Affluent journeys. Was Michael Verstig the last DNF up to now? I don't believe so. Um, I know that we had one runner, uh, Joseph, get timed out at. Um, at uh, <laughs> the aid station at Iron King. Sorry, it was slipping my mind. The aid station after Whiskey Row where we saw him last. So he timed out there. We also got reports from Rory in the chat um, that Carrie Henderson had dropped at Jerome. I haven't confirmed that with Race Command yet, but... Um, we, uh, we do believe that Carrie Henderson may have called it a day as well. And again, for anyone just tuning in, we are... Ready to go, guys. Sean, this is Sean. Sean, I'm from Jacobsburg. Yeah. And my name's Sean. I mean, no, I saw his man on tag. And we are at the uh, uh, I'm check in here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Confirmation from Carrie's crew chief extraordinaire, Austin Corbett, that she did drop last night. Well, I hope that she is uh, doing okay. It's good to hear that y'all are back in Flagstaff. I know. Uh, and uh, got some rest. So, Carrie, you have to Should we play his watch instead? We 
feeds here still staying in Sedona but we're going to take a look at some of the other runners in the aid station here so we've got bib 124 that is Jason Cannon right there with his pacer getting uh, getting fueled up Let's see what is happening on the tracker here. I know that um, it looks like Michael Greer's tracker hasn't updated in over an hour. So we will uh, keep our eyes on that. And it looks like we have Killian Korth, our race leader, on the drone out at Munns Park, presumably. Killian Korth. Uh, we don't have uh, an update on the tracker from uh, from Michael Greer, so maybe We'll see if we can get a clean shot of the race leader here. Based on the shoes, it looks like that is Killian Korth. Yep, and we got a confirmation. He recognizes his pacer's form. And <laughs> this is as far as uh, and uh, this is as far as our drone can fly without getting some interference. So he's uh, zooming in as best he can. Yeah, and it sounds like um, Michael and uh, Race Commander both aware that his tracker is not working and are hoping to resolve it possibly at the next aid station. Again, he is coming in through the streets of Munns Park. 
making his way to the Munns Park aid station at roughly mile 192. This is uh, race leader Killing Korth, if you're just joining us. It looks like we will have footage from Munns Park on the ground here as well. We'll just need Daniel, uh, who's filming in Munns Park, to turn his orientation lock off on his phone for me. And uh, that will certainly help us. And we'll see if we can get some uh, footage from the ground here in just a minute or two. Got again Killian Korth on the drone here coming into Munns Park. We should have shot from on the ground here momentarily. Here's what it looks like from the ground. As we've got nice work! Looter who uh, signed up to help us volunteer out there. So shout out to him uh, for making the last minute plans to come out and help us out. We appreciate it uh, a lot. He's not going to have a gimbal at the current time, but uh, we are going nice to have him a gimbal, I believe. So he can uh, follow some runners into the aid station here. Killian is looking, uh, I will say this, compared to when we saw him uh, leave the last aid station at um, Schnebly Hill, he looks quite a bit better, uh, I will say. We'll keep it on the eyes in the sky here, and you can see the aid station there. Uh, and again, this is right around mile 192. Uh, uh, 191.7 per the aid station table. This is our race leader, Killian Korth. We'll see how long uh, this stop is here or uh, what the strategy looks like. Ben Wiley in the chat. Um, we don't know. Um, Michael Greer's tracker isn't working and hasn't pinged in uh, over an hour. So we uh, we will, um, yeah, have to uh, keep us posted. Race Command is aware, so they know that uh, that his tracker isn't working as well. So we will uh, I kind of see him when he gets to the aid station here. But just based on uh, where Michael Greer was at the last time his tracker pinged, we should be seeing him uh, coming to the aid station 
within the next probably few minutes or so. DC in the chat. Does anyone know if Killian slept? He did uh, have about a 50-ish, 45 to 55 minute nap at Deer Pass uh, yesterday uh, late afternoon, early evening. So for anyone just tuning in, we are at the um, Munns Park aid station. This is around mile 192, and this is our race leader, Killian Korth. He is uh he is still looking really strong. Uh when we saw him at Sedona last night. Uh he was looking a little rough, but he's uh he's kinda kept uh kept things moving. Sedona to Schneble is 17 miles. Yep, that is uh, that is correct. Looks like Killian Korth is off on his way. He will continue to wind through the Ponderosa Pines over to uh, Kelly Canyon Aid Station. And that aid station is going to be at uh, mile 202.8, so an 11-mile stretch uh, between aid stations there. We are keeping our eye on some of the other feeds here. As we have our eyes on race leader Killian Korth. In and out of the aid station fairly quickly as well. 
which is good to see. He must be uh, still feeling pretty strong. Uh, he's, you know, moving forward quite well. Yeah, Conrad Korth giving us uh, the insight as to why Killian DNF'd at uh, the Jerome Aid Station last year was he uh, tore his hamstring 15 miles prior. So that's uh, probably a good re reason to uh, call it quits, but he's having himself a really, really great day. Or days, I guess, uh, would be the... Um, would be the proper way to put it. And Laura, any update on Greer's place and tracker situation? We will not have an update until he gets to the aid station that we are currently at. Uh, that is the next aid station on course, and that's where they're going to try to uh, possibly fix any sort of tracker uh, issues if possible. Chasing cutoffs. Five runners still making their way up the uh, Mingus Mountain aid station. So uh, up Mingus Mountain to the aid station. So once we uh, once we lose our race leader here, lose sight of him or lose connection, we will uh, send it over to the handy dandy iPad here, and we'll uh, take a look at the runners that are still. Uh, making their way up Mingus. Is we want to show love to uh, to the mid and back of the Packers as well. what aid station was Killian just at. This is the uh, Munns Park aid station, which is at mile 191.7. And he has just left that aid station. And just to check in with our Sedona Canyons 125 race. Uh, it looked like we had possibly Jeff Browning on for a second, but we've lost that connection. So we'll try to keep you as posted on that race as we can. But right now, we are on uh, Killian Korth. He is about 192 miles in, just over 50 miles to go. And our drone is turning around and looks like he's going to possibly be heading back to the aid from the ground. While we wait on our drone. Brown is back up in the sky, maybe.
The drone is speaking to us. Yeah, that was uh, that was my fault over here. I apologize. If I'm having any audio issues uh, on my mic, also let me know in the live chat. We are tuned in currently to the Munns Park Aid Station. Looks like Michael Greer's tracker has updated and he is a little under two miles away from Munns Park. So we'll be seeing him in the near future. And we will send it back to Sedona in just a minute as we still have eyes on some of our runners over there. So again, if you're just tuning in, this is Munns Park, mile 191.7 for our runners. We do have our drone back up here in Munns Park. Again, our second place runner, Michael Greer, should be uh, less than two miles away from the Munns Park Aid Station. And we do have some shots inside the Sedona Aid Station over here. You can see drop bags are out. And for the time being, we'll bring it back to Munns Park here. <laughs> Cass, I'm sorry that uh I'm sorry that you missed it. Uh we were with Sally in Sedona uh for quite a while there. We wanted to uh give her space to take care of herself at the aid station. Um but I'm sure we'll have eyes back on her um as she gets ready to exit the aid station. So don't uh don't fret. If you want a Sally sighting, you can rewind uh, a few minutes and uh, check it check it out. And 
And I do want to take a minute to just take a look at our iPad here. We're going to refresh this out at Mingus uh, Camp. So it looks like we've got uh, Eric Salgado. His last ping was a long time ago. So he's likely through that aid station making our way down course. So runners that still have to uh, to make their way up looks like uh, Cassidy Hood is uh, is just a little bit away from the aid station, about a mile away from the aid station. And then we've got Kyung Lee, as of 13 minutes ago, was about a mile and a half away from the aid station. So she may actually be up uh, up closer than uh, Cassidy was there. <coughs> then we've got Bib 185, Kristen Trapp. She is about two, two and a half miles away from the aid station as of uh, four minutes ago. We've got Shanoa Creer uh, about just under three miles away from the aid station as of three minutes ago. And Shana, Shana Green, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that first name, about three and a half miles from the aid station as of a minute ago. And I believe that is our final runner on course. And so our final runner on course is about three and a half miles out. And the cutoff there is at 1230, I believe. Um, and it looks like... Um, oh, is that 1 p.m.? I apologize, 1 p.m. So uh, still has two hours to get uh, three and a half miles and then out of that aid station. And it looks like we may be having a, uh, a guest on. We'll see if his, um, if his connection uh, uh, gets a little better here. And yeah, let's, uh, let's check in with the legend himself, Jeff Garmeyer. It looks like I'm getting audio. I just need to do one thing here. Yep, we have audio on Jeff. Your connection is a, a little bit limited uh, here. You're freezing up, but we can hear you a little bit. Uh, but, yeah, we'll see if it cleans up at all. Otherwise, we may have to check in with Jeff a little bit later. But based on the little footage we could see there, Looks like he may be up in the uh, up in the pines uh, above Sedona there. So looks like he's probably made his way um, up the Kasner Canyon climb and is on his way to um, and is on his way to the Schnebly Aid Station. Or actually, yeah, it looks like he's past the water drop and on his way to Schnebly. So. Uh, his connection may clean up here in a little bit, and uh, if so, we we'll see if we can uh, we can check in. For right now, we are above the Munns Park aid station here, awaiting our second runner to come through, which should be Michael Greer. And while we have a minute, we are going to have a uh, little word from one of our sponsors, Spring Energy. This is your machine. It is strong and fast. Tough beyond measure, brave beyond belief. It will take you high in the mountains, deep into the woods, over rivers and deserts, and further within yourself than you have ever dare to go. But it is only as good as the fuel you put into it. Feed it real food. Feed it real power. Feed it spring. And a huge shout out to our partners at Spring Energy. And we're back at the Sedona Aid Station here with Sally McRae. Looks like she is packing up and getting ready to leave the aid station here. Uh, with pacer extraordinaire Shelby Farrell. 
Rocking the bucket hat, good choice. While we await Sally, we're going to check the static cam here. You can see Sally over in the distance with her pacer. A number of other people uh, in and around the aid station here. So it looks like they're getting ready to, uh, to head out here going to make their way out of Sedona towards Oak Creek, climbing up uh, up Kasner Canyon to the beautiful Coconino Plateau. And Skyler uh, throwing his bucket hat hate out. I just, I hope everyone knows that uh, that Skyler is in fact a a, uh, a bucket hat supporter per some of the photos I saw from uh, his wedding. There's Sally McRae heading back out. Still uh, looking in uh, very typical um, great spirits. Yeah, <laughs> Natasha just said not her usual smiley self. I think that uh, every time we've seen Sally, she's been in uh, in great spirits. So. And. We are going to follow Sally out just a little bit. I don't know how uh, how much longer we'll have uh, clean connectivity, but And they are moving forward. We're going to send it back to the uh, static shot at the Sedona aid station here as we have more runners in here. And I know that people are asking about Chad Wright, Bib 51. We will uh, keep our eyes peeled for him. And we are, the update we have on Greer is that uh, he sh his tracker did eventually update, and so we should be uh, waiting to uh, see him come down this road in uh, a matter of moments. And this is as far out as our drone is able to go due to some uh, interference from the power lines and things like that. So we're going to keep it locked here when we are uh, up in Munns Park. Uh, but we will also be checking in both at Mingus Mountain, where our final runners will have until 1 p.m. this afternoon to, uh, to make their way out of the aid station. And we will also be keeping things tuned in here in Sedona.
while we have just a little lull in the action, let's go and ha ahead and have a word from our sponsors. Our good friends over at Gnarly Nutrition. Gnarly has provided Fuel 2O at the aid stations throughout the course. Gnarly Fuel 2O is the all-in-one vegan-friendly solution for long days on the trails. Fuel 2O is packed with electrolytes and calories to replace what is lost during a long endurance effort. It also has the added bonus of HMB, which is a metabolite that helps prevent muscle degradation. So you can kickstart your recovery during your trip performance and jumpstart your next workout. Fuel 2O is ideal for all trail runners seeking high alpine adventures and big pushes like the Cocodona 250. Go over to gonarly.com and get yours today. And then our good friends at Satisfy Running, who were sponsors of the Fane Ranch Aid Station. Since launching in 2015, Satisfy Running has become renowned for its unique take on developing technical equipment that reduces distractions to help runners unlock the high. We're excited to announce Satisfy as a sponsor of the Cocodona 250 as they curate a first-of-its-kind premium aid station recovery experience for runners as they make their way through mile 100. So a huge shout-out to both of those live stream sponsors for helping make uh, both not only the live stream, but the race itself uh, happen. Without, uh, without our brand partners, we wouldn't be able, to, uh, we wouldn't be able to, to do the things that we do, and we're so grateful for, for all of them. For anyone just tuning in, we are going to move over to another shot of the Sedona Aid Station, a little bit more of a dynamic shot. We'll see if we can get a bib on that runner in blue. And that is 57. That is um, Michael Kirschen from Colorado. Shout out to uh, Michael. And it looks like we may have some action in Munns Park here. As we have Michael Greer, it looks like maybe our drone is... Maybe frozen overhead. We do have eyes on Michael Greer. In the aid station here at Munns Park. And we will see. How long he is uh, taking here? Uh, or not how long, but I didn't. Uh, you know how long he's taking here will uh, give us an indication of you know how far back he is from Killian Korth, who came through here um, a short time ago. It looks like Killian Korth came into the aid station uh, about 25 minutes ago. Um, he wasn't in here more than about 5 or 10 minutes, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see how things are going here.
looks like Greer is going to have, as of right now, around a four-mile lead over uh, third-place runner Josh Perry. do have a nice overhead shot of kind of what's going on here. Nice little crew set up there for Mr. Greer. And Michael Greer has been moving really strong all day. We saw the uh, massage gun come out at Schnebly Hill as well. Pretty solid decision to uh, to you know continue to stay on top of uh, keeping the legs and body feeling as good as you can. Again, this is the Munns Park Aid Station, about 192 miles in, so runners have just over 50 miles left uh, when they get here. Matt Halverson in the chat, the top three women within a few miles of each other. They should be coming in uh, all kind of together. Yeah, we've already seen um, Eliza LaPierre and um, Mika Thews come through the Schnebly Hill aid station. I don't believe we have seen Sarah Ostazewski over there yet, but we haven't. Uh, gotten an update in a little bit. Oh, it looks like we may have just, m we may have missed Sarah O coming through there. We may not have a, uh, a camera feed over there right now. Um, but yeah, it does look like Sarah is moving incredibly strong again. Um, and this is one of the interesting things to watch on the, women's race here with these three ladies all being um, fairly close as one, you know, who has slept when I think that that's going to be uh, a big factor when things come close is who is, who is freshest at the end from a sleep standpoint. But also one thing to factor in is Sarah lives in Flagstaff. She's trained on these trails over the last few years so much. She's going to know every uh, inch of this course. She's going to know, uh, all the false summits on the climb up Mount Eldon. She's going to know all these little details that um, maybe some of the other runners might not know uh, just due to the fact that she's uh, able to uh, able to train on these trails all the time. So she likely has a maybe a little advantage from that standpoint. However, um, you know, the two ladies in front of her are both so incredibly talented and running so strong uh that anything could happen, but it does appear that we're going to have a really uh, close and interesting race for uh, for the women's podium here with Eliza LaPierre, um, Mika Thews, and Sarah Ostazewski. 
separated by just three miles, a little over three miles. And it looks like Greer is heading out. We'll see if we can catch him on the drone. As he is heading out, and that means our next runner into the aid station is expected to be Josh Perry. And he still a little bit away as of As of right now, he is still around three and a half miles out from the aid station. So we'll see him uh, in the not too distant future, but um, not the immediate future either. Again, we're following Michael Greer here out of the aid station. Amanda Rich, Greer looking strong. LFG, I couldn't agree more. Greer is looking uh, super strong. Thank you, Matt O'Brien, uh, in the chat. You told us she was when she was there. Yep. I must have uh, I must have missed it in the chat, and like I said, we don't have a camera feed over there anymore. But uh, we appreciate you keeping us up to date in the chat, and I apologize for missing that update. But I do want to give credit where credit is due that you uh, that you tried to let us know. So shout out to shout out to you, and we appreciate we appreciate you. Again, the next aid station for these runners will be out at Kelly Canyon, which is about 11 miles down course. So um, a decent stretch here uh, between aid stations. Um, that is at mile 202.8 for, uh, for, for the Coconona 250 runners.
Audrey Kelly in the chat. Matt, you seem lonely. We will have uh, we will have Finn and Brett on the ones and twos here in about uh, 40 minutes or so. So they'll be uh, gracing you with uh, some more enjoyable blimp banter, I assume. Um, but I am holding it down solo here. We had uh, some last minute things come up to where uh, AJW had to, to attend to some family issues. So I'm uh, filling in solo with no AJW. He is missed. He's missed dearly, but I'm holding it down here. I'm trying to uh, keep up with the chat, keep up with the feeds, um, all of the things all at once. So um, as we are watching, we just watched Michael Greer leave the Munns Park aid station at around mile 192. And looks like we may get him for a little bit more. <laughs> After hours vibe in the chat from Rory. Shout out uh shout out to Rory for uh for giving us a, a little uh a little live performance the other night. Uh rapping performance, that is. Uh just to uh just to confirm. And we will have more footage coming in from Sedona. It looks like Lynn has some runners on camera here, so we'll Check in there. See if we can get a bib number or if anyone in the chat can uh, help identify this runner for us. Don't have any audio there, but we will... Uh, <laughs> Rory, <laughs> I have other talents too. We love you, Rory. Uh, there's n a number of runners uh, in here. Looks like that is Bib. That looks like that might be Bib 50. Uh, Kevin Hadfield, possibly. <laughs> Man. Apparently Rory is still uh still getting roasted for not knowing how to open uh a bottle of Maker's Mark, but I'm I'm just proud that you uh you know you gave opening the bottle an effort uh on air, you know. <laughs> the wax ties can be uh tough for all of us sometimes. And we've got uh, some people tuning in. McKnight is about, uh, as of one minute ago, he was about six miles from Munns Park. And about eight minutes ago, Josh Perry was about 3.8 miles apart. So Josh Perry is probably around or a little over three miles uh, to the Munns Park aid station. Um Mike McKnight about six miles, a little under six miles. So they're probably separated by about two and a half to three miles still, um, which is pretty incredible, uh, if I do say so myself. And we're going to have some footage from the trails in Sedona here in just a few minutes. we got another another follow cam coming in. So 
So we're going to take a look at that in just a second. Right now we're going to keep it tuned to the aid station here. Yep, and there we go. Looks like we do have some footage on trail. This runner is moving really strong here up to the uh, Sedona aid station. We'll see if at some point we can get a read on the bib number. That is bib 122. Two. That is Brian Janzik. So here we have runners coming in to mile 15. Again, that was Brian Janzik. And the runner we saw in the aid station earlier who we weren't 100% sure on the bib that was Kevin Hadfield, uh, bib number 50 that we saw in there uh, just a few minutes ago. Here we see the Sedona Posse Grounds Park aid station. A change up from the first two years when we were at uh, the St. John Vianney aid station. Brian has indeed has a rad Cocodona tattoo, but he is one of a handful of runners who have finished both of the first two years and are going for a third finish here. Let's see if we can unmute here. Oh, there, there. It looks like we're there. having getting oh, audio. I, I just need to be I, able to. <laughs> <laughs> Started actually running. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were sprinting through here. <laughs> Just uh, <laughs> sprinting for mom. <laughs> cool. What's your favorite section of the course so far? Um, kind of a hard call. I actually really like it. Okay. Like, it's really hard, but it's like, I like the yeah, it's a rough one. This part's cool. Let's do fix it. Yes. Yeah. 
pretty rough, but it's still a song. Our audio is uh, cutting out a little bit here, but I think uh, Brian was basically saying he's excited for this uh, this new way out of Satona. He said the road coming in uh, was a little bit rough, um, but this new way cutting out of Sedona is going to be pretty cool. Yeah, Not that's that it, a good way. Yeah. Take it. Yeah. Too. He's ready to take a dip in the creek. Yeah, you know there's going to be water, and it's probably going to feel good uh, this time of day as well. Yeah. Yeah. We Yeah. And then one question for Brian before we let him get back to taking care of himself. So last year with the, um, you know, the course reroute and things like that, different start time. How did coming through this section last year compare to coming through this section this year with, you know, basically from uh, Jerome to uh, until you get near the Sedona airport, it's pretty similar. How was that section this year versus last year? What's funny is I hit it at almost the same time. <laughs> I was here at like lunch and I think I left. So pretty, pretty much the same. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the only thing was we left from a little bit. It's like something. Yeah, you pushed through your path. Last year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I knew it was time to sleep. <laughs> he was trying to attack two runners in front of us. He was facing me. <laughs> and, and so that was a good sign. I took like a two minute. <laughs> and crash out. That's about, like, to about an hour. So I'll get a little I love it. Well, we're going to let Brian uh, keep taking care of himself here, and uh, he'll get back out on course. He looks like he's having a great time, and we'll check in on the inside of Sedona with our uh, static cam shot there, and huge shout-out to uh, to Josh for helping, uh, for helping film here in Sedona. We, uh, we appreciate it, and you can see number of uh, number of crews and uh, runners – in the aid station here. It looks like Sally took a 15 minute power nap at Sedona. And I can Eddie had a question in the chat here, so um, I will try to answer your question here in just a second, Eddie. It took Eliza LaPierre about, let's see, one day, 21 hours is... We're going to do some quick math here in the chat. So we have basically 45 hours to 52 hours. So about seven hours, Eddie, from Sedona to Schnebly for Eliza LaPierre. Oh, Matt O'Brien, I got to give him the credit. He beat me to it. Uh, Beat me to it on the math. Shout out to you, Matt. I was uh, struggling there for a second, trying to uh, trying to do all the uh, day plus hours stuff. So, yeah, I think it ended up being like seven hours in one minute or something like that. Sally running uh, really strong. She'll be tackling this section during the day, which um, obviously has its advantages, but also um, has. Uh, has its uh, setbacks as well or could present some problems. So it'll be awesome to see if uh, Sally can, you know, just continue moving forward and moving strong uh, as she makes her way towards uh, towards the Kasner Canyon climb up to the uh, Coconino Plateau. It looks like Josh Perry should be just under three miles out from the Munns Park aid station, so we'll see him in a little bit still. A 
lives of La Pierre was five and a half miles out, but that was a half hour ago. Her tracker hasn't pinged, so she's also probably uh, still up there um, ahead of Mike Gronwigan. And it looks like Mike McKnight, his tracker hasn't updated in a few minutes either. So once these uh, trackers start refreshing again, we'll kind of see where everything is at as we await them at the um, as we await them at the Munns Park Aid Station. But we're currently tuned in to the happenings inside the Sedona Aid Station. The other aid station that we want to make sure we're keeping our eye on over here is the Mingus Mountain Aid Station. Because there are only a handful of runners who are still awaiting uh, the Mingus Mountain, or still approaching the Mingus Mountain Aid Station. So it looks like per the handy dandy live tracker that Kristen Trapp should be uh, less than a mile out from the Mingus Mountain Aid Station. And Shanoa Creer is about a mile, just under two miles out from the aid station. And Sheena Green is right around a little over two miles out from the aid station. Her tracker says two and a half uh, five minutes ago, so um, the these three ladies have to be in and out of the Mingus Mountain Aid Station by 1 p.m. this afternoon, so an hour and 23 minutes left for the uh, cutoff here at the Mingus Mountain Aid Station, which is, uh, which is um, at mile 108.8. And I'm about to, uh, I'm a probably about to disappoint Kevin Goldberg more than he's ever been disappointed in his life. We currently don't have uh, anyone at Schnebly. Um, so we will, uh, we will see if that feed comes back up. But if not, we will, uh, we will be awaiting your presence uh, a little bit down the road at Munns Park. Kevin's dad is wanting to see him. We're uh, we're gonna be disappointing the uh, the Goldberg clan here. What happened to Killian Korth? He was number one. I don't know uh, what you're referencing. He's still in first place. Uh, his bib number was not number one. Um. Korth was bib number 29, and he is uh, in between Munns Park and Kelly Canyon and is still in the lead. And it looks like we do have some more footage from inside the Sedona Aid Station. I believe this is Bib 50, um, who we were able to see earlier. And that is Kevin Hadfield, we believe. And we do have some more runners coming into the aid station at Sedona here. We've got Josh following them in. We'll see if we can get a bib number uh, here. It looked like bib 51, but I'm not 100% sure.
That is bib number 51. That is uh, another crowd favorite here, Chad Wright. We'll see if we can get some audio here. A hundred miler. <laughs> this is about ten times harder than a miler. It's legit, man. I'm loving it. I love, love the it. Uh, energy from Chad right there. What's been your favorite part so far? Uh, I I grew a lot yesterday. Uh, my favorite part in the middle grunts I got, I couldn't wrap my mouth around the distance. And uh, I had to fight through that internal struggle all day yesterday. And I'm a mentally strong dude, so I'm not used to something challenging me on that level. And so fighting through that all day and forcing myself to continue to proceed. Uh, even though I felt overwhelmed. And now we've pared the race down to something I can fit within the box of my mind, right? So um, as far as the favorite running part on the course, the first 50K. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is legit. You know, I always used to think West Coast runners were a bunch of pussies. <laughs> they are <laughs> whole new level of respect from this old East Coast trail runner. <laughs> oh, I absolutely love the love the words of wisdom and encouragement from Chad Wright. For anyone who uh, who missed the prior moments, we've got Chad Wright coming into the Sedona Aid Station at mile 163. There he, uh, the Georgia native, the East Coaster, dropping some audio gold for us here in the Aid Station. He's got his own film crew here. This guy's crushing it. He's probably got the best beard on course. <laughs> So we are going to let him uh, chat with his crew and get taken care of, and we are going to send it inside the Sedona aid station here, and hopefully we will uh, get to see some more Chad Wright uh, before, he, before he heads off here. We're back inside the aid station here. And we are going to have our uh, drone at Munns Park back up. And uh, looking for our next runner, who we expect to be Josh Perry.
Yeah, Matt, in the chat, you are absolutely right. I think Munns Park is about to be uh, is about to be a party here in a little bit. We're gonna have we have so many runners so close together this late in the race. It's uh, pretty awesome to uh, to see. But for right now, we are tuned in to the inside of the Sedona Aid Station. As runners are refueling, taking a little break before they uh, before they make their way out towards uh, Oak Creek and begin the uh, Kasner climb up to the Coconino Plateau. We will just take a look at our overhead shot here in Munns Park. Again, runners will be coming down that road in front of us. Uh, coming from the upper right-hand side of your screen, I believe. And uh, they will make their way down this road to the aid station. Let's go ahead. And let's send it back to our Sedona aid station for the time being. We're going to have runners coming in and out of Sedona through this afternoon into the evening. Uh, and the cutoff for this aid station here in Sedona will be tomorrow at 12.15 in the afternoon. We also want to be keeping our eye here at Mingus Camp where we have just a few runners still left to come in uh, to the aid station. I believe runners have about an hour and 12 minutes to be in and out of the aid station there. And we do have a shot of, uh, looks like getting some, uh, getting some treatment there in Sedona. And it looks like, you know, due to the high requests, we did get a feed back up at Schnebly. I don't have audio from the feed, but there is the man, the myth, the legend, Kevin Goldberg. Bucket hat, smile, the wave. Most importantly, we're going to have a happy fan club in the chat, uh, which I think is, I think is incredible, incredibly important. Again, yeah, we won't have audio there, but he looks in good spirits. What's he? Uh, what's he drinking there? It looks like a can of uh, liquid death. Maybe, uh, maybe just the mountain spring water. Shout out to uh, our sponsors at Liquid Death.
for anyone just tuning in. This man needs no introduction. Yeah, Matt O'Brien, it looks like Steel Reserve. That's <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's definitely a liquid death. It'd be a lot funnier if it were a Steel Reserve uh, or <laughs> something of the sorts. We're going to have to, maybe we can get Kevin in like a liquid death commercial, uh, you know, right alongside Travis Barker or some of the other legends that <laughs> are ambassadors, um, ambassadors for them now too. And we are keeping our eye on some of these other feeds. We'll pop back to Schnebly in just a second. I want to take it to another crowd favorite here. Uh, he was getting massaged by his wife. That's, uh. The legend himself, Chad Wright, the Georgia native. Shout out to the great state of Georgia. Looks like he's uh, he's taking some time here, which is smart. Going to regroup. Only a small stretch left uh, in the heat of this like um, kind of Red Rock country here before you cross Oak Creek Canyon. Or Oak Creek start a gnarly climb up Kasner Canyon and uh, end up on the cooler temps of the Coconino Plateau. And we're going to send it back to Mr. Goldberg. I want to know, and again, we don't have audio, so if Kevin can maybe just give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down, is that the same bucket hat, or does he change bucket hats out? Uh, can we go a thumbs up for same bucket hat, a thumbs down for different bucket hat, maybe? I don't know if we'll get an answer or not, but maybe someone in the chat can let us know whether... Uh, whether Goldberg is wearing the same bucket hat or if he switches them out. And in the meantime, we're going to cut over to Munns Park just to check in here. So we still await our third place runner coming in, which will likely be, well, not likely, it should be um, Bib 11 Josh Perry. The Leeds native. And we are going to send it back to Mr. Goldberg here. Gonna wait on uh, confirmation, but someone is saying in the chat they don't think he's changed his hat or his socks. Now that is some big Goldberg energy. It looks like we do have some overhead drone shots from a little bit further down on the course. We'll have to see where this location is but we'll send it back to uh, Goldberg here as he is heading out we'll send it back to the drone and let's see what is happening Over at Mingus here as we have some runners in. Looks like we've got maybe some pacers who are there with the runners. And we do have uh, Goldberg heading out.
And so there you have it. Shout out to Jason for, uh, you know, getting uh, getting us some footage back at Schnebly uh, to uh, to appease the live viewing audience in the uh, live stream here. We are going to send it over to... Um, the Q drone. I'm awaiting uh, to see that where this exact location is, but some really beautiful shots here of uh, the Greater Sedona area. Looks like we do still have some follow footage from Jason here. Yeah, so a uh, good question in the chat. Which mile aid station were we mentioning when we were... Oh, and Goldberg is uh, heading out. This is where we're going to leave him. Goodbye to the drone. I'd love to see it. Which mile aid station? So Mingus Mountain is the next uh, cutoff. Uh, this is mile 108.8. Runners have to be in and out of this aid station within the next hour. So... Um, starting to get close. It looks like we still maybe just have um, a couple runners not there yet. So it looks like maybe Sean, Shiana Creer and uh, Sheena Green are both still making their way up there. Um, but they both should be pretty close. So um, should be in and able to get out of the aid station uh, in time. Michael Goldberg in the chat. Thank you for the uh, for the donation. We are going to be uh, doing a little commentary swap here in just a moment. Uh, you'll be joined by the beautiful angelic voices of uh, Brett Hornig and Finn Melanson. Brett looks like he is ready to go to a Vegas nightclub. Um, and Finn is just wearing a shirt. Oh, no. Oh, no. Finn, is also, uh, Finn is also dressed. Well, no, you're wearing a shirt, but you look like uh, you're, you know, going out to the clubs in Miami or something, Brett. So um, we are going to have a little – we're going to hang out on this static cam while we move some of the uh, some of the screens and things around and get a little commentary swap in here. So we'll be back in just a matter of moments.
And we are back, everyone. I am happy to be uh, shifted over to the uh, to the producer desk here and off camera. But we have the uh, two legends themselves of the Single Track Podcast, Finn Melanson and Brett Hornig. They're going to be uh, taking you guys through from uh, noon to six in terms of coverage. So we will uh, do our best to uh, keep you guys up to speed on everything that's happening. And uh, guys... Back to you. Microphone check. One, two, on two. All Is this good? thing on? Just Is this thing make on? sure I'm coming through. Is this thing on? It's not. All right, we'll do it live. Oh, man. Day three. Cocodona. The Cocodona games. There's been, uh, I feel like this was, last night was, uh, was a biggie. Yeah, I woke up this morning and took a look at the uh, tracker and uh yeah there was some movement brett are we about to talk about one of the potentially greatest comebacks of all time in ultra running history this is gonna go up there michael mcknight is now up to fourth place even just from before the start of our run today he's moved up three more spots uh yeah mike as as we had said before the dark McKnight, he rages in the darkness. Because when we popped on 24 hours ago, he was almost 40 miles behind the leaders. I think he was like 36 miles behind the leaders. He is seven, seven miles behind Killian Korth. And I'm just going to own it again right now. I think it's important to demonstrate my humanity and all this. When we were talking about Michael McKnight yesterday, I did not believe that what where he's at right now would have been possible. This has definitely shocked me. I thought that given what Killian looked like, what Michael McKnight looked like, what Eliza looked like, I just didn't think he was going to make up this much ground. But this is a, yet another thing I am personally learning in this 200-mile game you are never down for the count. You are almost never down for the count. Absolutely. One thing I'm so curious to see, I mean, I'm sure uh, at the conclusion of this race, our friend Aid Station Fireball will have some interesting statistics about uh, Michael McKnight's splits because I'm really curious to see how they compare yep. to uh, some of the past years in terms of uh, total time over the second half of this course. I think it's, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a barn burner. Brett, KP Kelly in the chat says he thought that you were Jason Lee from My Name is Earl for a second. I think that's a huge compliment. Hey, I'll take it. I actually, I'm not even familiar, but if you think that's a huge compliment, I'm going to believe you. Oh, yeah. Here, I'll, I'll pull him up. Right on. Also, just, just so ev everyone who thinks, like, you know, mega super trail ultra marathon is a niche sport. It is not. Finn and I had the pleasure of actually going on a run this morning with the 2022 Women's New York City Marathon no champion. No big deal. Uh, Sharon Lochetti. And she knew about Cocodona. She knew about the Cocodona 250 and this race. And I mean, she definitely had some questions like, does it work like a normal race? And I was like, yeah, it's the same as what you do. Everyone lines up. They say, ready, set, go. First one to cross the finish line wins. And she was absolutely blown away by how just impressive of a feat everyone uh, who is out here was about to accomplish. So we'll have to let the runners know at some point that they got props from the New York City Marathon champion. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, it was it was pretty cool. I, mean, I guess that's how Flagstaff works. <laughs> Should we tell the, the Eda Nielsen story? <laughs> Yesterday when we got back from our run, we're pulling up to our Airbnb, pulling up into the driveway, and, and this couple is walking down the street. And Finn, drive, Finn and I drive by, and Finn looks over, and he's like, I think that's Eden Nilsson. We're like, but she was just at Canyons. We're like, well, she's, like, yeah, she's walking like she just ran Canyons. Um, and lo and behold, it was Eden Nilsson just walking down the street in front of the Airbnb studio. So get out of the car. And I'm like, hey, congratulations <laughs> on your Canyons 100K win. And even in a town like Flagstaff where there are many, many elite runners, she was still even shocked to hear someone just get out of a car and congratulate them on their race. But it was pretty funny. You never know who you're going to run into here. 
Brett Ben Cook in the chat says flu game. I think he's referencing Michael McKnight's comeback here from forgetting those salt hundred percent salt tabs. This is a hundred percent a Cocodona flu game. This is a Cocodona flu game. For sure. That's yeah. There's that's the only that's pretty much the best way to like if you were like sum it up, like spark notes, Michael McKnight's race so far, he'd be like flu game. Let's see, Matt Matt is has stepped away for a moment and I am scared to press any of the buttons. And yeah. Yeah, maybe I could press a button. I'll let me I'll take a look at the buttons. <laughs> While Brett is going over our tech, just a couple things that have stood out to me since Brett and I were last on the broadcast at six PM Pacific yesterday, which was eighteen hours ago. There, of course, has been significant movement in this race, but still seeing pretty relative continuity, especially with the top three females in this race. There, have, you know, there's still three women in the top ten right now. Um, one thing that I think is a fun storyline: Mike Gronwegen and Mika Thuz are appear to still be working together, or you know, within a half mile of each other, and that was something fun that Brett and I got to see at various aid stations yesterday is just the the camaraderie between Mike and Mika and you know the camaraderie between other runners in this race it's just it's one of those things where you know you realize that in a 250 mile race you can't have that competitive energy from start to finish there's times to turn it on there's probably a lot more times to turn it off and and to value other mindsets and uh yeah those two are on the track, it appears like they're both at 187.7 right now. So great to yeah, see them. So it looks together. like we've got Josh uh, on the drone about to come into the Munns Park aid station here. So he will be third male runner, third overall. So we. Our lead runners are nearing that 200-mile mark. They finally get to get out of the 100. How do you think it feels? Uh, and none of us know. Um, but it's like it's interesting to think about. Like You hit the 200-mile mark. Yeah, does it's it iconic. Does boost? it feel good that you only have 50 miles to go, or does it feel like I've still got 50 miles to go? Yeah, I think for someone like Josh Perry, who's done a 2,600-mile trail. Probably feels pretty who's good. Who's done an 800-mile trail. He's like, wow, this is... I'm going down in distance. Yeah, I guess depending on experience level, you might be smelling the finish line at some point. At that point, some others might be smelling something else. You're getting initial whiffs of the barn right now? Perhaps. Like, I know 50 miles to go, I certainly would not. I will say, I'm not too into the woo woo juju stuff, but we're based here in Flagstaff right now and I can totally sense and feel the energy of the race getting closer and uh, yeah it's just super cool I think that might just be the grim leafer flavored liquid death <laughs> that you have in front of you <laughs> I'm double fisting severed lime and grim leafer right now and life could not be better so you know I'm looking at the the map right now and uh Killian Korth is actually, um, he's very close to the Flagstaff Airport, which is kind of cool. Like, as the crow flies, he's very close to us right now. Yeah, it, it wouldn't take that much time to drive out and y yell at him, <laughs> I guess. So, Matt, are we seeing uh, runners make their way into the Munns Park? Yep. Yeah, so this drone is. shot uh, is them working their way to Munns Park. They're going to be coming down this road. They'll make a left-hand turn that leads them into kind of the parking lot that the aid station is in. Is um, this Josh, and, Perry, and Eliza, or Josh and a pacer, and Eliza's not in this shot? Because on, on the tracker, they're very close to each other, but I don't know if they're that close. Yeah, it's been hard to tell on the drone shot. We did see these two leave yeah. uh, pretty close together at Schnebly. That looks like an Eliza LaPierre-esque power walk for the person in front, just based on what we were seeing on the stream yesterday. 
Are we watching in real time Eliza putting a move on someone? <laughs> First documented move in 200-plus mile racing history caught live on, on stream. DRS engaged. Overtake available for our F1 fans in the chat. Ben Cook, I am most most definitely feeling the Sedona Vortex too, and give me a side of Camp Verde while we're at it. Yeah, that's Josh and a pacer. Josh I thought that was right because I th I thought that these two left uh, Schnebly together, um, and I, we missed Eliza leaving Schnebly, but uh, it was reported that she left just a couple minutes behind. Schnebly. Uh, <laughs> so Schnebly. Schnebly. Ned Schnebly. Ned Schne <laughs> Name that movie. Well, I think Ned some Schneebly. some people do pronounce it Schneeb Schneebly. Hello, and is this is this Mister Schneebly? <laughs> uh, yeah, man. <laughs> All right, we knocked out a great F1 reference early. Knocked out a great, great movie. Like not even a quote, just a movie character just a good movie early. Character. And I think we might have actually seen Schneebly go by in the school bus. <laughs> That's a hint. I want to throw this to folks in the chat who, you know, a lot of you have been following this from start to finish. Brett and I have been talking these last two and a half, three days about what we're learning in this 200 mile distance and what's exciting us about this race. For those of you in the chat, what have been the most interesting developments in this race? What has excited you about this event? Yeah, what are your impressions? Especially for those of you that have been, you know, watching this from start to finish. And I guess even to, to follow up on that question, who in the chat is watching the Cocodona live stream, you know, for the first year. Um, I, I've never watched it this intently. You know, I popped on, you know, maybe once a day last year, um, very minimally the first year. But this is the first year where I've been, like, paying attention to it. And I I won't ever be able to, to do anything but pay close attention to this race ever <laughs> again. I've was curious to see if over the course of these few days if my investment level in this race would go up and it absolutely has yeah yep likewise i i i, I call myself a card carrying member of the 200 mile fan club now yes yes absolutely yeah so let us know in the chat you know what are some of your biggest takeaways so far um of this race if you've been watching it for the first time um i believe what we have drone footage of right now is josh perry and pacer making their way into the munns park aid station heading over to the runner guide munns park aid station mile 191.7 Ooh, they've got a they've got a good menu they've got blts tomato soup eggs and tofu wow that's a nice spread I would 100% be going for a BLT and dunking it in some tomato soup. Lindsay McDonald in the chat says, this is the closest race we've had in all three years of Cocodona so far. I love that. Yeah. And I I think that is a sign of things to come for future Cocodonas. Yep. Yeah, I'm actually... I am gonna I'm gonna gather an Andrew Glaze update. I'm gonna some of the, the, the names that I've been curious about over the course of this race I'm gonna just check up on and see what's going on. Andrew Glaze's tracker is showing him at mile one forty one. Brett, you gotta look at this overview video here. They got they're rolling out Josh Perry's legs. That's awesome. I would probably be screaming if someone was rolling my legs 190 miles in. I got to say, this is this is one thing, you know, we, we had been talking yesterday about learnings. For me, just seeing the intricacies of these aid station crews is so cool. 100%. And it looks like we may have some uh, Mike McKnight footage here. And the red bucket hat. 
Love get, it. We should yeah. be able to have some audio from, uh, from on course. I'm not sure if you guys can hear Ben Light, uh, Mike's pacer yep. out there. Hey, Ben, I don't know if you can hear us, but whatever you said at the beginning of yesterday is clearly working for Mike. <laughs> I don't. I am not taking any credit for anything. Well, we'll still continue to give you some credit for something. This is, I mean, red bucket hat power. This is this is. I think we're witnessing a fashion statement right here. This is a new fashion statement in ultra running, in addition to the resurrection. Well, the uh, live chat, who has dubbed him the Dark McKnight, yes, uh, has also said he's. Uh, you know, Tiger Woods used to sport red on Sunday. Uh, uh, at yeah. the Masters, this is you know Mike McKnight breaking out the red. It's time to close out the show, uh, yep. Tiger Woods style here. Tiger's winning percentage when he was wearing red on Sunday pretty high. Yeah, kind I'm of in a way Tiger calling your shot uh, with your fashion statement with the red. I love it. Mike's moving so strong. We're, we'll uh, check back in with uh, Mike and uh, Ben in a little bit. For the meantime, we're going to have our eyes on the Go overhead get it, Mike. shot of uh, our third place runner, Mr. Josh Perry. You know what if what if we are in fact you know what if we what if Mike McKnight actually just has been pacing this thing correctly the whole time? Everyone's like, oh, it was a trash first day. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was a really smart move. And, you know, we did both listen to that Everyday Ultra podcast with, with him and Joe, and he did say, like, this is the year where I no longer care about the leaderboard. I no longer care about the people around me in the race. I'm going to run what I think is is a is a smart way. And I do know that he had those, you know, logistical nutrition hiccups early on, but I still wonder, even independent of those, if – um it wasn't going to be a, a scenario where he was so preoccupied with being out front and, you know, maintaining this reputation of like leading a 200 mile race from start to finish. Yeah. And while we, uh, while we keep our eyes peeled on, uh, our monitors here at Josh and he continues to take a minute, we're going to send it over to, uh, we've got the tiger cam of Jeff Garmeyer, uh, tuning in. Looks like he's got, um, maybe some better coverage, so we're going to send it over to Jeff. Jeff, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. I mean, I haven't slept very much, and so I'm seeing a lot of stuff, but that's pretty cool. It's a lot can healthier you... than drugs, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Can, can you tell us what's the uh, craziest thing you've seen out there, whether it's real or not real at this point? Uh, Zach, what did I see last night? You saw a very large pirate ship. A very large pirate ship was probably the weirdest thing. What? And then chicken feet sticking out of the ground. That was pretty strange. <laughs> Joe, I got to say, you look pretty damn good for this stage of the race. And uh, this is kind of a obscure reference, but just with the video angle, I'm getting flashbacks to Joey Camp's PCT 2015 YouTube videos right now. <laughs> okay. Jeff, where are you at uh, along the uh, course right now, just so that we can update? I'm, I'm basically at Schnebly, Schneebly, Schnobly. Ned Schneebly. The schnozberries taste like schnozberries. Uh, yeah, I'm schnozzing it up. Yeah. I love it. So how much have you slept at this point? I know that you've said not much, and what is your sleep strategy going forward? Are you just going to go as long as you can uh, and take a few dirt naps, or are you uh, planning some – uh, sleep breaks here. So I've done 43 minutes to right now, and I'm going to try to not really sleep much more. So we'll see. I don't know. That's part of the fun, just to see if you can actually do that or not. What a push. I Joe, love it. It, Joe, if you had to describe Jeff. this year's, Jeff, if you had to describe this year's Coca Dona in one word, what would it be so far? Man. I'd say sexy. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Jeff, we're going to check back in with you in just a little bit. We got our next runners coming into uh, Munns Park here. Uh, so we'll send it back to you a little bit later, Jeff. Thanks for uh, checking in. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. There you heard from the legend himself. And it looks like this is Mike McKnight. 
coming in is easy to spot in the uh, all red. Does that mean he's made the pass on uh, on Eliza? Let's see. Uh, the tracker, yes, the tracker has sh shows a pass. Um, let me see what the updates are. Well, Eliza's was 13 minutes ago. Michael McKnight's was immediate. Um, it'll be really close to see. We might see another pass in real time. I mean, I, this is probably an obvious answer, but like if Michael McKnight is on one of the F1 teams, I feel like the only answer is Ferrari. Oh, I mean, with that red. Yep. He's definitely on team Ferrari. Yep. Yeah, this is pretty amazing. Just the, the spring that he has in his stride still at this point in the race dude can you imagine like and it could be as soon as next year but let's just say two or three years from now we get to a point in live stream technology where we can like basically check in with runners at will and there's just great service along the course and um we don't have to guess any longer it can be like oh let's just go right to mike he's got his he's got his iphone ready like let's see how they're feeling Th this is so cool about this distance yeah, that would be amazing from a fan standpoint. From a runner standpoint, I can see that being obnoxious. <laughs> oh my gosh. There would be so many times where I would be like, I pray to God I'm not mic'd up right now. Because <laughs> I would just be out there like swearing in the woods. Yeah, I think in some cases you probably want to focus and not have the camera turned on you. But maybe there are some scenarios where it's, it's good to get out of your head for a little bit and chat with civilization absolutely there's been a little bit of talk in the chatter is there a scenario where jeff browning's the first one to cross the finish line because he would have to go probably a hair like 24 25 hours is there a there's a scenario maybe it, it could be close yeah if we had a say a 74 hour finish in the 250 what time and a 24-hour finish in the uh, 125, that would put them that would put them together. together. So, like, you could flex from there, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think a 24-hour, 125-mile finish on this course is probably a tall ask. But, but not impossible. Not though. impossible, but what would that be for 100 miles? You know, you're talking... 25 percent more so four-fifths of 24 yeah, hours that's a pretty fast hundred mile split yeah you know and the fastest uh split that has ever been had on the back hundred um which again already run 150 miles but it was yeah. 29 hours okay well i'm i'm here for i'm here for it i'm though. here for it i'm yeah i think aid station fireball and i are ready to take bets on this one <laughs> uh who finishes first the first the first finisher of Coca Dona 250 or the first finisher of the 125? Ooh, so good. Matt, maybe we can repost this because I think it's hilarious. Browning and Mortimer's cow says, People in here talking about how they're jealous that these runners get the week off from work as if they aren't in this chat doing absolutely nothing while at work. <laughs> <laughs> at Coca Dona, everyone's a winner. And for those in the chat asking me to, uh, Switch to the Munns Park feeds. I will uh, switch to those as soon as we get those back. Uh, looks like we have Josh Perry coming out, and we will circle back. It sounds like we may have missed Eliza LaPierre coming in uh, to the uh, aid station, um, but we will double-check on that. It seems like based on the tracking locations, that would have to be the case, um, is that we... Uh, we maybe missed her on the drone during a battery swap or uh, something of that nature. She's still on her way towards Munns Park. Yeah, but her uh, tracker, I don't think... It's been think 17 is... minutes. Yeah, and she was only eight-tenths of a mile out, I think. Has, did Michael McKnight get into the aid station? Uh, yeah, he's in the aid he's station. He's in it right now, so... Okay, it could be imminent. UTMB tracking buzzword. I love... I cannot wait to get to the point in American live stream coverage where we get the chance to use 
the word imminent and see the word imminent appear on aid station arrival? I, I, my knee jerk reaction, my knee jerk reaction is I hate it because so it looks like Mike McKnight is coming into the aid station as we speak. This the okay. overhead. So it might be just a m- minute or two. Well, before or she's there. Or she's there. And yeah. we missed her, and we'll we'll see her right now. Yeah, there's been so many times on the UTMB tracking when the runner says imminent when they've already, in fact, gone into the aid station, left the aid station, and then they'll update at the next aid station. So We'll see if Troy stands, can see <laughs> Eliza LaPierre in the aid station or not. I don't know if this is, this has probably already been talked about on the live stream, but I think it. Oh, we'll bring it up again because we haven't talked about it yet, Brett, you and I. These people are taking an entire week. A lot of these people are taking an entire week off from work to do this race. They are taking out vacation time to go run 250 miles. That's amazing. Yeah, you take a vacation to uh, do something you love. Yeah, and like, it looks sure like we did miss but... Eliza, and she's heading out right now. And that looks like Jason Coop yeah. uh, is her pacer. That yep. would appear who it is. So we'll follow Eliza out here. This is our uh, female leader. Uh, here at the Cogadona 250, and, and she's in fourth overall. Not in the lead by a lot, though. Mika Thews is one mile back. And then Sarah Ostazewski is not terribly far back either. Sarah I think is the- five miles back from Mika, six from Eliza, but and she hasn't had a, a ping in 56 minutes. And those are, Martin, maybe those are 6th, 7th, and 8th overall. Yeah, an hour and two minutes since Sarah's been oh, having okay. some. okay, so that, uh, that gap's much smaller yeah. probably, unless she's think, taking a nap. I think when I checked earlier, um, they were all, all three of them were within three miles of each other. Oh, man, that's so cool. I love racing. <laughs> Coop Looks like Eliza's pacing. jogging. Eliza's racing. Picking it up. Who here it, that's watching the chat will be racing Cocodona in the next one to two years after watching this coverage? Is entry for the 2024 donor 400 open yet? No, I don't think it's open yet. We were hoping to uh, to get it open during the live stream, but uh, obviously uh, all of the people involved in trying to get that set up have been quite busy. Uh, it's true. It's true. <laughs> with uh, with getting these coordinated, but I would say we're gonna try to get that registration open pretty quickly uh, after the race. So if you can bottle your excitement and keep it just for you know a week or two, yeah, keep uh, the fire then you stoked. Can, then you can. Uh, Press register on Ultra Sign Up and commit to the Cocodona 250, the Sedona Canyons 125, or the Eldon Crest 36, which we'll see a little bit later on. Friday, uh, Friday morning. Yeah, Friday morning. Brett, you were originally going to do that race and have since <laughs> said you you were uh, you're okay. I want to. Uh, yeah, no, I I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> sure I would be biting off more than I can chew by doing all of this commentating and the amount of running we've already done. I think to th- try and throw myself into a 36 on Friday and then <laughs> immediately come back in the booth. You know. <laughs> yeah. Hard pass. <laughs> Maybe next year. What would be the tentative 2024 dates, Matt? Probably like this time next year. Tentatively. Thank you so much for that wisdom, Brett. Yeah, got you. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure. Couch to Cocodona. <laughs> Let's see it. Well, actually, couch Matt, Cadona. <laughs> Matt, I actually I don't think I've ever asked you this. Why did you pick the first week of May? What's the significance there versus like late earlier in the spring, in the fall? Climates. Yeah, this is this you, is it's a short window. It's a very very short window. If you go much earlier, you're guarant- almost guaranteed to have snow, snow in the high countries. Um, if you go much later, you're going to be Heat. so insanely hot during that. Like we thought the inaugural year was hot, it would be 
infinitely hotter in some yeah. of these low lying valley areas. Um, so the window is just super short for when you can kind of balance those two to where it's like, okay, we can keep the highs, uh, in the, uh, Sonoran desert in the low to mid eighties <laughs> and we can keep the, uh, lows, you know, above freezing and not have a bunch of snow. Um, it's just, yeah, it's a short, uh, it's a short window. So I think that that's a big reason why, I mean, Mount Eldon had like a lot of snow on it still like two weeks ago. Um, yep. and it's been, you know, melting off since, but you know, even just two weeks prior, um, you know, you would have had snow there and Mingus crown King has gotten snow in, uh, late March before. Um, so yeah. Wow. Okay. Makes yeah. sense. Makes sense. There's, there's a lot of kind of mountain races out there that do have a very small window that even then, you know, might not be, you know, the most ideal, but there's no such thing as that. And I think that's something that a lot of, you know, a lot of people maybe from not within the area yeah, wouldn't understand without, you know, being there and seeing it like the Pine to Palm 100, you know, the finishes national area. It's the same way. Like it's literally a one to two week window where the race works um, any earlier. It's just like way too hot, too much risk of wildfire yep. uh, smoke earlier than that. There's too much snow later than the day you run into too high of a chance of winter weather because the second half of that course stays up over 6,000 feet and it's all dirt roads. You know, you can't have aid, <coughs> crew, emergency personnel available to get to every part of the course. Um, you know, that's, that's a huge liability issue. So I totally understand why, you know, I'm sure there's, there's a ton of thought about when is this race going to happen and, yeah, kind of like Matt had said, that the window is very small. Brett, I have a question for you and Matt. John McKay in the chat says we should have Cocodona 250 winter and summer editions, and it makes me wonder, what are some races either in the Aravipa catalog or across our sport that you would like to see happen twice a year in two different seasons, like spring and fall, winter, summer? Like the Spine does this over in Europe. There's like a Spine Challenger race, I think, in January, and I believe in June as well. Like, how about, like, Black Canyon in the fall, Black Canyon in the spring, something like that? Would that even be that different? I mean, it depends how late into the fall you go. But if you're talking, like, October or September, it's going to be... It's really hot. So hot, like, dangerously hot. Like, most of the summer, or during the summer, most of our races that are in the greater Phoenix area are, are at night. Yeah. It looks like we lost that um, drone shot there. We'll work on getting that back. Oh, that was a quick, quick view of the sweeps. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they are uh, getting ready to pack up the Mingus Mountain Aid Station. Runners have 25 more minutes to, uh, to exit there. But I did get report. It sounds like uh, Mike McKnight's trying to make quick work of this Munns Park Aid Station. Uh, he's trying to eat up every second he can here, see yeah. if he can uh, do something magical. He's like, I'll have a BLT, except hold the bread, hold the L, hold the T. That was a low-carb joke. <laughs> <laughs> Brett, I think this is a good question to address. Josh Cartwright says, I can't imagine anyone in the top 10 is not doing 100-plus mile weeks. I'm assuming he's saying in training. But we know that that's not the case, right? Common, common fallacy. Common um, fallacy. Yeah, it's it's actually pretty amazing how specific some of the training runs do. It's like one individual run. Like, sure, that they might have a week or two weeks where they might accidentally hit over a hundred miles simply because they have a fifty or sixty mile long training run plan. But most of the athletes in the top ten are not consistently doing over a hundred plus mile weeks, especially. For a race like this where you're training for, you know, essentially such a slow pace, the time on feet that they would be spending, uh, there's going to be a point of diminishing return. You have to pay attention to the recovery, you know. Yep. They they are still all human after all. They're doing amazing things. I'm only human. Yeah, after all. <laughs> they, you know, they recovery is one of the biggest challenges of a, a large training block for an endurance race like this. Um, so you have to find out where your sweet spot is with how much volume can I handle 
how much volume can I handle and actually get a positive training stimulus? Oftentimes more people can handle more volume than they should actually be doing. Um, and they don't really realize that, you know, they're doing a lot of their training pretty tired. Yep. Um, so it's, it's actually, it's super interesting how training for even something like an elite hundred K or a more runnable hundred mile, that's put much more of a strain on the just like upper aerobic system you might see those runners at the top of those fields averaging higher miles per week on average than some of the top runners in this race and that's not just due to lack of training that's just a different specificity because it's almost like a different event yeah um, bro we, we just got 50 bucks for the blimp jeffrey Otto. 50 bones for the blimp yeah, Jeff's getting a VIP da, 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 blimp da, da, da. ride. We'll be sending you your ticket for the blimp ride. But yeah, Brett, all great, all excellent points. Um, and it looks like Mike McKnight is uh, heading out of the Munns Park Aid Station. He's doing already good stuff, stopping. Okay, and now he's gone. And running, running with a lot of purpose out of this aid station. Are they serving mincemeat at that aid station? Because that's what Michael McKnight made of that stop. That's what Mike McKnight's serving up. They're changing the menu now. <clears throat> so, Finn, if you are where Michael McKnight is in the race, which is 191 miles, and as you said yesterday, you would probably try and fuel Cocodona off of purely – chicken McNuggets. Um, <laughs> at this point, you've consumed roughly... Yeah, how many? Uh, like f roughly 500 nuggets if we're sticking to the 300 calorie an hour rule. How do you feel about that number? 500 nuggets. Intimidated and sad. Like, what are your insides like <laughs> if you have 500... <laughs> McNuggets. Oh, do we have a an updated ping on Sarah Sarah O's tracker? Ryan Nato says yes. he can donate a satisfy shirt towards the blimp fund. That should get you like halfway there. That's true. And just for those wondering, um our our top end goal for the blimp fund is forty million dollars. <laughs> That's how we can guarantee we will be able to build well, not we. We will have a blimp company. We'll be able to build us the Air Revipa, a.k.a. Blimp Biscuit, so that way Air Revipa can just use it for all their races. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, yeah, I mean, so much of what I learn about these races, you know, I'm talking a little bit about training and volume, the longer the race, the more it becomes mind power, sheer will. Yep. Like the motivation levels are just through the roof. And it looks like we do also have our second place female Mika Thews and our fifth place male Mike Gronenwagen, uh both in the aid station uh, at Munns Park as well. So Mike Versteeg made, again, qu or Mike McKnight, rather, uh, made quick work of that aid station, and it looks like he's probably going to he's gonna try to start walking people down in the last uh, 58 miles I here. I think he's going to be running people down. He, We got a lot of Mikes and Michaels and Mikas <laughs> up in the lead. Um, one thing that's, I mean, super cool to see, Mika Thews and Mike Gronwagen, They've been running together for upwards of 150 miles now. Yeah. What a team. Brett, to your point earlier about the mental component in these later stage 200 milers, M Mike McKnight has done many of these at this point, and he's already probably received, quote unquote, permission from his central governor to run certain steps and, and to push hard and yeah his his central governor it's you know it's like a classic <laughs> dial except it can actually just go all the way around <laughs> you just keep going 
it's it's your stereotypical overprotective parent. Okay, you can go outside for a little bit. <laughs> Matt, are, what uh, drone are we looking at now? Are we in Sedona? <laughs> Sedona, and then... 28 is Nick Peterson, who we just saw. Where are we looking at? The Sedona aid station. At the Sedona aid station there. Oh, this, this is not a drone. This is just a person. I'm only human. Right on. I want to see if I can pull up some stuff on Nick Peterson in the questionnaire here. Yeah, probably later, a little bit later on throughout the course of our six-hour shift in this broadcast. Uh, Finn and I will be doing a, a full uh, Flota tasting as well. We were fortunate <laughs> enough to have a, a flat of Flota. Ha, a flat because it's it is flat uh flat of flota dropped off at the studio um i did do a tasting last night uh it, but it, it was room temp i've been chilling a couple cans of flota so maybe in another hour they will be to temp um i actually didn't get word about what the ideal you know drinking temperature is for flota so we're just going with the standard like 38 or 40 or whatever a fridge is um, but we'll get some nice glasses, pour some Flota. Can't wait. Give a review. Can't wait. Love that hat. I did. I did pound a Flota before my run today. I did too, and it was. It actually worked. It it worked. It worked. Brett, a little color commentary on Nick Peterson, who we saw eating a moment ago in the Sedona aid station. He said that he watched a Carrie Ward YouTube video about the Moab 240 back in 2018. And that quote unquote opened the world of 200s to him. And ever since then, he was set on getting to the start line of one of these adventures. So, the takeaway for me there is folks, there is such a long tail effect to creating content. You never know who you're going to impact. And in Nick's case, Carrie Ward made a film and he's out here now. Yeah, Carrie Ward, I think he has inspired uh, a number of people to, to come in. Uh, do this race always a big ball of energy when we saw him uh on the inaugural cocodono live stream so shout out to uh <coughs> carrie ward who's done a number of 200s including including cocodona so yeah shout out to uh shout out to carrie and nick also said that despite potential heat i would like to be able to approach sedona during daylight for the views he he met that goal yeah that's definitely something i would be thinking about it's like at what what, what parts of the course am I going to be going through during the daytime, during the nighttime? Yep. Sedona is definitely one of the spots I would I would love to be going through during the day. Me too. Matt, who's your favorite? What's your favorite running YouTube channel or person to follow and why? Isn't the answer Aravipa? Besides Aravipa. <laughs> I have to ask a content creator who they who 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 does the, who does the content creator get inspiration from? Mountain Outpost. Who do I get inspiration from? Yeah, like on YouTube. Yeah, Sidious Mag would be the like the easiest answer. Um, I do love that answer. Coming from a road and track background, like uh, I obviously enjoy the content uh, uh, category of uh, track content, but I think that they're just doing things in such a unique and modern way um, with a lot of unique personalities that I think it's uh, it's almost industry standard in my opinion. How about you, Brett? I was, I was just thinking, yeah, trail. But yeah, if there was one that's like influenced my like, you know, just excitement about the sport of running the most, uh, Sidious Mag is one of, one of my favorites for sure. Free Trail has done a really fun job with um, – I love free trail fantasy. I'm horrible at it. I suck at it. Like there's in the on the list of things I'm good at, free trail fantasy is <laughs> is not on that list. Um, but it's fun and it it I have more investment in races that I normally would not have paid attention to. Yeah. Um, because I just start I start looking up the entry list, I start learning some of the stories and then all of a sudden I'm like, well, I have to pay attention to the race because I want to see if my picks did good. How about you? Mine's a little bit outside the world of running. I really enjoy the pro triathlon vlogs on YouTube. So I think the first one that I 
got into was Lionel Sanders back in the day, and I watch his stuff pretty religiously, and I just think that that's like the culture of content and tries, so I, I appreciate that. Same thing with Heather Jackson. I actually, I was so stoked to see Heather Jackson get into Ultras because I had been following her YouTube channel for like three years. Um, and I know there's a lot of great vloggers in the running space. You know, we've talked about Jamil's videos back in the day, but I wish more more runners did it. Like, I would love to watch Mike McKnight's vlogs in the lead up to Cocodona. I would love to watch Sarah O's vlogs in the lead up to this race. I, I just love the behind the scenes stuff. You know, a channel, um, it's a newer one that I've actually been really enjoying is uh, the Conversational Pace YouTube channel. They have some of the most high quality, in depth trail shoe reviews. Um, it doesn't seem like there's too many trail <laughs> shoe review channels out there that are dedicated to trail where, you know, they have a host and a co host and they each live in two different areas of the U.S. They take the shoes, run at least 100 miles over on their respective trails, and then they come back and they have a conversation about it. Learn a lot about shoes watching that channel. I'm going to have to go check out Conversational Pace. I've never heard of this thing, but uh, yeah. You said it's Conversational Pace? Conversational Pace. It's a killer name. It's like a double entendre. It's like three things about one thing. Yeah, Jeremy Dalton, it's like, is it Cool Whip or is it Cool Whip? I don't know. <laughs> Say cool. Say whip. <laughs> Say, Say cool, cool whip. whip. Cool whip. Whip. The aid station that we are looking at is Munns Park. And that is at mile 191. <laughs> Brett, Tom Abbott says, my computer has suddenly started overheating. Is it the immense knowledge being dropped right now? Damn straight. Yeah, I've been told that at times I can overheat computers. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron Shimon says, Hornick, best sarcasm in the game. Agreed. I guess, I guess I'll take that as a compliment, I think. I think that's probably a good one to have, maybe. Matt Myers is saying, yeah, turn that into a I podcast. You, you know, you're right, Matt. We have had a couple people tell me that I should just uh, put the audio from the shoe reviews up on, you know, Spotify. And yeah, I might, I may have to do that. I, I don't know anything about Spotify, but fortunately, the guy sitting next to me, Finn Melanson, he knows a lot about Spotify, so maybe he can help me out there. Love making a good Spotify playlist. <laughs> oh, gosh. I can't even have a Spotify playlist of just shoe review after <laughs> shoe review. I love shoes. I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> so I've checked out a little bit of Jeff Pelletier stuff. I've heard great things. If you were to start with a single video, like an intro video, the best video he's ever made, what would it be and why? Oh, TJ, I agree. I think Gary Robbins would be awesome with the vlogs. I loved how they incorporated that into Ethan Newberry's film to some extent. Mm -hmm. Nordo 001. I've been working on uh, trying to get review units of the Norda uh, 001 model. Uh, 002 is on its way out. It's a fascinating one as well. Um, you know, just kind of like a slightly thinner... Uh, geared towards faster technical running uh, version of the 001. Looks like we've got Mika Thuse uh, leaving the leaving Mums Park solo? aid station here. Like with without without Mike uh, Grown Wigan. It appears that way. It's they occasionally they've been uh, separated by a little bit, but one will kind of leave and the other will catch up. But um, we'll see if they kind of regroup just up the trail. Um, but yeah, the tracker hasn't quite updated, but we obviously have eyes on her leaving the aid station here. Just taking, just looking at Mika's kind of body language headed out of the aid station. There definitely still appears to be a lot of like purpose in that stride. Um, positive forward momentum, I would say, you know, we're still running. Brett, I think in the Discord, Aid Station Fireball has some stats for you. Oh, boy, I love me some Aid Station Fireball stats. 
let's see, first to fifth place gap in 2021 to four, at Fort Tuthill was 10 hours. Last year it was 15 hours. Prediction is that it will be a much tighter gap this year. That'll be interesting. Fort Tuthill is at mile 211. So that will, I guess that'll probably be coming up before, uh, you know, while we're still talking about this race. Oh the my leaders gosh. for sure. That'll be fascinating to keep tabs on. Um, what else? What if we could retroactively convert Anton Krupichka's written blogs into vlogs? Like if he just grew up in this era instead of the late 2000s, early 2010s. Can, can we just ask? Like, can't you just use AI to yeah, do can't that now? Chat GPT, just like do that or they tell can. me how to do it. Like, wait, let's talk about this. You could say, can you read Anton Krupichka's blogs? And well, no, I think there's talking. video. I think there's like video like AIs Hologram now. Anton? Well, yeah, they can. Yeah, they could definitely go in the video route. That you part. know, and they just me, you you copy and paste the uh, blog. Yeah, and it spits out a a vlog. It I could probably even, it, it could probably even read it in his voice. Which that's that's, that's a little amazing. terrifying. That's amazing. But actually, come to think of it. Maybe I don't want it to be read in his voice. Maybe I want it to be read in, like, Morgan Freeman's <laughs> voice. <laughs> like, can we just take all the classic blogs out there and just get them r- read by, like, Morgan Freeman or, um, oh, who who does um, Planet Earth? Um, oh. Uh, sir, he's been knighted. The oh, chat like will help me out. Ian oh. McClellan? No. Who's, narr- who's the narrator of Planet Earth? Come on, people. Uh, I, I know I could look it up right now, but... <laughs> HAW, yeah. Jeremy Irons, David Attenborough. David Attenborough, Sir David Attenborough. That's who it is. I would also thank you, love thank you, thank Michael you, Michael Caine. He'd be like, "I'll do it." <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some <laughs> blogs that would read way better for them. Somebody has said Eliza is off course. I'm doing a. Let's do a check. I. I haven't looked yet, but I nah. find it hard to believe she wouldn't that she's be, off course with well, Coop. It does look like Josh Perry could potentially be off course. Josh Perry is actually like on a trail. His Eliza's thing, tracker is so far off. Like she couldn't even have gotten that far off course from her previous it. ping. Where, so I chalking that up to oh, tech error. Yeah. For sure. She would have had to, she would have had to have hitched a ride from a blimp. Oh, James Earl Jones would be so good. Oh, to uh, narrate some 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 Tony blogs. Yeah, yeah, that would be pretty good. And then there's some ones that I would just want to read, like have read. That would be fun. Like, like give me like give me Owen Wilson for 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 a blog. Give me like Matthew McConaughey. Wow. <laughs> He's like. And then I hit 200 miles for that week. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Are we looking at Mike Groen Wigan on the drone right now? Making our way out of the aid station? Yeah. Oh, Shannon Sharp would be so good. I believe him. so. Yeah. Uh, that looks like his hair. He's yeah. changed he's changed uh, shirts and he's changed clothes outfits so much so it's hard to times. It's hard but, to identify, but that I mean, appears to be him. Throw throw back to the Wet Bandits singlet on day one. That was, in, that was so cool. Matt, if you have a chat GPT account, could we ask you to write a prompt that creates a training plan for the Cocodona 250 race? That oh, I have, should take 16 weeks. I have chat GPT up <laughs> right, right let's now. Let's do it. So I am running the Cocodona 250 mile race in... 12 weeks i am an inexperienced runner 
spelled inexperienced wrong. Who averages, what should my average be, miles per week? 20? 30? 40. 40. Miles per week. Can you make me a training plan? I'm literally putting myself out of business right now. And we are going to have eyes on Sarah O. Uh, she is in the Munns Park Aid Station. So we should uh, have eyes on here, her in just a minute. She's, uh, she's running really strong right now. Um, she's not that far, depending on how long she spins in the aid station here, not that far behind, um, behind Mika now. And as the race gets closer and closer to Flagstaff, uh, Sarah is going to yes. feel more and more at home on these trails. She's going to be picking up Rory Moynihan at some point, I believe, as a pacer. Uh, he's, you know, he's going to be no nonsense and keeping her, keeping her moving forward. So. Yeah, this is exciting. This is a very close race. All right, ChatGPT has given me my Cocodona 250 12-week training plan. And I, I, I said inexperienced runner who averages 40 miles a week. That doesn't mean if you run 40 miles a week, you're an inexper inexperienced runner. I have inexperience in regards to the 250-mile race distance. First off, it said, congratulations on taking on the challenge of the Cocodona 250-mile race. Given the distance in your current mileage, it's important you gradually build up your endurance while also taking care to avoid injury. Here's a basic 12-week training plan that can help you prepare for the race. It actually it only, it, it's, I'm supposed to just do weeks one through four, so it's the same thing four times, and then weeks five through eight, it changes, and then weeks nine through 12. Um, week one through four, it says Monday rest day. Tuesday, four miles easy. Wednesday, six miles with hills. Thursday, four miles easy. Friday, eight miles with hills. Saturday, six miles easy. Sunday, 12 miles. I do that for four weeks, and then I increase it a little bit for four more weeks. I increase it. I have My longest run is 20 miles, and I add some hills. Apparently, according to ChatGPT, that's all I need to do. All I have to do is four 20-mile long runs, and I'm good. Do, I mean, you, tend, do you tend to agree, disagree? I, I don't think it's quite specific enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> TJ says the worst 16 week training I've ever seen. You know, is here's it? the thing, though, Brett. I think that you should take the challenge on next year. Should you I? Should just, have a, you should have a training plan chat prescribed GPT by chat GPT. <laughs> you should document uh, the entire series uh, of buildup, and then you should do the race. Oh, I see some. Speed. Oh man, we just saw a guy run out of that aid station tent in Speedlands. The GS Tams. There he comes back. The G. I can see those GS Tams from a mile away. They are very bright orange. Um, one thing you can do is I can ask ChatGPT follow-up questions. So if you want me to tweak it in any ways, just let me know. Um, oh, let's get about the mental training. Okay. Good one. How Eric. really good one? How should I get mentally prepared? How should I be mentally prepared for this race? Uh, the Cocodona GPT. That sounds like an F1 race. Because oh, yeah. it's like a Grand Prix. <laughs> Couch Cadona. That's what that's what this is. So I asked, this is interesting. I asked, how should I be mentally prepared for this race? And for the last 20 seconds, it's actually just been thinking nothing's come up i think we might have just broke chat gpt this is fascinating it's not giving me an answer on how i should be mentally prepared for this race i don't think chat gpt knows the answer on how to mentally prepare for this race and i did not expect that
Chat GPT is beach balling right now. You know who we Matt, should ask? I was say, Matt, who do we have eyes on immediately right now in this aid station? <laughs> Brett trying to trying to bring it back. Uh, oh no, I got an answer. Steering it back. This is uh, the legend herself, Sarah Ostazuski. This is Sarah. Let's go, Sarah. Yeah, last year's third place finisher. Currently, uh, third place female. Currently. The th- in the third place female position, so same position she was in last year, but she is she went through a little rough patch, I think, uh, in the early to middle stages of the race, or maybe not a rough patch, but lost some time mm-hmm. uh, on the field, and she has just been running so strong, uh, you know, since you know yesterday afternoon. Um, it's awesome to kind of see her moving her way up. So I asked Chat GPT how to mentally train for Cocodona and it just said talk to Chad Wright took you to the uh, Joe Corsione's pre-race interview with Chad Wright Did Joe do an interview with Chad Wright yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't able to see all of Joe's interviews I only saw some of them but yeah yeah it was like the second one that he did and it was incredible an incredible human being it was it was wild you, it was it was one you should have heard the audio we were able to get from uh Chad, when he came oh, into the Sedona aid station earlier. Oh man, I can legendary only beard. Um, Georgia native. Yep, I believe. Uh, and just some incredible audio. All right, people. People are asking, so I'm going to answer. I said, who is better, Killian Jornet, Francois Dane, or Jim Wamsley? Again, chat GPT is like thinking for a really long time. Is my chat GPT broken? <laughs> Looks like we do have now uh, a view from the ground of, All right. uh, of Sarah. We have ground cam. Sarah. Looks great. And we might be able to listen into some audio here. The audio on that feed's not super great, so we'll keep it muted there. Um, Looks like maybe Melissa, her twin sister, is going to be picking up pacing duties. Can we get a Can we get a check on the uh, shoes, Brett? Um, I just saw black upper. I mean, I saw that Sarah is still wearing the production version of the Nike Zagama, so that's at least one that us mortals can can buy um i think melissa is rocking a a future nike trail model that is not available to the public yet but what better place to test a trail shoe than the cocodona 250 so kudos to nike trail for actually putting some of their future shoes like truly through the ringer and that is ultra athlete kyle Curtin. it appears getting ready to pace Sarah, Kyle is no stranger to these massive long-distance FKT-type efforts. I believe he's done Tour de Géant. I believe he either attempted or has the unsupported Tahoe Rim Trail FKT. I could be wrong there. I'm going to fact-check myself here. Yeah, so back in 2020, he did set the unsupported Tahoe Rim Trail in... 37 hours so good person to have in your corner so Melissa's wearing the oh no they're both wearing pacer bibs so I guess we'll see one came in and the other's probably going to leave yeah with the blue pack um, that uh, I believe they just came in so then Melissa's probably going to be pacing Sarah on the way out I don't know. We shall see. 
So I did ask ChatGPT, who is the best trail runner of all time? And they actually said it's difficult to name a single best trail runner because there's so many different disciplines within trail running wise. And then they're like, but regardless of that, Killian Jornet. Uh, so ChatGPT said Killian Jornet, Ann Trayson, Scott Jurek. That is ChatGPT's Mount Rushmore. Curious to see what the chat wow. thinks of that. Brett, totally off the cuff here and just totally guessing. Do you think Jim Walmsley could run Cocodona, this Cocodona 250 course, in under 48 hours? Probably not. <laughs> and that's no knock on Jim. I mean, maybe someday, but as of right now, you know, just looking at Jim's trail running career, his uh, Jim's biggest struggles have been when the race goes over an amount where uh, – like sleep fatigue starts to set in when yep. you're looking like 18, 20 plus hours, um, especially with cooler weather exposure. And I, I know this is a, is a primarily hot course, but there's definitely times on this course where like it is, it's, it's cold, it's cold. And Jim, you know, Jim moved to France partly for one to get increased in exposure to the big mountains. Um, so I mean he's he's on the right path towards a, a successful Cocodona for sure, but I don't know if I see forty eight hours quite yet. Like you would have to, that's a huge commitment early on, you know. Like you, you are severely playing the show up or blow up game. Yeah, going for a forty eight hour finish time. I actually don't know the answer to this question, Brett, but I'm I'm wondering, are there any two hundred plus mile? trail races in the u.s emphasis on trail where the winner has finished in under like 35 hours 40 hours like what is the fastest current 200 plus mile trail race finish i don't know i guess the the trail fan in me doesn't care that much about the time of these trail races it's a trail race the course changes all the time i the amount I care about the time is pretty small, actually. I want to see the race, and as these get more competitive, all I care is about is, like, what what's the placement? If you want to go run a fast 200 mile, just do it on the track. Someone in the chat saying, I keep thinking Brett sounds similar to Sage Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Brett is, uh... Brett has uh, the voice of an angel, though, so... Um, I just wanted to give one update. The cutoff at Mingus Mountain was 1 o'clock this afternoon, and I did just get confirmation from our uh, race command that all runners who were still out on course made it through Mingus. So all right. no one timed out at Mingus Mountain, so we should get a – maybe we get a little cheer going in the chat or something like that. So shout-out to uh, all the runners who were still out on course. Mingus Mountain was the uh, – was the most recent cutoff, and the nope. next one will be. Sorry, I should. Uh, will be uh, Jerome at eight p.m. So they have seven hours to make the uh, sixteen and a half mile trek down to Jerome. That's awesome to hear that no one has got no one got swept up by the sweeper blimp. Sp sponsored by Air Vipa. Um, yeah, a little, a few questions in the chat, you know, asking about what's going on with Eliza's tracker. Dude, you're right. It's weird. It's, it, it's moved. It's still off course, but it's got to just be a GPS error. Like from where it originally was and then went off course and now it seems to be like tracking back, just looking at the terrain out there she would have to just be full on bushwhacking through the woods at a pace much faster than she was going. So I'm, what I'm thinking that? it's still, it's gotta be just tracker error at this point and it will, it will correct. So we have eyes on Sarah Ossizuski who is flying out of the aid station It was the uh, the Munns Park aid station at mile 191. Sarah is a third place lady and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
eighth place overall. And I would say Sarah Sarah looks the best of anyone I've seen so far coming out of she's of this age. Like Sarah's like running. She's like running, running. Yeah, she's like running. This is she's I wonder how fast she's running right yeah, now. Yeah, what do we what are we thinking? Are we is Sarah going like single digit mile pace right now? Pull up. Like that was yeah. Do have so it looks like maybe doing a little run walk here. It's hard from the aerial view to um, to get a good sense for like what the uh, terrain uh, looks like, right? Because you're kind of almost top down. So mm -hmm. not sure if it's maybe a a little gentle uphill that she doesn't feel like running right now, or. Uh, She's just gonna kind of try to run when she runs. Try to run pretty pretty strong and walk when she needs to walk. So yeah, and if there's a trail shoe that feels fast on the roads, it's most of them the ones that Nike makes. Cornell says this view looks like a car chase helicopter broadcast. That's hilarious. I think that's a good thing. Because everyone loves watching a police chase helicopter broadcast. Oh, yeah. Yep. As some have said in the chat, like this feels like a closer race than in previous years. You are right. This is a closer race than in previous years, especially on the women's side. I mean, the split between just first and second on the women's side last year, so the difference between um, Annie Hughes, who was the f uh, women's winner, and Lauren Jones, who was second, was uh, something like seven hours. And so this race currently uh, was separated by like three or four miles. Yeah, they're, they're within one hour of each other, the, the entire women's podium. The entire podium, yeah. yeah. So uh, this race is definitely uh, is, quite a bit closer. Like, as a fan... This is, this is what I'm here for. As a competitor, like that is the sort of thing that nightmares are made of. Like, who in their right mind would want their 250 mile race coming down to like a sprint finish? Like, no, thank you, not for me. <laughs> Little did they know that you still need to learn how to kick in ultra running, in 200 mile ultra running. And we will send it back to Sedona to just see what runners are coming in or are in there in just a minute. We're going to lose uh, Sarah O here, so we'll send it over to uh, Sedona. Just take a look at the sights and sounds, courtesy of our uh, Obstacles. good friend Lynn. Nice. Thanks, He's, Lynn. He's uh, filming out there for us, seeing Someone. looks like some crew, I would hope. I would Jacob, think. if Michael McKnight takes first in this race, I don't think it's the greatest comeback in 200-mile race history. I think it's one of the greatest in ultra running history. Agreed. Yeah. It, it goes up there and just all ultra running. Uh, someone had asked who the women's podium is. And at the moment it's Eliza Lapierre in first, Mika Thews in second and Sarah Ostazewski in third. Ooh, and cool they graphic. are all within, I think they're all within, you know, a few miles of each other. Uh, pretty unheard of for, a race this long for them to be that close. The graphic here, Matt, it's saying that Eliza Lop here is 245 miles in. No. Yeah, that's because we're pulling this data straight gotcha. from track leaders. Gotcha. And uh, she, we're trying to confirm with race command, but it seems to be just an errant uh, gotcha. GPS thing. So gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. the 
Yeah, there may be some abnormalities up there. Fourth place is Sally McRae. Uh, we're going to continue to work on trying to get that shrunk to a single line. Um, but, yeah. Sally's tracker has her at about 169 miles. And let's see. Oh, yeah. Cause and then the next, I guess she's in fourth. The third place lady is around the 190 mile mark. So there's definitely a bit of a gap between third and fourth. But there are a lot of men between third and fourth place lady that Sally is going to be able to you know, work off of and catch to keep that momentum rolling. Uh, shouts to Dominic Grossman, big number, big number nine, who's 170 miles in. The dude is a trooper. Uh, we got some ketone IQ on let's the A station. Uh, we got to, let's uh, go. We got to follow Dom into Sedona earlier today, and he was in he was in good spirits. I, he said he's he's ready to pike, pack a micro shovel to uh, shovel up on Eldon for anyone if there's still snow after having. Sh- you know, spent that's all Dom did all this winter. winter. <laughs> all he did this winter was shoveling snow. That was all of his running training. The occasional ski uh, when he could uh, shovel himself out. Brett, I gotta give credit where credit's due. Hey, it's Arlen Glick. Yeah, Arlen Glick. Wow. What are we looking at right now, Matt? We're in Sedona. Like, oh, uh, this, this we're in is, the Sedona aid station. We're looking probably at the crew table of someone not in the two hundred mile race. Or Possibly, because like that spread just seemed it screamed hundred mile. It was like, you know, Morton gels, exogenous ketones. Yeah, I wonder if anyone in the chat uh, could knows it be maybe whose crew that is? It could be. Could it be Jeff's? It could be Jeff's crew because that that is like it's all Ultra Spire. It's oh. Morton. There's ketones. I'm gonna go ahead and guess that we're looking at Jeff Browning's uh, aid station crew table. Yep, Ultra Spire oh, bottles. Yeah. I'm putting I'm putting my money that that's Jeff's. That's that's Jeff Browning's. I would love to get his take on the exogenous ketones actually coming oh, yeah. from the point of like he comes from a place of actually being in ketosis for many years of his racing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um so I, I wonder if he sees the benefits of these exogenous ketones outweighing the you know the the diet that you need to naturally get yourself in ketosis. Yep. Or is this a strategy for him to be able to use carbs during a race, um, but kind of keep those ketone levels high? I gotta say I I have been without ketones the last four days and uh, feeling the brain frog, Brett. <laughs> let's do a little tracker update yeah someone had said in the in the chat that michael mcknight is coming in hot on josh perry and you are absolutely right um we might we might be seeing an overtake in the next 30 to 60 minutes, uh, depending on what Josh is. Eliza just doing. pinged, according to Steve Josepher. Oh, yeah. Yep. Eliza's on course. Um, I don't think Eliza was ever off course. Um, Eliza, occur- according to the current ping, has, has been moving really well recently. Um, still about two miles up on on second place, Mika Thews. And the gap from Mika to Sarah uh, Suzuki is less than one mile. <laughs> the ketones. Was that like an 80s ska band? <laughs> you might be right. Not yes. to be convinced with the, uh, the late 90s death metal band, Exogenous Ketones. <laughs> (laughs) 
I'm curious to see what Arlen Glick's training has looked like. Speaking of Arlen Glick, seeing him here in the in the feed, I'm really excited to see his Western States this year. He's in the right place to be getting ready for this race. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Take a look. So the next aid station, where's where in the world is Killian Korth right now? Michael Greer. So Killian Korth is just a few miles out from the Kelly Canyon aid station. He's about two miles out from Kelly Canyon. That's at mile 202.8. On the Kelly Canyon aid station menu, we're looking at chicken burritos, tofu, and grits. I feel like grits would be like a damn near super fuel uh, oh, yeah. laid into a race. I grits just check all the correct, like all the right nutritional boxes for me. Love most, grits. Most of the time. <coughs> Love grits. Some good old cheesy grits. Uh, when are the leaders projected to finish? I think we're looking at a Thursday morning finish projection for the leaders. Matt, what do you think? Yeah, it's hard to tell um, just because of how strong Mike McKnight is running. If he were to overtake, uh, it could be something a little bit faster. Um when you compare the rest of this course, uh, it's more comparable to 2022 at this point in terms of what's left. Um, Michael McKnight um, ran from Kelly Canyon to the finish in 13 hours and 14 minutes. Joe McConaughey was 12... 12 hours and 15 minutes. So I think we'll know a little bit more when we get to Kelly Canyon, but it seems like um, it could possibly be early Thursday morning. Broadcast producer's dream right there. Thursday morning finish instead of like Wednesday. Well, but if we get like a, like a 3 a.m. Thursday morning finish. Yeah, well, yeah, that's slightly less than ideal. But I'm here for it either way. Um, but we'll keep you all posted as we uh, maybe take a, a deeper dive into what the stats. Maybe maybe they'll do you a solid, Matt, and just like take a two-hour dirt nap at the very top of Eldon when it's 20 degrees out uh -huh. tomorrow morning. Well, Killian, I don't think, has slept since uh, Deer Pass. Um, yeah, that, that was, was actually about a follow-up question that I wanted to know about. A little over 24 hours, ago, or a little less than 24 hours ago. Do you know how long Killian slept for at Deer Pass? Uh, yeah. yeah, so I got a text message that he was going to take a nap, and 55 minutes later I got a text message that he was up. All right, so he's had one 55-minute sleep. And guess who is in Sedona? We're going to have Lynn try and stay on our – Inaugural Sedona Canyons 125 race leader, the Bronco himself, Jeff Browning. Did you say Le Bronco? Le Bronco. <laughs> Le Bronco, Le, Billy. Le Bronco. I was thinking like, Le Le, Bronco. like, like LeBron. Yeah. Co. <laughs> it goes either way. Le, Le, Bronco. Le, Le Bronco. Bronco. Le Bronco. So now it would 1,000% make sense that that's Jeff's table. I did get confirmation yep. from... Uh, from one of our drone pilots that that was Jeff, Jeff's crew as well. Gotcha. And we've got some Derek Lytle content going on. Let's see how quick aid station transition is. Grab stuff out of the back. Half the distance, half the time spent in aid. Oh, he's taking that ketone, ketone IQ. Down the gullet. Gullet. Stuff tastes like straight poison. Like nail polish remover. Apparently, there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, 
Jeff Browning, ageless wonder. Looks so good. So Yeah, so this is one of the biggest differences between, you know, what you need to do in a 250-mile race versus a 125-mile race. Jeff's not doing much in terms of, like, putting down huge amounts of calories right now at the aid station. It's He'll eat when he's out on course. And just as an update, we do have Killian Korth. We don't have the video up yet, but we do have someone working on getting the drone up in the air there, but he is at the Kelly Canyon aid station. All right, and that's mile 202.8 for those wondering. Oh, I've never seen Jeff without glasses on. I don't know if I'd recognize him. See, how many bottles is he going to go with? Jeff Browning is rocking his uh, signature pack, the Bronco pack from Ultra Spire. The 5L. As he uh, let us know earlier, the uh, it's the five L. It's not the big Bronco. Yeah, no, it's not the big Bronco. So Brett, as we're looking at Jeff here, I see the Vespa shorts. I we see the ketones that he's putting down the Ultra Spire pack stuff. Do you, when you think about Jeff Browning, do you see what he's doing as sort of like the cutting edge of the sport? Do you think he what he what he's using for fuel and whatnot is is more controversial? How do you feel about it? Well, this isn't actually that different from what Jeff Browning's always been doing. I mean, Jeff has always been known as a low carb athlete, you know, a fat burner. And, you know, he's, he had been basically making his own natural ketone levels high way before like exogenous ketones have ever gone, like gone into the, the sporting market. Um, so that's why I'm really curious, like where he sees a place for something, you know, like a consumable exogenous ketone versus being a strategic low carb runner and naturally staying in ketosis. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think he's in a very unique position in this, like, like I've never done any sort of like strategic low carb type, uh, fueling, whereas Jeff has many years of experience with that. So, um, I'm just wondering, yeah, I wonder if this is an ability for him to further utilize carbs in a way he wants to. We may have two the the two winners of the Cocodona or sorry the the one twenty five and the two fifty Jeff Browning potentially and we could even throw Mike McKnight into the conversation if he overtakes Killian Korth. Two strategic carb users taking wins. Is Killian Korth the low carb? I don't know. Athlete as well. I don't. Not to my knowledge. And we do have I think footage of Killian Korth. It's oh, this is be cool. It's going to be super pixelated and grainy uh, in this area at the time being, but it looks like that it, he's leaving uh, Kelly Canyon Aid, I believe. Um, we will get confirmation, but it looks like he is leaving uh, Kelly Canyon Aid Station. So made quick use of that aid station. Um, yeah, we're watching the overall race leader, Killian Korth make their way out of the Kelly Canyon aid station. That is mile 203. I'm, I'm rounding it up to 203. Okay, so in the chat, they said Killian is a low carb, low carb athlete as well. The, the best summarization that I got for what it means to be a low carb athlete was Michael McKnight's uh, podcast uh, that he was a guest of with uh, Joe Corsione of the Everyday Ultra Podcast. It was a pre-race interview. And the way Michael McKnight described being a low-carb athlete was kind of similar to keeping your tolerance for caffeine low, where if you are one that drinks coffee all day, every day, your tolerance for caffeine, you know, it doesn't have as big of an effect as someone who maybe doesn't take any caffeine and then has a cup of coffee or two cups mm. of coffee. Uh, Michael McKnight, you know, described being a low carb athlete as I still eat carbohydrates, but it's a very low num it's a low number of carbs per day that still continues to keep my body knowing how to tap into its own, 
you know, fat reserves. Um, fat is a much cleaner burning fuel. It's a slower burning fuel, but that makes sense for something like a Coca Dona 250 um, when the overall exertion effort is much lower on, say, like the heart rate scale. So then his body is less reliant on just pure carbohydrates alone. And then he said during a race, if you then up the carbohydrate intake, he's like, it's like rocket fuel. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting strategy. Definitely not something that I've experienced, you know, experimented with at all. And something you definitely see more commonly in these much longer races. And Brett, I remember when you were telling me about exogenous ketones, that part of the selling point is you can be both high carb and high ketone simultaneously. Is that correct? Yeah. And like as the current science exists and it's, it's super new. I mean, there's not even that many like good scientific studies on exogenous ketones. So, um, it would be very easy for someone to poke lots of holes in the studies that have been done with exogenous ketones. But the whole idea behind it was, uh, by drinking the ketones, you are able to put your body into a state of ketosis similar to as if you were a low carb athlete, but it just does it, you know, like it's like a shortcut, but a very strategic one. So then the thought behind that was that you could still have high ketone levels, but your body will still digest and utilize higher amounts of carbs. So the metaphor behind that was essentially, uh, you now strapped on a second gas tank like you're now dual source fueling with carbohydrates and ketones um yeah i'm I'm definitely like i'm no scientist or nutritionist dietitian anything like that i just read a, a good amount listen to things and that's that's where i'm at uh that's where i'm at right now and that's all i have to say about that that's all i have to say that was good, Brett. No, I appreciate beautiful. it. It was beautiful, man. <laughs> that was good. Hey, I I think one of the other cool things about these Cocodona, these longer 200-mile broadcasts, is we get to go into some fun, just general trail running discussions about race strategy and nutrition and training and culture. And, yeah, there's plenty of time to, to get into this stuff in between race updates. So. If there's anything else you guys in the chat want to hear us riff on, go back and forth on, I'm down. I'm hoping Brett's down. And, uh, yeah, what are, what are some questions that you guys have in the chat that you guys want us to talk about? So I just updated the tracker, and Mika's hasn't updated in 19 minutes, so it shows Sarah having overtaken Mika. We'll have to see when Mika's actually updates again. I bet they're very close but i don't you know i can't confirm yet that sarah has overtaken mika if you know just going by the the you know the history of this race in the last few days mika and mike groenwegen have been running most of it together and mike was still upwards of three four tenths of a mile in front of sarah maybe a half mile so that might actually be where mika is I will definitely keep smashing this refresh button now. <laughs> DIY resource says genuine question. How do you not get bored running? I don't get bored running. So I think that running, especially when you're unaided is one of the most psychedelic experiences out there and you're chasing the runners high, which is super fun. I don't know. My mind goes to all sorts of places for me. It's, it's always more like, well, I mean, I love just the, the the minimal exploration that I can do with my feet. I always think that's really cool. But I always love working towards something bigger, whether that's a race or a training goal or, you know, any of those sorts of things. Um, I On my easy days that – you're right. Like some of my easy flat days that are pretty boring, I listened I listened to a lot of the single track podcasts. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll, try, I'll do my best uh, single track. Welcome back or welcome to the Single Track Podcast. I am your host, Finn Melanson, and here today I will be smashing cans of liquid death against my forehead. <laughs> How was that? That was pretty damn good. <laughs> that was pretty damn good. God, I love liquid death.
Ooh, that's a great question. At what age do ultra marathoners reach their like quote unquote peak? Say in comparison to marathon runners. Let's pick a let's pick a race for it too. Well, I mean, okay, I see if we, yeah, we'll say hundred mile. I think nearly every year for the last decade, you ask that question and the answer changes. Um, there have been so many people who are like, oh, they're. 40 oh they're 45 they're past their prime they keep winning races or they keep improving um and i think so much of that is what we learn about the 100 mile distance and like that level intensity and that there might actually still be room for growth in terms of like overall aerobic capacity versus like say the pure power output from your muscles which that definitely starts to decline you know Sometimes in your late 20s, you know, if we're looking at like like the world record for the 100 meter dash, the average world record holder is like 21, 22 years old. Yep. Uh, for the 1500, it's like 27. We're seeing people, though, extend the length of their careers. And I think that's largely due to new training science. Um, and I think one thing that people are taking from that new training science and adapting towards these longer races you know 100 miles plus is that oh yeah it's it's not so much just a pure like physical test of you know that kind of strength there's much more uh, nuances to it largely around this seemingly endless ability to grow you know that overall aerobic strength that aerobic engine that's why we see runners like you know like jeff browning just continuing to crush it um so kind of going back to that actual question, what is the age of someone's peak? I have no idea because it seems like you see people now running like when they're running great 100 mile when they're like 25, 26 years old and then like still running hundreds that good when they're 40. Yeah. So I don't know if it's they peak, but they can at least hold that peak for much longer than previously thought. Um, you know, at, up to a point, there's definitely still going to be a decline at a certain age but so much of that as well comes down to like how early or late did you get into the sport um that's a huge thing as well so yeah that's that's like a very multi multi-sided question but that was kind of a fun one to get into i mean i think both one of our mutual favorite athletes in the sport is ludo pomeray ludo pomeray of france 47 years old I think didn't he win TDS last year or the year before? And, um, I believe he top, top ten to Western States top last 10 year. Top ten to Western States last year was in the lead at Western States. He was leading through Robinson Flat. Through Robinson Flat. He's a UTMB champ from 2016, maybe. Yeah, I remember listening to Jim Walmsley on a podcast. It was either late last year or in early January. And, you know, last year was the first year he hadn't raced Western States in a bit. And he was watching the live stream and he was saying to himself, don't let that Ludo guy get too far out front. Don't let him get away. Yep. 47 yeah, years old. You don't, you can't give any ground to Ludo. Let's see. Let's. Do a little tracker update. And Brett, you think that if you start later in the sport, your peak extends? Is that what you were saying earlier? Well, it it can't. Like, it's, yeah, that's another one where I don't know if there's any, like, true, like, conclusive answers about that. But some of those who have been in running, you know, competitively through, like, middle school, high school, college, going straight into the trails – you just you just don't well we haven't seen too many go truly through all the ranks and are now say in their 40s like we don't have too many you know the division one caliber athlete coming straight into trail that's still somewhat of a relatively new yeah. thing but um yeah i mean it's just it's a lot of wear and tear on the body um and who knows maybe that's just a matter of like because they've spent so many years that they kind of figure out like okay yeah this is as good as i'm gonna get Someone who starts running in their like twenties, thirties, forties, um, just you know where you start at, you are immediately going to have a huge amount of room to grow. Like there's more low hanging fruit for someone to pick when they're forty, starting their yeah. running journey, versus when they've gone through the ranks of 
you know, high school, collegiate, post-collegiate running, all that low hanging fruit, they got picked when they were like 13 years old. And yeah. then you're having to like really focus on all the tiny little things. So then, you know, it, yeah, then it, then it just gets more difficult. And then there's only, there's only so much more room to grow in that regard. Awesome. Brett, 1800 people watching this live stream right now. It's a big number. That is a big awesome. number. Um, Thank you so much to everybody in the chat that's been speaking up, contributing. Ooh, actually, sorry, in, sorry to interrupt that thought there, but Lindsay Clemens has an excellent question, Brett. And Matt, I mean, you probably have a good opinion on this as much as anybody. How long does everyone think it will take for 200s to be as popular as 100s? Five more years? Will we have a Western? Will we have a Western States for the 200 world at some point? What do you think, Matt? Matt, there's 1,800 people watching this right now. <laughs> How long? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know that it will maybe ever be as popular as 100 mile races are at the same given time, right? But I think that it could be as popular as hundreds are currently. Right, so I would expect the popularity of hundred milers to also grow as the popularity of two hundred milers continues to grow, and I think you will see something that becomes the um, kind of the Western states of the two hundred world, um, just as more and more two hundred milers uh, pop up. You know, like the more races there are, the more uh, the greater chance there is that you know, there becomes one kind of established premier race or a number of established, pre like, premier 200 milers. Yeah. And in terms of just pure participation, the shorter races have more participation, and that starts at 5K and goes all the way up. It continues. Like, um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I see 200s ever surpassing 100s, but I definitely see a scenario where both 100s and 200s increase in popularity by a huge amount both um yeah it's kind of like matt said like 200s in five years could per surpass where hundreds are at right now yeah exactly um and then i just had a quick have you guys looked at the live tracker in a little bit it looks like mike mcknight is uh maybe closing down on uh Eli oh, Eliza Lapierre and Josh Perry. The tracker, my tracker right now shows him uh, ahead. I have him ahead of, of Eliza, Eliza, but it looks like Josh hasn't updated in seven minutes. So Josh could still be ahead or right with him. But Mike McKnight is uh, he is steam he just making an absolutely insane charge right now. And I mean, I've taken some notes. If on he's overtaken Josh Perry, then that means he just ran himself onto the podium. Yep, and uh, I've taken notes on what his splits were at um, Kelly Canyon on out uh, yeah. because I, I don't know what last year's um, uh, Munns Park splits were because it was an out and back. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know if that split was from the first, uh, the first crossing or what because only one time shows up in the 2022 <laughs> tracker. But we will keep an eye on, you know, maybe where he hits – Kelly Canyon compared to last year and maybe how he's uh, progressing in terms of closing that distance towards last year's time. If I am Mike McKnight's chief pacer, Ben Light, I am looking into booking a second half of 2023 inspirational speaking tour across the country because that guy's amazing. The podium whisperer. Get this guy some salt. To send it back to Sedona real quick, we've got Don Greenwalt um, on the uh, screen here. She's just coming in to Sedona, so I believe she is our fifth female at the time, Flagstaff's own. Uh, she was the runner-up in 2021, so a huge shout-out to Don. Another runner who gets to run home. Yeah, there's a, there's a number of those. That's cool. Yeah, do do love seeing locals signing up for the local race. And you know, canyons make cocodonans. 
Don Greenwald did a number of rim to rim to rim efforts in her lead up to this. Impressive. I'm looking at her Strava right now. Actually, fun fact, Don Greenwald did a rim to rim to rim effort with Michael Greer. They worked in tandem together on an early April training run, which is kind of cool. That is cool. And and just as a heads up, sorry to interrupt here, we did have trackers update here. And as of zero minutes ago for both, Ba-na-na. Michael McKnight is six and a half miles out from Kelly Canyon. Josh Perry is 6.6 miles out. Da, 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 so they are basically Michael. together. Sports Center, right now. Wow. So, according to the tracker, that's awesome. It it looks like Michael McKnight has overtaken Josh Perry for third overall, and is roughly looking five miles as the gap between second place Michael Greer and third place Michael McKnight. Yeah, what do you – oh, man. Michael McKnight has undertaken overtaking Josh Perry. What do we think that pass was like? Did they exchange any words? Did <laughs> did Mike McKnight, like, hop into the woods, pass, hop back in so that way he couldn't be seen? Was he just, like, on your left? Did we get a good job? Like, I think Michael McKnight man. said, bro, the AZT record is next. <laughs> Just doing this race in route. <laughs> yeah, Don looks great. Let's see if Killian's tracker is updated. Okay, his did four <laughs> minutes ago. So Killian's at mile 202. Oh, it just updated. Almost 203. Michael Greer's at mile 200. Michael McKnight is at mile 195. So less than 10 miles are separating the men's podium and less than less than three miles separate the women's podium. Wow. What a race. Ben Cook says McKnight has to come to Javelina in a Batman costume this year. Yeah, I, we were talking about this, I think, on the first day of like what kind of costumes we're now going to see at Javelina <laughs> this year. And um, I feel like some dark McKnights would oh, be a yeah. great one. And we're going to see a ton of blimps. I know that for sure. Love that. What, what else might we see at Javelina this year? That's a good question. I mean, what don't we see at Javelina? That's actually really what it is. Um, looks like definitely we're tending to some feet, some feet things right now. Coach Kendall says the women's podium is gritty AF. This race is wild. So yep. true. And speaking of being gritty, they can look forward to grits at the Kelly Canyon aid station at mile 202. They are grits AF. <laughs> Grits AF. Rachel, I gotta I gotta respectfully disagree. I want to pan even closer to the feet. This is the <laughs> content we want. <laughs> get that get that in four K. Yes. Looking good. We will let Bro, uh what kind of shoes are those? I don't f- think I think it's we, another Ultra Olympus. Okay. We don't have any audio here on uh, yeah. Shoe check. It looks like we've got an Ultra Olympus. I think it's just one uh, like last year's model of it. But definitely looking like an Olympus. Crew member might be in a Solomon. Uh, shape looks like a sense ride.
Yeah, and we do have uh, audio there. You're good. Got some audio. Piping in some audio at the aid station. Looking great, Don. Are we about to squirt hand sanitizer directly onto the feet? Oh my gosh. What a moment, folks. Matt, I, question for you. There's 1,800 people watching this right now. Obviously, a lot of credit has to be given to just the audience that Aravipa Running has built over the years. But if you look at just the, the viewership over the last three days, there's, there's consistently been right around this number. What is it about these 200-mile races that keep such a captive audience, do you think? And, Brett, this is to you, too. I think people just don't enjoy their jobs. I think <laughs> that's what we're learning. <laughs> I think. Uh, oh, the truth. I think most of our live chat doesn't actually enjoy what the what they're doing. So they're no. I think that I do. I do think that the fact that it's such a it's like a unicorn, right? It's this. It's still a fairly new thing. Um, this is one of the few two hundred plus milers. Uh, it might be the only with a live stream. Um, and so it's just this inherently very unique event, right? And then the fact that it falls in a work week, you can have it in on like a separate browser while you're working. You don't have to worry about um, taking the kids to soccer or, um, you know, <laughs> cooking dinner. For, I mean, you still have to go cook dinner for your family. Oh, no, that's like, just where the aid station is. All these is. different things, they're, right? So they're coming down there. And I think that... Yeah. Um, I think that those things all kind of add up. The fact that, you know, throughout the course of the normal nine to five, um, people can tune in because their their family responsibilities are a little bit more limited. But d Brett just donated two dollars of his own money to the uh to the blimp fund. For the blimp. Just yeah, I wanted to let people know that the Blimp Fund is alive and well. The 401k, <laughs> the donor, the donor 401k. Rachel in the chat, Matt with the hot take. 
Yeah, it was obviously a, a joke. I assume that you all love your jobs very much, but uh, <laughs> I do think that it is nice that while you're at work, instead of you know having the same Taylor Swift album on for the fourth time uh, this week, you're able to uh, you know have on the live stream, and even if it's just background noise, listen to let the, listen to some good banter, listen to the angelic voice of Finn Melanson, um, all of those things. Brett, it makes me wonder, in the moments of the season when there aren't races to follow, could you splice together a bunch of different streams about like day in the life stuff at Aravipa, Jamil out on runs, Matt doing some behind the scenes work, Bryce out there filming someone's, you know, upcoming movie. Could you create just like a day in the life Aravipa stream with commentators layered on top of it that this audience here would also be happy to be a part of. I a part of me thinks that like at least half this audience would love to have that as, you know, I don't want to say noise, but like a background ambiance in their life. I think it could be a lot of fun, but I mean the other thing too is like do we do we have a racing off season in the sport? Like with the way live streams are going and with how there are races relatively year round, do we even do we even have that? No, and I think that that's probably like a like a bigger discussion that could be had on like the if we want to grow the professionalism of the sport or the professional into the sport, um, how do we change that if we feel we even need to change that? Right? Uh, it is hard, but mm. having like I think you see the same problem in track, uh, right? Like pros are running year round really uh, and just looking at things in four year cycles without any real season kind of you do have obviously some people will run indoors on world's years and stuff like that but um, yeah I think that a more defined circuit or series could be something uh, of interest specifically geared towards the professional end of the sport agreed I still I also still I'm trying to put the words to, for it, but I think a Truman show for Era Viper running could totally work. I don't even know if I know what that is. You've never seen the Truman show? Well, um, what do you, not I mean, that old. Well, I mean, what do you mean by the Truman show type thing of Era Viper? Like, we're going to make one person run a race and everyone else is actually just an actor? <laughs> <laughs> like, is that what you mean? <laughs> Like we we're gonna put like a fake lottery on and like make all these people get picked, but then it's actually fake the entire thing. That's actually a show that everyone needs to watch. It's on Amazon Prime, but it's actually one of the like small free channels with ads on Amazon uh, called Freevee. It's called Jury Duty, and it's exactly that. They said that they were gonna do a documentary for what it's like to be on Jury Duty, and they were you know casting people like regular people. That's amazing. And one of the jurors was not an actor everybody else in the entire thing was an actor and they built out this the most insane just funny trial and series of events and just filmed <laughs> how this guy managed it all and it was incredible That's it was amazing. so funny very heartfelt but yeah <laughs> shouts to jury duty if <laughs> if you haven't seen jury duty go watch it i think it's like eight or nine episodes it's a quick watch but it is <laughs> hilarious and i loved it our, our biscuits and wine says sure i'll act that this hurts after 200 miles <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> that's exactly what i mean well i mean they don't the people the actors don't actually have to run 250 miles i mean most of these people are running a large portion by themselves i just feel bad for the one actor that actually ends up getting stuck with the person of uh focus on the show they're like dang it I gotta, I gotta watch. Jury, I gotta watch Jury Duty. Yeah. Uh, Maddie says the best show. Yes, it it was so good. Um, but yeah, so let's see a let's see a Jury Duty equivalent for <laughs> for a race or a Truman Show equivalent for a race. You know, I'm actually curious, folks. I'm I'm actually looking for shows to watch. What is the best television you've seen in the last six months? What would you recommend and why? In addition to Jury Duty, it's the Coca Dona 250 live stream. Like, once answer. this is over, you should just go back and watch it. <laughs> I 
Oh man, I'm approaching my 2 p.m. bonk. I might need to go eat some food real quick. I was just saying, do you want to start the coffee? Okay, I'll put on the coffee and wolf down part of a breakfast burrito. And I think actually we are going to switch streams here in just a few minutes as well. So um, once uh, once I just make sure that we have the other one scheduled, we will switch streams here. And, uh, you know, by the time we get back up and running, we will... Uh, we Succession will, uh, is so good. Yeah, we'll probably be back. So we're going to take a little break here. Uh, we're going to switch over to day three, stream two. You don't need to do uh, to do anything or worry about anything. Uh, you will get automatically redirected, and we'll be back in about 90 seconds or so. Thank you for tuning